good morning, and for full disclosure, both Dean Foulihan and I are sick. Um, so hopefully we'll keep, we'll preserve our voices as much as we can. Good morning and welcome to the New York City Council's Finance Committee hearing on the Mayor's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2017 and the preliminary ma Mayor's management report for fiscal 2016. My name is Julissa Ferreras Copeland and I chair this committee. We've been joined by Council Members Lander, Matteo and Van Bremer. Before we get started, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank the entire City Council Finance Division staff, including the Finance Director, Latanya McKinney, the Senior Staff, Deputy Director, Regina Pareda Ryan, Deputy Director, Nathan Toth, Deputy Director, Paul Simone, Deputy Director and Chief Economist, Dr. Ray Majeski, Chief Counsel, Tanisha Edwards, and Assistant Director, Emra Ediv. The unit heads, Isha Wright, Paul Strum, John Russell, Chima Obicheri, Krillian Francisco, Dohini Sampura, Assistant Counsel Rebecca Chasen, and all of our finance analysts and support staff who pull everything together. They have worked around the clock to prepare for this hearing and all the hearings that will take place over the next few weeks, and I thank them for their diligence and their commitment. On a logistical matter, I want to remind everyone who wishes to testify to please fill out a witness slip with the sergeant at arms. For members of the public, that witness, the witness panels will be arranged by topic, so please indicate the topic of your testimony on your witness slip. If there is any member of the public who wishes to testify but is unable to do so at today's hearing, you may email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov. By close of business on Friday, March 4th, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. I know that the speaker will be joining us shortly, so um, <coughs> I'll make a. Um, is she here yet? No. Okay. Uh, the preliminary budget hearings mark the beginning of the council role in the annual budget adoption process. On January 21st, 2016, Mayor de Blasio released his preliminary budget for fiscal year 2017, totaling $82.1 billion. As it has in the last two years, the Mayor's preliminary budget sets forth a progressive agenda with notable proposals including increased funding for education to address second grade literacy, college and career readiness, and restorative justice programs investment in public safety, including an expansion of the NYPD shot spotters gun protection program and funding for additional school crossing guards, additional ambulance tours in upper Manhattan, Queens and the Bronx, and funding for additional park enforcement officers. Last year, without the distraction of the ineffective and detrimental budget dance for the second year in a row, the council was able to focus its energies on the issues that really matter examining agency operations, promoting transparency in the budget, and putting forward a council initiative spending plan to provide access, opportunity, and justice for all New Yorkers. Among the victories in last year's budget that the council secured for hardworking New Yorkers were an additional 1,300 police officers on the streets of our city, increasing funding for senior services and elder abuse prevention, and a year-round youth programs and an expanded summer youth jobs program. This year, the Council will continue to focus on big picture issues, like making sure the city is on a strong financial track, as well as building off of last year's successes to provide more justice for the New Yorkers who need it most by addressing inequality in a fiscally responsible way. This fiscal year, the city's economy remains strong, but looking ahead, there are several indicators that lead us to expect that the city's dynamic growth will slow down going forward. City employment continues to expand from 2015, being the fifth consecutive year of over 2% employment growth, but average wage growth grew by only 1.6%. The city's unemployment rate fell to 5% last December, down from 6.5% the year before. But the city's labor force participation rate remains low at 61.2%. The assessed value of real property has exceeded $1 trillion and the Council expects to see a 3.6% increase in local tax revenue in fiscal 2017. With the recovery from the Great Recession continuing into its seventh year, the City must ensure that it is prepared for the next financial downturn that will inevitably come. To be clear, the City is not forecasting a recession and in fact predicts continued, if moderate, growth. 
But in order to be prepared and fiscally responsible, the city must take steps now to build up its reserves and find efficiencies where monies can be saved. As of the end of fiscal 2016, the preliminary budget expects the city to have accrued $6.6 billion in reserves. This represents the amount that are a part of the surplus role, the general reserve, the retirement health benefits trust fund, the capital stabilization reserve, and defeas bonds. By comparison, prior to the Great Recession, the city had over $11 billion in reserve and was able to draw down $7 billion to help manage the recession. So the question remains, has enough been saved? Should we be saving 15% of our operating expenses in reserves, 10%? We hope to hear from the OMB director today about his position <coughs> excuse me, on the sufficiencies of the city's current reserves and the administration's plans to prepare for the downturn. One way for the city to build up its reserves faster is to enact ongoing savings. For fiscal 2017's preliminary budget, the mayor has continued the citywide savings program, which encourages agencies to voluntarily identify and offer savings as they see fit. Last year's savings program included savings of about $3 billion, but this year plan was put forth in the preliminary budget, identifies only $1.8 billion in savings. Not only is this amount low relative to the size of the budget, but most of the savings in the plan appear to stem from accruals, delays in spending, and other non-recurring savings. Raising the question of whether these savings find real efficiencies or whether they're just a more accurate reflection of true cost. I'm happy to report that yesterday OMB sent out a letter to agencies asking to dig deeper to identify additional efficiencies to be included in the executive budget. While this is a welcome first step, the Council looks forward to carefully examining the details of the additional savings that will be proposed to determine the effects they will have on the budget and the services provided to New Yorkers. I'm also happy to report that the Council has also identified savings that can be implemented by the administration and OMB has committed to implementing this. First, $6 million in savings will be achieved by OMB identifying overspending in all agencies and reducing baseline budgets in those areas accordingly. Second, $14 million in savings will be achieved by reducing the city's inflated contract for data processing equipment. Enacting ongoing savings is a good way for the city to build up its reserves and prepare us for a future economic downturn. However, even with prudent budgeting, risks still remain, namely the governor's 2016-2017 executive budget. The current state budget would cut over $900 million from the city's budget with the following proposals. Reestablishing funding parity for CUNY, decreasing the amount of state and federal aid to health and hospitals under Medicaid's disproportionate share hospital program, and taking away $600 million over the next three years in savings created by the city through the refinancing of the Star Corporation debt. Moreover, there is an additional $150 million risk to the city's budget because the state budget does not provide the same level of education funding to the city as it did last year. While the governor has gone on record saying that the proposal in his state budget won't cost New York City a penny, the recently released 30-day amendments have not made any changes to this damaging proposal at all. Moreover, the mayor's preliminary budget does not reflect the very real possibility that the state will adopt these cuts as part of its budget. With these facts in mind, the council emphasizes this year on building up the city's reserve and implementing real savings is especially pertinent. In order for the council to do this, it must be treated as an equal partner in the budget process. However, when the mayor announces major budgetary actions and policy statements before the preliminary budget is even released, it makes it difficult for the council to be an equal partner. This year, these budget-related announcements included the January 6th announcement to raise the minimum wage for all city employees to $15 an hour, which will cost $115 million once it is fully phased in, several announcements throughout December and January regarding homelessness prevention, such as the creation of Homestat and the implementation of Shelter Repair Squad 2.0, and the additional 300 beds for homeless youth, and the November 2014-15 rollout of the Thrive NYC, the city's initiative to build a more effective and supportive mental health system, which had a $62 million added to, its, to it in the fiscal <coughs> 2017 preliminary budget. 
While I believe that these programs and initiatives are certainly worthy of the city's expenditures and align with the council priorities, it is within the budget process, including the council's hearing, the negotiations with the administration, and public review that these decisions should be made so they can be considered in the context of all of the city's worthy and competing priorities. As elected officials, council members are responsible for overseeing the New York City's budget and ensuring that every dollar is spent in the most targeted and effective way to reflect our shared values. In order to do that, it is critically crucial budget actions not to be implemented before they are properly reviewed through the entire budget process. Throughout the entire month of March, when through the appropriate committees, the Council will hear from agencies, commissioners who can be asked specific questions related to their agencies. Today, however, we will hear from the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Dean Fulahan, for an overview on expense, revenue, and budget, and capital budgets, and to learn about his projections and risk assumptions and <coughs> revenue actions as it relates to the economy. After we've heard from OMB, we will hear from the Department of Finance, the Department of Design and Construction, the Independent Budget Office, and finally the New York City Comptroller. The public session for today's hearing will begin approximately at 2.45 p.m. These hearings will culminate in the Council's official response to the Mayor's preliminary budget. The Council's budget response is due on March 30th, and we anticipate that our response will significantly uh, influence the executive budget before we hear from the budget director. I want to remind my colleagues that uh, director, that director Fulahan is here to answer general questions relating to the financial health of the city, the effective federal and state actions on the city's budget, the priorities, methodologies, and factors considered in preparing for the city budget, pension, debt service, and, and other non-agency specific parts of the budget. Please reserve agency-specific questions for the commissioners who will be testifying throughout the month of March. At this time, I'd like to thank the speaker for coming this morning and give her the opportunity to say the for a few words. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, thank you for your leadership in chairing now what will be our third budget uh, and really uh, excited to hear from the from Dean and from all the others. So I want to say good morning to everybody that is here um, to kick off this fiscal year 2017 preliminary budget hearings. Obviously the chair has really laid out a lot of the focus and what we'll be um, asking questions about and getting wanting to get answers. I really want to thank the hardworking finance division uh, led by Latanya McKinney and obviously as I said our, our finance chair Julissa Ferreras Copeland and all the staff that put a lot of effort into making us ready for today. And I want to thank Dean for, and everyone at OMB for being here. Uh, over the past two years, the administration and council have set a great example in passing on time budgets that not only provide opportunity and further equity in this great city, but do so in a fiscally responsible way. Not only are we doubling down on our investments in schools, public safety, and housing, but we're also beginning to save money so that these programs will be able to continue if and when we are hit by another economic downturn. I believe the mark of a true progressive is not just one who seeks to create change, but does so in a matter that is sustainable over the long term. Right now we have over $6 billion in savings, and while some may say it's not enough, it is important to recall that we've only been in a position to start saving over the past two years. We need and will continue to build up our reserves. Which brings me to the financial risks the city contained uh, the, to the city contained in budget proposals in Albany. Proposals to cap our property tax levy, shift some of the state's financial responsibility for CUNY onto the city, decrease the amount of funding to health and hospitals, and take away $600 million in savings that the city was able to identify would have serious consequences for our budget. The governor claims that his CUNY and Medicaid proposals will not cost the city a penny, but we have yet to see how this will work out since we did not see any of that reflected any of the amendments. As a result, we now have over a billion dollars in financial risk hanging over us as we begin our process to adopt a budget. This is a concern, but I'm counting on the state to hold the city harmless in their adopted budget. Therefore, I think it is important for all of us here to remain focused on our budget and ensuring it best represents our shared priorities, meets the needs of our constituents, and does so in an efficient and fiscally responsible way. 
We can and should discuss the financial repercussions of these proposed state actions, but we should not let it distract us from the task at hand. Uh, so again, I want to thank everyone involved. Look forward to your testimony, Dean, and uh, the questions that will follow. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'd just like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members William and Cumbo, and also I think he had to step up, but we were also joined by former City Council Member and now Staten Island Borough President Jimmy Otto. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, please reserve agency specific questions to the commissioners. Lastly, a quick reminder to my colleagues that the first round of questions for OMB will be limited to five minutes per council member. And if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at three minutes per council member. We will now hear from the director of the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, Dean Foulihan, who will be sworn in by my council. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker Mark Rivarito. Thank you, Finance Chair Ferreras Copeland, members of the Finance Committee, members of the City Council, for again providing me the opportunity to testify here today on the Mayor's preliminary budget. Uh, on behalf of the Mayor and this administration, we are grateful for the partnership you both just spoke of, the collaboration throughout last year's budget process, and again, as we begin this year's process. Uh, I'm joined at the table by Larry and Angelo, the OMB First Deputy Director. We also have our talented staff here to assist me in answering questions. Last year's budget process was characterized by a highly productive relationship with the Council. While we may not have agreed on everything, I think we can agree that the adopted budget reflected the results of a process that was respectful and allowed us to move forward key initiatives that benefit New Yorkers around the city. It included $170 million for patrol enhancements, including close to 1,300 new police officers for a patrol strength of 2,000. And significant new investments in our renewal schools, including $12.7 million for extended learning time. As for the fiscal year 2017 budget process begins, I am proud to say that after two years in office, we've seen the results of our disciplined fiscal stewardship, our strategic vision for New York City, and all we have done to support the success and hard work of New Yorkers. Our fiscal 2017 preliminary budget is $82.1 billion. The fiscal year 2017 budget is balanced, closing the $1.2 billion gap that we projected as recently as November. In addition, <clears throat> excuse me. in addition, the fiscal year 2016 budget remains balanced. It recognizes $1.5 billion in federal funds since June, mainly for Sandy recovery and resiliency and for Homeland Security. And the fiscal year 2016 budget also recognizes $2.3 billion in prepayments to the next fiscal year, 2017, which helped close that projected gap. In keeping with this administration's established practice, the 2017 budget is highly responsible on two fundamental levels. First, it addresses the needs of New Yorkers through targeted investments. I will detail those in a moment. Second, it protects our fiscal health for the through future through savings and by maintaining unprecedented reserves. As you recall, the 2016 executive budget achieved $1.1 billion in savings. The 2017 preliminary budget has already identified another $1.1 billion in savings. And for the first time, this administration in this year, we will be achieving savings in both the preliminary and the executive budgets. As you referred to, yesterday I sent a letter to agency heads asking for significant new savings from them for the executive budget. The savings we are demanding of our agencies are on top of the unprecedented health care savings we have achieved. An agreement with the Municipal Labor Committee that we announced last week will create lasting savings and healthier, and healthier employees. It's an important step that will bring us ever, even closer to our commitment of achieving the $3.4 billion in health care savings through fiscal year 2018 and the $1.3 billion a year thereafter. I am also pleased to report that we hit our 2015 health care target of $400 million, are on track for our 2016 target of $700 million, and our 2017 target of $1 billion. At the same time, we have been demanding savings from our government. We have also been setting aside unprecedented, with you, unprecedented reserves. Together, 
We have raised the city's reserves to unprecedented highs, and these reserves are maintained in the preliminary budget. They include the $1 billion each year in the general reserve, which historically have been at $300 million, $3.4 billion in the Retiree Health Benefit Trust Fund, and $500 million in the newly created Capital Stabilization Reserve, which actually had a lot of support and, uh, from council members last year. Our disciplined approach has received consistent praise and high ratings from our monitors who set our prudent professional management of the city's fiscal health, particularly in uncertain economic times. Yet despite our discipline, we face some major challenges that didn't exist the last time I addressed the council. We are watching a global and national economic landscape that looks increasingly uncertain. It's a landscape that continues to show wide disparities between those with wealth and those working to just get by. I'll discuss the economic ba backdrop, discuss some of our preliminary budget investments, and then I look forward to your questions. Let's begin by looking at the economic picture across the five boroughs. As of 2015, New York City had 4.2 million jobs, an all-time high. In the past two years, the city has added more than 220,000 new jobs. This is the highest two-year gain ever. And these jobs are being added in every borough. The mayor talked about building a five-borough economy, and there's evidence we are building one. 2014 total employment growth for the five boroughs are Brooklyn of 5.8 percent, 31 over 31,000 jobs, Queens 3.9 percent, over 20,000 jobs. Bronx, 3.4%, over 8,000 jobs. Staten Island, almost 3%, over almost, oh, nearly 3,000 jobs. Manhattan, 2.6%, adding 63,000 jobs. And these are far different from what we would have seen at the last peak in, in 2007. Our growing economy is more diverse and less resilient on Wall Street. We saw extraordinary 10% growth in tech industry jobs, bringing us to 113,000 in 2014. So we're in a recovery, and our city is doing well, but too many hardworking New Yorkers are struggling even as our economy grows. The road to the eventual wage growth we saw in 2014 was slow and uneven, and we still haven't caught up to our pre-recession peak. And the New Yorkers primarily benefiting from that wage growth are the highest paid. Families in the top 20% have seen faster income growth than any other families during 2010 through 2014. As New Yorkers struggle during this recovery, the incoming global economic news is worrying. Among the troubling signs, world stock markets have lost trillions of dollars since the first of the year. We've seen slow or negative growth in many of the world's major economies. The U.S. economy is outperforming other developed countries but we've recently seen just 1% GDP growth in the fourth quarter of last year, slumping energy prices, a strengthening U.S. dollar that depresses exports. Wall Street firms booked losses of $177 million in the last quarter of 2015, and the financial sector bonuses are down. New Yorkers know the economy can turn on us suddenly and without warning. It happened after 9-11, and it happened during the Great Recession of 2008. In previous downturns, Declines in revenues, increased demand for services have cost New York City billions. For example, after the Great Recession, New York City used $7 billion in available resources, raised taxes more than $2 billion, while cutting $3.5 billion in city services. So we also need to manage risk and uncertainty, and that's just what we are doing. We've made critical progress on this by settling labor contracts with 95% of our workforce. We are carefully manage our out-year gaps. While we closely watch volatile global trends and take every prudent step to keep our city working even in the face of unexpected downturns, we are also contending with new challenges. For example, the proposed state budget presented us with some real uncertainties. The state proposed budget cuts would cost the city more than a billion dollars in 2017 and more in each succeeding year. These proposed cuts include $485 million from CUNY in 2017 and thereafter taking on nearly $300 million of state Medicaid payments in 2017, a figure which would grow close to $1 billion per year by 2022. Later, the governor clarified that ultimately this would not cost the city a penny, and the mayor, and I know the council members, that we will all hold the governor to that pledge. Another new challenge involves our pensions. As part of a regular review process, the city actuary is a 
adjusting assumptions that will increase the city's pension costs by $600 million annually. We've included this expense in our balanced budget for 2016 and 2017 and in each of the out years. This extra $600 million is addition to costs associated with lower earnings on pension investments for 2015, as reported by the Comptroller's Office in November. Our November financial plan reflected an additional contribution of $73 million, which will grow to approximately $300 million in 2020, to make the gap caused by underperforming investments. We're meeting all obligations to our five pension systems in 2017 through a $9.4 billion commitment. This commitment will help us fulfill our promise to reach 100% funding of our pension systems, and it is an important aspect of our disciplined and honest approach to managing the city's finances that we need to do. Another challenge comes from our public hospital system. As you know, New York City Health and Hospitals is the largest municipal hospital system in the nation, and it treats almost one in six New Yorkers. But today, health and hospitals confronted by painful challenges in the healthcare economy. By and large, the patients who go to health and hospitals are covered by Medicaid or are completely uninsured. The federal government is cutting reimbursements for the care of these uninsured patients, and Medicaid does not cover the cost of the care. This is forcing health and hospitals to transform how they do business, develop an operating model that is fiscally sustainable over the long haul, and will provide New Yorkers with high-quality care for decades to come. Dr. Ram Raju, the President and CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals, has already begun reforming the hospital system. While this process continues, we are proposing $337 million to cover this pressing expense for the current fiscal year. This is similar to the way we have supported the New York City Housing Authority, another cornerstone of our city, as they reinvent themselves in the 21st century. The Mayor stated that we will have a plan for health and hospitals before the upcoming executive budget. Now I would like to take you through some of the important investments we are making in the preliminary budget to create an even stronger New York. Made an investment of $115 million a year, full implementation to extend the $15 minimum wage to all city government employees who provide contracted work for the city at social and, at, and all contracted work at social service organizations. This means that at full ramp up in 2018, approximately 50,000 additional employees will see their wages rise to $15 an hour, making New York City a national leader in the fight to raise the wage. We're also making a number of investments in our public safety agenda. ShotSpotter investing $3 million in 2017 to expand gunshot detection technology. Creating a culture of safety at Rikers, investing $41 million for the 14-point anti-violence plan, investing an additional $58 million in training technology and enhanced staffing levels. Ambulance tours, investing $5.4 million to fund 15 additional FDNY ambulance tours and other new EMS initiatives that will save lives. Vision Zero, Investing $4.4 million to maintain speed cameras and develop street reconstruction projects. Investing $128 million in capital to install 100 new ca more cameras within authorized school zones, improve pedestrian safety in high traffic areas, deploy red light cameras in problematic intersections. The preliminary budget also focuses on education. It funds initiatives in the Mayor's Equity and Excellence Agenda such as second grade literacy, investing six, over 16 million for more than 400 literacy coaches, and by 2019 to ensure our more than 78,000 second graders will have every support they need to read at grade level. College and readiness, investing 10 million in 2017 to ensure every middle schooler and high schooler, over 147 students a year, have the opportunity to visit a college campus. Addressing overcrowding, investing, $868 million to add 11,800 new seats as part of the current five-year capital plan, bringing a total for this five-year plan to more than 44,000 new seats. We're also making major investments in social services that support our most vulnerable population. The preliminary budget makes an aggressive investment in the city's effort to combat homelessness through prevention, improved shelter conditions, and moving people into housing. Homestead aggressively and comprehensively addressing street homelessness. Shelter Repair Squad, investing $9.8 million to address critical facility issues and to create a hotline for shelter residents to report issues. Home Base, expanding 
the initiative that has already helped 91,000 New Yorkers at risk of shelter entry. Adult shelter programming, dedicating $16.9 million to help over 10,000 clients find employment. And supportive housing, investing $12.5 million in 2017 to, to begin the, the commitment of 15,000 new units of supportive housing. And we, invest in, in, and we invest to create systematic long-term improvements in the lives of homeless population. We are also committed to a constant review of our efforts. Moving forward, we will continue to make sure our investments are targeted and appropriate. We are also adding resources in this budget to make it easier and safe to get around the city. Select bus service, investing $13 million in capital to install 100 new enforcement cameras, a total of 185. The Staten Island Ferry, adding $47 million in capital to complete funding for a new 4,500 passenger vessel, including previous funds, the city will now be able to replace three of the oldest ferry vessels. In this budget, we're pleased to be funding a number of key council priorities, park enforcement patrols, efforts that will end the AIDS epidemic in New York City by 2020, fighting, fighting the scourge of K2, protecting our seniors from elder abuse. In conclusion, Thanks to our fiscal discipline, addressing risk, and the hard work of New Yorkers, our local economy and the city's fiscal situation are both thriving. But we cannot afford to ignore the very real and concerning economic signals we are receiving from around our country and the globe. The 2017 preliminary budget recognizes these real concerns as we build on our shared successes. It reaffirms our mutual commitment to discipline, responsibility, and meeting our challenges head on. It's a responsible budget that addresses the needs of New Yorkers through targeted investments, and it protects our fiscal health for the future. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I would also like to join both of you in thanking Latanya McKinney and the uh, Council Finance staff for their hard work and their partnership. We're confident that this is the start of a budget process that will be productive and successful, and now I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk, I wanted to start with the focus on the state budget risk. I know that you made mention to it in your testimony, um, but there's two, two factors um, that I wanted to focus on. One was obviously the state executive budget includes measures that would impose a significant cost to our city, as you made mention, to about a billion dollars. Um, while the governor has this has these actions, while the governor has publicly said that these actions will not cost our city a penny, there's still no sign of changes in the 30-day amendments. Have there been any conversations with the state to indicate that this will actually not increase the city's costs? So you're correct. There have, were no amendments in the 30-day amendments to reflect that, and there's been nothing detailed to us that would say exactly how that's going to be done. Um, we have had no conversations at this point. I have been told by the governor's staff they will be reaching out to me soon to uh, begin conversations, but at this point I have nothing to report exactly how that is going to be done or how they plan to meet that commitment. So clearly, you know, from our perspective, the fact that we've engaged in very little conversations um, and the state may be passing this budget by April 1st, 30 days. Does that bring concern to you as a director that they haven't engaged you as of yet? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Has the administration developed a, a contingency plan to deal with the nearly billion dollar um, cost increase? Uh, so we have not. We, in, we, we are holding the state to that commitment and in the, you know, the one house budgets will come out next week and we hope that those one house budgets that begin the conference process for the state legislature do not include those and that will be a first sign. But we have not developed a contingency because I think we all do know the ramifications of a billion dollars a year on this financial plan will be devastating in services. Medicaid, while at the same time that we are talking, and I talked about in my testimony, and I know you're going to be hearing from health, New York City Health and Hospitals, at the same time that Medicaid is not covering their cost, we're talking about being asked to contribute a greater share of Medicaid. Um, 
while we're being asked to contribute a greater share of Medicaid, actually New York City is the only social service district in the state that's actually meeting the global caps and is not exceeding them. So it's actually all the other counties around New York City that are exceeding the global cap on spending in Medicaid. New York City is actually within that cap, mm -hmm. and yet we're being asked to contribute a greater share at the same time that we're not being able to cover the largest health care system in the country with health and hospitals. So these consequences, to the consequences to CUNY of $500 million, these are enormous consequences to the system and to the priorities and the targeted investments that we're making. Our, our answer is that this cannot happen, and we have, we've been assured it won't happen, and we're holding them to that. So, but you've been assured by the statement that this won't cost a penny to the city. Is that what we're... Correct. I, from, you know, as a partner with you, it just seems um, we have a, a significant risk that's out there and to not even begin the process of perhaps thinking of a contingency plan is um, a little unsettling. I think that we really need to begin to engage. We're 30 days effectively today away from a state budget. So um, I would urge you that we need to really reach out to our partners on the state and, and express our concerns um, because uh, the 2% uh, cap on the city's property tax levy is something else, another factor that's possibly out there. The New York State Senate has proposed extending the 2% cap on the property tax levy in New York City. Um, this cap is imposed, on the, is imposed on other local governments in the state. What consequences would that have on top of our risk already um, have on the city's budget? Well, that, that would alone add another easily a billion dollars and probably more annually to already what, we're, what, we, just, what we were just discussing and describing. Um, we do not obviously support this. We don't think it, it's reasonable or a measured or thoughtful approach. New York City single-family homeowners have actually, unlike the rest of the state, had a cap since 19, have had a growth cap since 1983, actually, while the rest of the state. So when you look at effective tax rates in New York City compared to all of the suburbs around us, matter of fact, the whole state, they are three to four times higher than what is in New York City. Right. And, you know, and, and I would add, there, there was some talk that somehow the Medicaid piece was tied to the fact that the property tax cap had been, had been uh, the property tax cap and the Medicaid piece were related but when the state instituted a really significant reform to take over the complete control of Medicaid, they control everything here. They control the rate setting, the administration, everything about Medicaid. We have no role in this. And once again, though, the costs in New York City are within the, the global cap, they said. While we have no control in that, and when they did this, they announced enormous savings that New York City would achieve in every county around the state. And there was never a tie-in to a property tax cap. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about reserves and savings, especially since we are we have these risk factors out there. Um, in fiscal 2015 was the first year since the fiscal since fiscal 2008 where the city took in more money than it spent. Even so, the city's reserves are far below the optimal level and still below the pre-recession levels. Um, at the end of fiscal 2015, the city had accumulated 6.6 .6 billion compared to the 11 billion at the end of the fiscal of fiscal 2008. The controller claims that the city should maintain a healthy ratio of reserves to adjust operating expenditures at around 15 percent. Accord, uh, according to the January financial plan, we will end fiscal 16 with less than 7 percent. What are the uh, administration's plans to ensure we put away sufficient funds according to OMB? What is, in a, sufficient, what is in a sufficient amount from your perspective to save? Because I know while you spoke in your opening statement that we are in a great footing and we're saving in some cases more than before, if you look at the collective, if what you also said in your, uh, the first part of your opening statement at the global economy, are we ready should a recession Begin. So we should be very proud of the fact that working together over the past two budgets, we have actually achieved historic highs in our reserves. 
Uh, it is true in going into the Great Recession that there, in a, we, while we have higher reserves, there was an additional, there was much, there was a larger prepayment, which is what gets to those numbers you cited. Uh, at this point in time, given the balancing of the targeted investments, the amount of reserves that we have done in just two years, we believe this is the right level for this moment. That doesn't mean in the future that we shouldn't be doing more and that we shouldn't continue to have that conversation as we balance our targeted investments and what our priorities are with building up, with building up reserves. We need to protect those reserves, though, and we did that in the preliminary budget. And having been here for, you know, the tough times, as we like to call them, um, or as they were, clearly this council believes that we should be saving more for um, the rainy day. Or, you know, this is the time in our economy where we should be saving more. So we're going to continue in those negotiations and those conversations. Right. Well, I, I look forward to it. I, I said it in the opening testimony, the, uh, the, the brand new, the first time last year, the $500 million for the Capital Stabilization Reserve was really very much out of a dialogue we had right. with the Council where it said, okay, we're going to do, we have a need for a significant increase in a 10-year capital plan. We should be concerned about that. And that was actually part of our dialogue that said, okay, now let's do $500 million and, and let's try to put that aside and see how that works. And that is a great intro for my next question, um, which specifically about capital projects, and then I'll talk about miscellaneous and open up for questions from my colleagues. Um, actual versus planned commitments. The city's average actual commitment level over the last four fiscal years is $7.9 billion per year. The preliminary capital commitment plan for fiscal 2016 alone is $19.7 billion. How does OMB intend to close the gap between actual commitments and planned commitments, and what can the Council do to facilitate OMB's efforts? Right, so we are working on this. We've had this conversation. We need to work much harder on this. We've actually become much better on it. Um, we are now at high, higher levels this year. I want to I'll make sure we get you the right numbers, but I believe you're absolutely accurate on what the historic level has been, but I believe this year we are reaching at least a billion dollars, more than that, but I want to get you the exact number. So we are raising that, that level so we will actually commit. But no, you're absolutely right. We are not achieving the kind of goals we need to, and we are meeting. OMB is making reforms in its process. Uh, we are speeding up our approval process, and we need to do more, and we're working with the agencies on a regular basis now, and we need to work with the council and get your input into that process. And, and we're committed to do that. And this council is looking forward to working closely with you, because I think we need to get to a better space no question. Of, of our actual spending and the time in which um, it takes. The Department of Design and Construction manages more than $5.5 billion mm -hmm. in capital projects for 30 different client agencies. Many of these client agencies manage some of their capital projects in-house. Does OMB track how quickly capital projects are completed in-house by these agencies as compared to how quickly DDC completes them? And if so, what does the comparison look like? So I don't have... I just want to confirm that. So we have not tracked that distinction. They do different kinds of projects, but nevertheless, it's a good question, and, and we'll come back to you and say, with the understanding that there are differences in the type of projects, what are the differences and what can we learn from that? And, and that would be very much helpful in the prior question as well. And I'm going to be following up with the DDC Commissioner. Obviously, this is very specific to how frustrating it is for council members to have some projects delayed for years and cost, <coughs> excuse me, and um, cost to um, go for, and for it to cost so much more in every fiscal year we get asked for additional money on a project that should have been completed five years ago. So we need to improve this. We're committed to working with you to make that happen. It's to the benefit of everyone in New York that that happens. <laughs> Great. Um, and I'm going to talk about, I wanted to talk about, about uh, miscellaneous revenue. <laughs> Bless you. Oh, this is so a we're, great so day we're all today. Sick. <laughs> Thank God we have that great health benefit <laughs> as soon as we get an appointment. Um, 
In the preliminary plan, the city's miscellaneous revenue for fiscal 2017 is expected to be approximately $6.6 .6 billion, down from $6.9 billion in fiscal 2016 adopted budget. While some of this decline is due to rec recognized one-off revenues such as legal settlements, there appears to be a few miscellaneous revenue assumptions that are inconsistent with actual historic revenues. For example, RPIE late filing fees are projected to generate $4 million in revenue in fiscal 2017, but actual revenues for 2014 and 15 were over $20 million. ECB fines are projected to be $23 million in fiscal 2017, but revenues in 2014 and 2015 were over $40 million. DOB late filing fees and no permit penalties are projected at $23 million for the plan, but generate $42 million in 2014 and $52 million in 2015. And taxi, <coughs> sorry, tax license are at $31 billion in fiscal 2016 and 2017, but made an average of $40 million in fiscal 2014 and 2015. In addition, a large number of revenue projections for the out years are absolutely zero growth. It's just the same value held in fiscal 2020 as in fiscal 2017. How does OMB forecast the miscellaneous revenues and how often are these projections updated? Okay, so we do update them. They are very cautious, as is our, as are our tax forecast. And overall on revenue, with the concerns we outlined, um, we believe that the revenue forecast in general is, is cautious and the appropriate one at this time. On the specific pieces on miscellaneous receipts, we'll go back and take another thorough look, given the questions you've just listed. So, so I will I, come back to you on those. I know that you've been, that you do say you have oversight on them. It just seems that it's very difficult for us to understand why they would remain flat okay. when the history says, you know, I'm not asking you to go no, I get and, it. I get you know, it. and, and we'll not budget and responsibly, but history says we're off by millions of dollars okay. um, when it comes to the revenue. So I have a second round of set of questions. Um, Dean, you didn't cough once. I know. I, so far I'm you lucky. You said you were sick. <laughs> I, I don't sick. know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, the voice a little hoarser. There you go, there you go. Well, we, we finally got some cough drops on this side. Um, we'll see how good you, you answer you mind the questions. There one. you go. Um, we will now, we have been joined by Council Member Rosenthal, Levine, Cornegy, Menchaca, and Rodriguez. We will hear from Council Member Lander, followed by Council Member Mario. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, uh, first, I just want to underline the finance chair's point, and I appreciate your answer on capital projects management, and I'm glad there's a willingness there. I, just, I think that's going to have to be a real thoroughgoing investigation. Agencies manage capital projects in different ways. They Correct. track them in different Correct. ways. There's not a uniform way to see which contractors they're using, who's doing well. So it sounds like you agree we really need a comprehensive look at how to at the city's capital projects Correct. forecasting and management and that you're no committing to work on that. We are. That is great. That will make a lot of happy council members and save us money and produce the projects uh, faster. So that, that's very encouraging. Um, one of my favorite things in this budget is the $15 minimum wage, not only for city employees, but for the employees of contracted social service organizations, which is a significant step on which New York City is really leading the way and will have very broad anti-poverty impacts. Uh, it's also not simple to do. Uh, I know this year we took a step in that direction with living wage for contracted agencies, but it's been challenging both to get the funding out the door to those agencies and to put the process in place where we track and make sure that they're actually paying their employees the wages that we, are, we say we want them to be achieving. So can you talk a little bit about how we're achieving those goals and what we're going to do next year to make sure both the organizations get the resources and most importantly the employees get paid the wage? Yes. In the budget last year, we did 1150 for city employees. Actually, most of their, con their contracts have, are, are above that anyways for city employees. But for the contracted employees you're speaking of, uh, about 30,000 employees. We did the 1150 an hour. Um, that is to be implemented as we're speaking this year. 
Um, it has resulted. We wanted to be very careful, and I know we all shared this, that it actually went to the employees. It was not simply a, a, a rate enhancement to, uh, to the contract, but it actually went to the employees and verification of that. Uh, that process has taken a considerable amount of time. We do now have about 75% of, uh, of the contracts back into the agencies, so we can review those and start to get that going. But we need to get, we want to complete that completely this fiscal year. But you're absolutely right, and as we move forward, we have to figure out a way that we can work with our partners who are, uh, have their own, their own responsibility and their own pressures, a way to make this e also easier to do. And can I just ask that you find a way to communicate in a systematic way with the council, both on implementation of the, of the current year, but also the move to 15, Absolutely. so that we get updates on how sure. that's going, how the contracts are signed, how our work to, you know, we're, we're, it's a goal we're thrilled to be achieving together, but we want to make sure we're really getting there. Of course. Um, one area um, that I'm concerned we may, that we actually perpetually under budget um, is around shelter costs for homelessness. Um, and this is not new in this administration. In the Bloomberg administration, it was my sense that we under budgeted 50 to 100 million dollars every year on a sort of fingers crossed, maybe homelessness will go down this coming year without any real reason to believe it was going to. We are making historic investments in reducing homelessness, and I praise the administration for taking them, but I don't think there's reason to expect that next year's shelter census is going to be 15 percent lower than this year's. Um, as you know, the state comptroller has identified a risk of as much as $75 million that we're essentially under budgeting. Again, I don't think this is new. It's my sense that we've generally under budgeted on shelter costs and we almost always wind up paying 50 to $100 million more than we project. Um, you know, can you discuss that, convince me sure. that we're not under budgeting or so, that we need to make the adjustment in the executive? As you know, a couple major pieces are happening simultaneously. We've made a significant investment uh, with you over the past not only two years, but really over the past several months to address this growing problem. And, and let's go back. It's a problem when you talk about it increasing over years. It has been increasing over years, and we can dramatically show that occurring with the elimination uh, a by long the state standing, and city of the advantage. A right? long standing problem, both homelessness and under budgeting homelessness. And I'm glad we're doing more to get people off the streets, but doing getting so people off the streets is going to bring that, them into the homeless system. So right. we might wind up spending more no rather question, than less. No question, but we've been able at this point to, to at least plateau the population to, with, with encouraging more to come in. We are clearly doing more exits, and we need to do more exits. Part of that is also the state budget process. As you know, we have asked, for, we have asked and asked repeatedly for increases in the FAPS level, at least to what the federal government would provide. Um, we have asked that the commitment that the state promised us in last year's budget of almost $45 million a year, which we have put in and submitted proposals and asked repeatedly to get it approved, has not happened. Those additional types of resources will help us increase the exits. We are in a major review period now of both DHS and HRA. And as part of that review process, we're, one of the issues there is to address exactly what the, the question you're raising. What is an appropriate projection for us? What is an achievable goal for next year? And that's part of that process, and we will come back to you on that. Okay. And I, I, my, I will make an additional question, but I will just say, Madam Chair, in addition to all the New York State budget risks you've discussed, the state's assault on New York City's affordable housing system through the poison pills and the tax-exempt bond uh, program are a very, they're not a budget risk to New York City, but they're a disastrous risk to our affordable housing system, and I uh, hope this council will work together with the administration to stand up and make sure they're not included in the final version of the state budget. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. Councilmember uh, Minority Leader Matteo, followed by Majority Leader Van Bramer. There you go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know you touched base on the property tax cap. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about property taxes. Obviously, we property tax count for 42 percent of the revenue. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to go up to 45 percent, which is projected in 2020. Um, you know, and uh, you know, with hardworking, and I think you even said in your testimony, hardworking New Yorkers struggling, cost of living rising. Um, you know, I see this as a troubling trend that you know, 45 percent of our revenues comes out of our 
property taxes. Um, do, you, do you see this as a troubling trend? Uh, obviously, some of my colleagues and I are going to be pushing for a property tax rebate. Um, obviously, I would like to hear your thoughts on uh, sort of a property tax rebate. Budget's about priorities that I know. And for me, I think there's no better way when you're dealing with uh, having a surplus is to uh, give money back to our uh, New Yorkers who are struggling with high cost of living. So if I could just have your opinion and uh, the discussion. Well, you know the priorities of the administration and what the mayor's priorities are, and those are reflected in the preliminary budget. The mayor has not uh, raise property taxes. We have to be careful. We know that uh, in the both of the prior two recessions, property taxes were raised as a means of dealing with that, and on top of that, there were service cuts, and on top of that, the reserves were eliminated. So we have to, we have to be very careful here. If we're going to achieve the kind of targeted investments we want, that we maintain our tax base, that we build up those reserves, recognizing the risks we face, many risks, including the risks that we're talking about from potential state actions. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate your opinion. Obviously, uh, some of my colleagues and I, especially my delegation, uh, believe in a property tax rebate, believing that that can help uh, spur the economy, can help struggling New Yorkers who are having trouble paying their mortgage, staying in their homes. Um, so I look forward to having a robust discussion on that with, with, with the administration and, and within the council. Um, I want to talk a little bit about health course, healthcare costs as well. Uh, under the new labor contracts, uh, I believe there's a stipulation that if sufficient savings are not reached, the city has the right to return to arbitration. That's correct. And so at what point does that happen or you know, what would trigger that? What would trigger that would not be meeting the, the goals. The goal of 400 million in the first year, the goal of 700 million in the current year, the goal of a billion in 18 and in 17 and the goal of 1.3 billion and thereafter from eight, from 18 on uh, we have met the 400 million goal in, in 15 we are meeting the 700 million goal in 16 that's done and we will meet the billion dollars with the announcement and the hearing that was held last week you heard from uh, the OLR Commissioner Bob Lynn on how he was approaching and how we were going to achieve the, the one billion dollars for next year. So we are meeting that. So there's no reason uh, to go to arbitration. It was a safety for us to make sure for both us and the Municipal Labor Committee, but working in partnership, which is, you know, let's go back. When we started this, there were no contracts for years with any of our employees an unprecedented and not a responsible behavior for city government. We have changed that dramatically. We are at 95% contracts of our city employees, and we are meeting a, a health care commitment and goal that had been ignored for 20 years by, by more than one administration. No changes in health care, no improvement in the delivery of health care, and no attempt to get any cost savings. Okay. So, so obviously you're, you're confident that you won't get to that point. We are. Okay. Uh, so I, we talked about pensions before. I, I know you talked about, and maybe I, I missed it, the um, obliga pension obligation payments. Um, can you tell me how long, I don't know if you answered this before, current payment schedule takes to reach 100% in, in your pensions? Uh, 2032. 2032 is the exact 2032, date. we will reach 100%. And do you, do you see... Uh, you know, uh, any risk with our pensions moving forward, any foreseeable problems? Well, the, c the controller did report last, mm -hmm. and, in, and it was reflected in the November modification, the November financial plan, that we had, uh, that the earnings did not meet expectations, did not meet the 7% expectations, and that cost a significant amount of money, which was reflected at the time. Uh, right now, this, the, obviously, the market is not doing well. If that were to continue, then once again, I'm quite sure the controller would be telling us our earnings are not meeting that commitment. We would make up that commitment. I mean, the mayor was very clear about this. We're going to stay on the path to 100% financing, whatever that takes. And what the estimate currently is, is $9.4 billion for 2017. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I, we will continue to work with you and, and our city council colleagues, uh, you know, and what we believe the delegation's priorities will be for property tax rebates and, and, and looking at uh, spending. So I appreciate and uh, look forward to further discussions. Thank you, uh, Minority Leader. Majority Leader Van Bramer, followed by Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, 
And Mr. Uh, Foulihan, uh, thank you so much. I want to start by saying that I was uh, uh, a little surprised that you didn't have libraries in your testimony. The uh, record setting funding levels that were achieved last year with this administration working in partnership with the administration. I had to leave something for the question and answers. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, I want to say uh, thank you uh, for uh, uh, working with us. This council has long championed uh, libraries, obviously something I care about very passionately. Um, and full six-day service uh, uh, should be uh, the floor and not the ceiling. So I also want to say uh, um, uh, it was great that you baselined uh, half of the uh, restoration slash increase from last year, um, but want to uh, uh, encourage the administration to uh, baseline the rest of the funding that was added to the budget uh, last year, uh, which would uh, then once and for all, I think, make the statement that I hope that we all agree with, which is that six day service is uh, a critical uh, achievement that must be maintained. So I guess I would just uh, uh, ask if you went halfway, why not go all the way? So we did the, as you know, working together. It was a major initiative, major success of the adoptive budget last year. Um, we split the resources on that, the 21 million for, for each of us. We put that in the baseline. We have a serious commitment to six days service, as do you. I'm quite sure we're going to continue this conversation to achieve that goal. Uh, I appreciate that. I just uh, want to say I, I know that uh, um, if uh, it could be baseline uh, and, and that could be achieved uh, uh, if that were the decision of uh, uh, this administration and, and obviously we'll continue to, to push for that. I want to turn to uh, our culturals and um, uh, uh, make the case very strongly that uh, IDNYC uh, being one of the most uh, uh, prominent successes of this administration yes. could not be achieved without uh, the participation of the culturals uh, and the free memberships uh, that have now been expanded in the second year of IDNYC. Um, and while the council has increased funding for every single cultural initiative, um, uh, we have not yet been able to achieve a significant increase uh, in this administration's time to the uh, SIGs and to the program groups uh, that the Department of Cultural Affairs funds. You know how important they are to the city of New York. You know how important it is to tourism, which is at record levels. And you know how important it is to IDNYC and to breaking down barriers to access. So um, uh, there is a request for a significant funding increase for all of these organizations, both the large, the small, out of borough, community-based. Um, does the administration support that? Well, as you know, the priorities, these are, we're not going to argue about the importance, but the priorities we identified with limited resources are what's reflected in the preliminary budget. We know this is a process and that we're going to talk about our mutual priorities and how, and how we make, a, how we come to a conclusion on that. Uh, I look forward to uh, continuing that conversation. Now, the cultural institution's retirement system, sirs, as you are well aware, um, uh, there's some significant changes and uh, even some uh, uh, liabilities um, that currently exist. Uh, are you concerned about uh, the long-term stability of that fund and, uh, and concerned about the potential for folks who um, are relying on that retirement income um, uh, should that be taken away or, or minimized? No, we're not concerned about the viability of the fund. We do know we need to work with the cultural institutions to make sure that we are making the proper payments and that it's not becoming an undue burden on them. And we're going to be sitting down with them in the coming weeks to make sure that happens. And we know that you care about this. I appreciate that. I just want to um, reiterate uh, uh, my concern and our concern uh, for uh, uh, this very important uh, system and, and its impact. It could be very negative on um, not just those five culturals, uh, but uh, the folks uh, who are relying on that. And uh, uh, obviously, we'll, we'll look forward to continuing uh, that discussion. And um, I want to say that, uh, again, let's baseline the entire addition uh, from last year for libraries, make sure the six-day service is the floor and not the ceiling and make sure our culturals are funded 
uh, at the level that they should. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader Ben Bramer. We will have Council Member Rosenthal followed by Council Member Williams. Thank you much, Chair. Thank you so much, Chair Ferreras. Um, it's so nice to see you, Director Fulihan. I wanted to ask you a couple of contracts questions. First, about the central insurance program. Um, you know, in fiscal year 13, I think, uh, the central insurance program was eliminated. And um, last year, the council asked that you consider um, bringing it back. And I don't know how familiar you are with this, but this is a way for the human service and other contract uh, wardies who provide city services to use the pool of uh, the city's buying power to buy health insurance and other types of insurance more cheaply. Um, I'm wondering if you have indeed reviewed the feasibility of restoring the CIP and if you could talk about your findings. So, as you know, there was a shift, and, and at the time the argument had been that it would be covered in the rates, but you're speaking to the problem. We are having conversations right now with some of the, for example, the major participants in that, I believe, were the daycare community. Uh, we are talking to that community and to the union about, about health care and ways we can improve that. So we're looking at the issue. I don't have a conclusion to give you at this time. Okay. That was a little bit separate than what I'm asking for. So I apologize I'm if so I answered the wrong question. so glad you're doing that too. Um, that's incredibly important given the pay parity disparity there and all the problems we're having um, with the daycare workers. But no, I used to be chair of the board of a small nonprofit and we were required to buy, provide insurance to our Workers, we used prior to 2013, we bought into the city's uh, program at a um, much uh, um, uh, at a much better rate because of the pow purchasing power of the city. I'm wondering if you will continue to offer that program for our nonprofits that so provide let me city come back services. To you. Let me come back to you and get. To make sure I'm answering it properly. So one way that I um, that I'd like to link it for your consideration is, you know, the federal government requires that local administrations provide a 10% overhead for administration of city contracts. Mm -hmm. The city has not fulfilled its responsibilities there. One way of doing it is through the CIP. Um, I'm wondering if you're also researching. We are. Um, and where are you in that? Uh, we, what are your findings? I don't have a conclusion at this point, but we are looking at that, so I'll come back to you on both points. Uh, when will you come back to us? I'll come back to you soon. I don't have a date specific, but I'm looking Do at that Do you think you'll come issue. back to us before the next set of hearings? At the next, after the you mean preliminary budget response? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, similarly, at the last, um, last year's hearing, I talked to you about the um, NYCHA security contracts and uh, how disappointed I was in looking at them myself for my own district that they seem to be um, irregular and oddly negotiated and you had responded by saying that you were signing off on every single contract yourself. I was wondering what you found in signing off on those contracts. So we believe that the contracts are on schedule at, at NYCHA going f forward and have been for the past year. If so again, my question is not on the, are they on schedule. My concern in looking at the contracts myself mm -hmm. was that there were irregularities in the contracts. They look suspicious to me. And I've been pressing NYCHA on a regular basis to explain to me those irregularities. Right, so we're what I'm wondering is when you signed off on them, did you notice any irregularities? So we do not sign off on the NYCHA specific contract. We signed off on the funding. Um, I, honestly, again, I'm What gonna have gave to you say confidence I, to sign I'm, off on that funding given the types of questions I raised at last year's hearing? 
Right. It's based on the scope of work that NYCHA is providing us that gave us confidence to do that. Once again, I'm happy to do a follow-up on this. Yeah, I'd to like to understand so? what gave you confidence okay. when Fine. I looked at it in my district so we should, and there we was should, great disparity then between we then projects you know what? for no reasonable I, I, reason. My last question, I, and but I'll to, come back but to, to answer it, it in the second round. To answer it, to answer it, then we should actually sit down with you and understand. I mean, and look we've at, had a year to sit down, and you've, the city has signed off on hundreds of contracts since I asked you, and I'm just, you know, you can imagine my concern sitting here now okay, and then hearing I'm that, happy oh, we'll to, sit down I'm with I'm happy you. to do it again and actually sit down right. with you on where you believe there's a disparity, and let's see if we can explain that. Uh, okay. My last question in the second round when we come round, we'll have so you can prepare for it, is about the procurement innovation project uh, where the preliminary plan in, includes, I think, $13 million. I'd like to have a better understanding of that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal, and we've added you to the second round. Um, Council Member, we've been joined by Council Member Chin, Levine, and Gibson. Levin, sorry. Um, and we will now hear from Council Member Williams, followed by Council Member Cumbo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, I have a few questions. First, I was going to start by asking what in uh, the governor's history leads you to believe that he will keep his word when it comes to dealing with us? But I'm not going to force you to answer that. I'm just going to say it more as a statement. Particularly, uh, we saw what he did with the money that was supposed to go to NYCHA um, that didn't really come the way it was supposed to. And so I'm a little concerned that we don't have a contingency plan. Uh, are we going to wait until April uh, before we have a contingency plan, or are we going to start to develop one uh, now? Because a billion dollars is a lot of money. Right, I'm still going to answer it the same way. The state should not be taking a billion dollars from the city of New York for Medicaid when we are living within the global cap, when it was part of a statewide proposal, there is no reason to do that, and we should not accept that. And we should, nor should we accept. We, we, let's be clear, on, on just like every other community and every other community around this state, we provide a third of the funding for CUNY community colleges. Um, we actually provide more than that. We probably provide 37. We're probably the highest uh, district in that in our community college. And we happen to be the only municipality that actually doesn't control the board that governs their community college. I, I, so, I agree. So there, there, is no, there is no reason for us to have these transactions occur to us, whether it's CUNY, whether it's Medicaid, whether it's taking away the commitment of $170 million that was made in 2003 that was overridden by the state legislature and upheld by the Court of Appeals. Uh, we've seen other aid programs disappear. We're the only municipality that doesn't receive uh, aid to uh, municipalities. I understand that, and I, I agree with you. So my, there's, my a time is out, there's a legislative process. There's a legislative We had the governor. I got it. I just want to, when it comes to CUNY, I think process. he's doing some things that are that will decimate it, as well as some of the housing things that were brought up by my colleague, Councilman Melander. Uh, but a lot of what I've seen move uh, have been more politically oriented, in my opinion, as opposed to what will most impact the people of the city. So I just want to make sure we're thinking about his history with us on these issues and, and planning for uh, hopefully what doesn't happen. But that's why but we want to focus all our attention and together on, on what's happening in Albany right now. Sure. We're right, we're right in the process where the one house bills are being sure. developed and we'll I gotta present jump in, it I next week. I apologize, you gave me okay. the opportunity. So. Sure. Um, the, the next question is, uh, I know that I'm proud that the speaker mentioned in her uh, state of the city, uh, I'm proud that uh, uh, the chair has her own initiative around youth jobs. It's clear that youth jobs are important um, to this council and will be in the budget. Uh, to several of us, I know uh, it is a priority. Um, particularly funding all year round, um, uh, doubling the all year round jobs that uh, the chair uh, put as initiative, and essentially doubling uh, the summer youth jobs um, that can actually bring us much closer, if not to universal jobs uh, for all young people, which I think will aid in some of the public safety things uh, that you put in. Um, my, uh, my question is that uh, a prior to the administration, uh, do we think we can get there? It's about uh, 100 and $20 million, I think roughly, uh, can get us there. Uh, based on uh, money that we spent on uh, police, $170 million last year, we found that funding. We didn't cut anything. We actually enhanced everything um, based on the fact that we've uh, had new priorities of $598 million this year, 1.1 in 17. Um, is that something we can 
look forward to achieving this year. So once again, I mean, the, the, the mayor's priorities were outlined in the preliminary budget. It doesn't mean that we're not supportive of these kind of initiatives and that, that we don't want to try to join you. This is a much harder year. The resources and the risks are, have grown from what we did last year. So we're happy to work with you going forward, but we always have to be cautious about those risks we're confronting and how we establish those priorities. But we, I understand that's the beginning of this process. So you believe the, the goal of uh, getting summer jobs for all young people that apply and the goal of doubling uh, Councilman Ferreira's initiative is a, a goal that the administration would like to see happen? I, 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 what I'm, all, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that obviously these are and the other things that are, that are going to be raised here today are, are, are worthy things. The question is, can we prioritize in the priorities we've been given and the limited resources, the targeted investments, maintaining, maintaining the reserves? Your colleagues asking, should we be doing more in that? The risks that we're talking about in the state, we have to balance all that. We know we have to work with you in achieving whatever that final result's going to be. We successfully did that last year. I'm quite sure we're going to successfully do it again. Sure, um, and that, that number for the officers is going to only grow, obviously. Um, I think this is at least as worthy of what, it, uh, what we did last year with the officers, and every data point shows that it's probably the single most thing that we can do to deal with particularly gun violence among young people. And so my hope is that what you're saying will translate into doing something monumental and historic. Thank you, and I'd like to Thank be you. placed on the second round. Thank you, Council Member. We will now hear from Council Member Cumbo, followed by Council Member <coughs> Levine. Thank you, Chair Ferreras. Um, I want to reiterate uh, the importance of the summer youth program um, throughout the city of New York. I certainly want to echo Council Member Williams' uh, passion for this because I think that as a city we should understand how much it costs the city of New York not to do summer youth for each of our uh, young people so that we can do a clear analysis in that way, but certainly it's very important um, to the viability of our young people. I wanted to talk about the investment of $115 million a year at full implementation to extend a $15 minimum wage, um, and it talks about for those who provide contracted work with the city at social service organizations. Does that include organizations such as a small not-for-profit organization that's receiving a $5,000 or $10,000 uh, uh, contribution from the city? Does it include those smaller organizations? And in addition to that, has there been additional conversation about how to strengthen them during this transition? So it, it depends on the contract. So I, I can, if you, you'll have to, if it's part of, if it's just a grant, it would not include them. I'm sorry, if it is if just a... If it's just a grant, it would not include them. If it was part of a contract with an agency, it would include them. I, I do want to add, I mean, while we all support this goal, and the mayor's been very public about this, and you've been very public about this, mm -hmm. I mean, the real way to achieve this, of course, is to have Albany enact. The, is to have all of the, Albany enact the $15 uh -huh. minimum wage, so this goes across the board and, and well beyond the 50000 that we've targeted. But we are trying to reach that 50000 We will reach that 50000 by 2018. It is a complicated process, as some of your colleagues have raised earlier, in the process to make sure that happens. But the ultimate goal should be a minimum wage law that covers all workers. So just to be clear, because I just want to, so many small not-for-profit organizations would consider themselves having a contract with the city once they but, receive funding. Then they should be for. covered. So, I mean, we may, if you, if there's someone you're concerned about mm -hmm. and, uh, and somehow it has not been taken care of, we, you should give us the name of the group and we'll make sure. Okay. And I, I am, I'm not just concerned about one or two groups. As a small not-for-profit leader in my previous life, I'm very concerned about how its implementation will affect smaller groups uh, moving forward. So we can talk about that yes. offline. Sure. Um, just wanted to add also here, you talk about uh, uh, initiatives such as the park enforcement patrols, the HI HIV AIDS epidemic, uh, K2 and others. In conversations with the mayor, we also discussed at length what was going to be the city's financial position about the safety of women in New York City. And he expressed at that time that he was going to be putting forth initiatives, programs that perhaps have not been vocalized before and wanting to know what that looks like, what does a dollar amount look like for that, and where will it exist?
yeah, this is something we are working on now, and we'll have to be coming back and working with you. We'll, have, we'll come back to you on this. Has the it been initiatives you're talking about are things that we're actually working on at this point. And so has it been discussed to the basic understanding? Because as you know... I, I don't have a, a proposal to put forward to you at this point. Okay. But I'm happy um, to, we're happy to work with you. And then also a question. When we first came into the council, there was a great deal of concern because we were facing the closure of potentially 17 different community centers uh, throughout our NYCHA developments. Moving forward, um, I want to know so that we can best prepare ourselves, the stability of those community centers, wanting to understand how stable they will be, um, and moving forward, what else can we continue to understand? So let me come back to you. We'll talk to NYCHA and come back to you specifically where we are in the community centers and what's the current state on the community centers. We'll give you an update. As you know, many of them went to aging. Many of them went to uh, DIFTA. Mm -hmm. um, Others went to DYCD, so we will give you an update and tell you the ones that are remaining in NYCHA and how we want to move forward. So we'll come back, but I, I'll, I'll obviously have a conversation with NYCHA first. And the other thing, I guess more specifically, I'm also interested in the opportunity or the conversation to find out about reopening community centers that have remained closed for some years. And we have a community center in our district that we are very interested um, in reopening. So as part of that and my conversations with NYCHA, if you give us the name of the community centers and, and uh, uh, also some background on why you believe there will be, obviously we want to make sure that anything we're doing in this area is adequately used and, and is effective. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cumbo. We will have Councilmember Levine followed by Menchaca, followed by Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. And great to see you, Mr. Fullahan. I want to commend the administration in the strongest possible terms for what's really been an unprecedented investment in legal services to tenants in housing court, tenfold increase in just two years. No mayor in history has done anything like that. And incredibly, this is a case where we make an investment and we see a result. Yes. As has been reported uh, in recent days, we saw an 18% drop in evictions in New York City last year. Um, that means over 5,000 uh, families have remained in their homes. Uh, and I think it's directly attributable to the investments you're making. So really kudos to you on that. And we're proud the council has been able to help with that investment as well. Thank you. Uh, much of it has been driven by the mayor's uh, commitment to provide legal services in the upzoned neighborhoods. I believe it's 5 million per zone. Um, given that uh, we expect ultimately to go up to 15 upzone neighborhoods, uh, I'm wondering where, what that takes us to once we've completed that trajectory. By my calculations, we would be at over $100 million a year in commitments. I'm just checking the math. It sounds right to me, but I want to make sure. Okay, let me come back to you. I, 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 I want to... You th okay, so we think it's a little under that, but I want to make sure. Okay. Come back. If, if it's under that, I'd like to know the math because I'm just correct. If I multiply I, I, five I, times I, 15, I get right. 75 million plus yeah, all the we'll, other commitments. We'll make sure we'll give you at full implementation what the number is. Fair enough. Um, what's, what's so important about this policy is that in addition to all the human benefits, there's also financial benefits. Uh, and savings at the city. Agreed. Agreed. Realizes. This goes directly to the conversation we were having about the homeless projections and what's going to happen to the homeless population. Absolutely. So um, do, do you have a way to track that? Do you have a way to track how much money the city is saving as evictions fall um, across various categories? So this is being... also one of the aspects that we're talking about in the reorganization and restructuring. One of the things that we're directly looking at is to try to make sure that we understand which of the many investments that we have all put forward and how they are being implemented and are they effective. Maybe not every program is actually being effective as you and I think the legal assistance is. Maybe there should be other diversions into different types of programs. So that actually getting metrics that say, here's what we're doing, and you know we're doing that. We're posting much more information on shelter repair and what's happening, and through the whole homeless area we're doing this. So that is another part of what we're, of what we're doing. So yes, we are very interested in results and actually saying, here are things that are going to have the maximum results. 
to get people both not into the shelters and to get exits out of the shelters into, into, host, into housing. We were, we were very pleased in the council to, together with the mayor to create an office of civil justice uh, last year, which uh, yes. whose director has, be, has been appointed and testified here a week or two ago, Jordan Dressler, off to a great start. Uh, and he made the point that the chief, former chief justice of New York State has estimated, uh, convened a task force that estimated that government taxpayers save $6 for every $1 that we invest in civil justice. Now that counts state and federal as well, but I think the point is incredibly powerful. Uh, and you get to such a big number by looking not only at homeless shelter savings, but also education savings. In the Ed Committee a week or two ago, we looked at all the money that we spend on extra money serving homeless children. And you can go across most city departments and see how homelessness and eviction potentially adds to costs. So can you begin to put sure. your... Sure. Well, look, easy example. And the epidemic. I mean, we know that there's a direct correlation, and we can actually say here, when, if we are able to achieve that, if the state joins us, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the expansion of HASA, we know that there's a direct result and a direct reduction in the population in the shelters. So can we work with your office to try and build the systems to get kind of ongoing estimates of those savings? Absolutely. Okay. Definitely. Very good. Um, yep. Excellent. Uh, to shifting gears very quickly, those of us who are thinking about the infrastructure needs of the upzone neighborhoods, whether they be parks or schools or libraries, um, Sometimes people push back and say, well, the city's in more precarious fiscal situation. We have to be careful about spending too much on the capital front. Do you have a response to that? So I have many responses to it. Uh, on, we have put aside an unprecedented amount of money for affordable housing, but we also put aside a billion dollars for neighborhood improvements, which no one had ever done. People had made promises in the past. They had talked about it, but they never said, okay, Here's our capital plan, here's how we're going forward, and here's the commitment, and that commitment is spent by collaborative effort that involves everyone in this room and the communities. So we think actually this is unprecedented, and that's the way that commitment is serious and will be executed on that commitment. On the capital plan all over, it's an ambitious capital plan. We've acknowledged that. It is part of the very reason that we are building reserves to historic levels. It is part of the very reason that we have put aside for the first time last year, $500 million in the capital stabilization reserve. It is the reason that all of the monitors and the rating agencies constantly cite that the city's finances are very healthy and that we have taken steps to reduce risk, that we have been cautionary, that we 95% contracts with our, with our unions, with our labor force, that we have put aside reserves at historic levels and that we are protecting that that capital commitment and we are making sure to stay within a range that we believe is reasonable with uh, with respect to the city's overall revenue and we're achieving that and we're monitoring that constantly okay thank you very much thank, thank you thank you councilmember we will uh, have councilmember Menchaca followed by councilmember Rodriguez followed by councilmember Chin we've been joined by councilmember Johnson thank you chair uh, and thank you so much for being here today I'm going to jump right in and, uh, and say that we are uh, in just kind of reviewing your testimony and looking at our budget season this year. I'm very interested in wondering and hopeful that you can help us build a tracking system from our New York City budget that mimics a report about a, about, about a year ago from the Fiscal Times. Uh, they did a big report about the undocumented immigrants in our nation, pumping in about $11 billion mm -hmm. in the economy. There's a big fallacy right now uh, that immigrants don't pay into the system. It'd be great to kind of work with you to figure out how we can pull the, the numbers out on what si the city is experiencing uh, in these uh, really kind of big surpluses. Can you tell us a little bit about work you're doing now or, or what you can do in the very near we, future? We would be delighted to work with you on that project. Great. It's, a, it's an excellent idea. We'd be happy to do that. So Wonderful. Is there anything that you know now? You, you know more than, than you're, 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 you're swimming in this No, but I want to be money. careful. I, information. It's, a, it's a great idea. We know it's a positive benefit, cool. and we will, we're happy to work with you on this. Great. Thank you. That's, that's helpful. Uh, more specifically, we know that through some of your testimony and just looking at, at the health care, ACA coming in, federal, state changes, uh, it's, it's, it's 
impacting our local hospitals. One of the things that, that I know is, is, is pretty much uh, supported by the data is our, our immigrant community that are uninsured, many of them are uninsured, are, are going to our city hospitals. We want them to go to our city hospitals. That's why they're there, to support all New Yorkers. Are you working and thinking about, about how to uh, not just kind of fill that gap of yes. cost? And so, so can you tell us a little bit about, so about what, that, what that looks like? So you're right on the fact and on the policy. So it, it is a significant portion of health and hospitals patients are, under, are, are uninsured, let's put it there. They are, they are uninsured and the federal government, uh, while we're very, all very fond of the Affordable Care Act, one of the things it assumed was that everyone would be insured. And therefore, the long-term trend is to, uh, is to reduce the charity care that the federal government provided. That is clearly putting stress on New York City health and hospitals, and we need a way to do that. We have started these conversations. The mayor has said he will be coming back before the executive budget. We have done temporary action right now. Um, health and hospitals has already begun a transformation, but we need to more directly challenge this and look at how we serve this population. By the way, I'm not sure that everyone who is uninsured, actually, we should find other ways they may be they may be able to access additional benefits or Medicaid benefits, so we need to thoroughly investigate that, and we need to move with that. And we, we will partner with other groups, and we're already starting, and Health and Hospitals is already starting conversations to get immigrants access to health care and to make sure that we can strengthen that. So we very much are, are working on this issue. Great. And I know that, that this council has, has put some money behind that concept. And you guys are putting you, some energy. We, we have started, and you and absolutely have It would be great to, to kind of join forces on that front. And, and just as in my last, in my last minute, uh, just want to thank you uh, and the chair and the speaker and the mayor's office and, and, uh, and for everyone that's listening at home, on March 14th, we'll be having our first ever budget hearing uh, for the immigrant, uh, Immigration yes. Committee. Uh, so this is, this is an opportunity for us to, to kind of highlight so many of the things that this budget has done already in these last two years to really affect positive change in our immigrant community. And I'm looking forward to, to engaging you all on that, on that date. And we welcome everyone back into the chambers to do that. Um, but just to recap on, on next steps, the we'll work on uh, figuring out how we can pull out real yes. numbers about how the impact is real in New York City, uh, not just on revenues, but also jobs. You list all the jobs in, our, uh, in, your, in your report, in your testimony. It'd be great to kind of have a, have a filter for how our immigrant community is connected to those jobs. So let's work on that too. And then finally, looking at the hospitals pieces. I know there's a lot of models out there right now that are kind of national models, but I think we can do that together and really impact uh, uh, the, the kind of fiscal solvent question around, around health care and just get people health care. Agreed. So thank you so much for being here today. We look forward to it. Thank you, Council Member. We will now hear from Council Member Chin. Um, followed by Council Member Levin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, Director Fulhead. Great to see you. I'm happy to see that um, elder abuse is baseline in the preliminary budget, so I'm glad you have that in your testimony. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good start. Yes. Now, in fiscal year 2016, um, the Council provided funding to DIFTA representing more than 10% of its entire budget. That was $33.8 million, more than 10% of its core budget. Now, I think that's really the responsibility of the administration because it's core program. It's not new initiative, but it's core program. So why hasn't the administration baseline that funding? Um, especially some of the programs, the funding needs are smaller from one to $3 million. Um, I, I want to make sure I understand the question, so I, I'm, I'm a little confused whether you're talking about a base funding or a program, so I just want to make sure that you're talking about a certain percentage of what the, you, you're asking me the DIFTA budget should be, or you're talking about a specific program. Well, I'm I, talking, I apologize. Yeah, I'm talking about programs that are core services, that, for example, 
part of the, that $33.8 million was supporting senior centers, um, even like the, the meal program. So, so those really should be baseline because they are core services. They're not something new or something extra. Uh, So I, I think the answer to this is similar to the question on other council initiatives that, that I've raised with other members. I mean, look, I, I, once again, we're not saying that these are, are not worthy uh, programs. Um, we did baseline uh, I, the elder abuse piece. Um, I, I know we're going to continue these conversations. I have no doubt we're going to continue these conversations with you specifically. Um, I look forward to that. I mean, we set and the mayor set his priorities in this. It wasn't that saying that these other programs, but there was a li there's a limited amount of resources. Uh, we have all the risks and concerns we've talked about. We have the reserves we need to maintain, and there's uh, there's the request uh, by several members that we should be even building on that. So we have to take all these together and work towards a final adopted budget. So we're happy to continue that conversation with you. I mean. One thing for sure is the senior population is continue to grow. And each year the council, you know, we fund some really innovative programs. For example, on um, the natural occurring retirement community, right? The, <coughs> the, the unique model, not the classic, and we're trying to create new models, and the council is supporting that. But ultimately, it really should become a core program because those are the programs that will keep our senior healthy and strong and be able to age in the community. And in the long run, I think we need to, to really see how much money that the government will be saving when the seniors are not going to emergency room, they're not going into nursing uh, home, they're aging in place. And just like uh, last year uh, in the budget, uh, the mayor finally we're very happy you put in money for 4.3 million for home care services for senior who are on wait lists, yes. and we clear the wait list, but it wasn't baseline this year. To me, it doesn't make sense. You know, you took care of the people on wait list, and now the money, if this money is not there, then what? We take them off the wait list? I mean, put them back on the wait list again? Um, so I think going forward, um, in your testimony, you also talk about asking agencies for saving. And I think you really have to look at DIFTA and make sure that they don't hand you back the, the money because you asked them for saving, that they really need to look at how to really spend that money to support their core program. I'm going to make sure this year they're not going to give anything back. Uh, <laughs> so, we'll work with you on how they achieve savings. Yes, I mean, I mean, I really look forward to working with you. I know the mayors have... Um, you know, invest in terms of capital dollars for building senior yeah. housing. I mean, that is great news. But I think going forward, I, I really think that we can work together, you know, together with OMB and the council to really see how much money are we saving in the long run by investing in services for our senior, keeping them healthy and strong and aging in place. I think we really have to sort of work together to get that value um, that, that we are, you know, saving government money in the long run. Okay. Well, thank you. We're looking forward to that. Thank you for raising for me the senior housing, which was a major new commitment. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Chin. Um, Councilmember Levin, followed by Councilmember Cornegie. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Director, uh, very much for your testimony. I have a couple of questions here. Uh, first one is around early learn. Uh, uh, we are seeing right now uh, in the status quo that one of perhaps the unintended consequences to a very successful UPK rollout is that there's um, a disparity between uh, the pay that a, a UPK teacher receives in the school setting, in the uh, not-for-profit setting, and what early learn teachers are receiving in terms of pay. And so there's this uh, disparity across the system that's creating all types of um, uh, unsettledness within, within the system. So uh, has OMB taken a look at what it would cost to bring pay parity across the board from early learn teachers who are teaching our zero to three year olds uh, to the UPK uh, teachers? No, so I, I don't have a number on that. I can tell you this. 
I, I don't have a specific number. We can, I can get you a number. But Has I OMB have, looked at it? We have been looking at the pay issue, obviously, for our teachers at DOE, for UPK teachers at DOE, for the UPK teachers at the not-for-profits, and in early learn. We are in the process. I just want to add this. So we have recognized in early learn in many ways that we need to be making adjustments. We have already instituted adjustments in the rates that goes back several years to give them relief, which I think did give them significant relief. Mm -hmm. So that already starts to address that problem. Right. Um, we have talked and are working with the community about a new RFP, which would incorporate many of the kinds of concerns that they're doing. So we're having that conversation with them right now. You know that uh, there is a labor discussion going on as we're speaking right now between right. Uh, the daycare council, um, so the early, the early learn providers and 1707, and right. the city is participating. We're not a direct we're, we're not the employer here, but we are participating, and that's going on right now, and we're trying to work out what, what is an appropriate and fair settlement. Right. I think that a fair settlement, I mean, if I may, I mean, I think my understanding is that a fair settlement between the Daycare Council and 1707, they're actually on the same page on a lot of these issues, and it's a question of the funding that's available from the city to allow them to come to... Well, they have many, they have many, as, and, and I want to be careful here, they have, yeah. many, they have many needs that they are looking for sure. uh, uh, as all negotiations, and we're trying to see if we can come to an accommodation. The big one that I've identified as the chair of the committee is that, is that there's a, this issue of pay parity is a big one, and that's going to be the one that's going to cost the most amount of money from the city because you have a, uh, a, an early learn teacher uh, that has a significant amount of education and training making $10,000 less than their UPK colleague in the same setting. It's, it, it's, it's creating all types of, of um, uncertainty within the system. And so, so, so once again, yep. we are, we, there is actually a long list. Let, let's remember what we're, doing, what we're doing on the $15 is actually helping many employees. In but not... But not the I, I, I know, but not let's, the let's, it's, there, it's, there, it's, there's a huge, there's, there are and, many, there are right. many workers in that system, and the $15 is a significant benefit. Right. There are many needs they have on the table that they've requested. The, the whole early learn community has requested, and we're trying to address those in a fair and balanced way. I'm not, where that ex eventual result, I think we'll come back and say, eventually, is that result? The solution is going to end up costing the city money. That's the reality. The reality is that. It's going to cost the city millions and millions of dollars more to create an equitable system across the board. And, and I think that that's, that's my, as, as chair of the committee, talking to providers, talking to Take Care Council, talking to 1707 and CSA and all of the uh, players that have been involved in this, the advocates, um, there's a consensus across the board that really what's going to have to happen in order to create stability within the system, because right now the system is incredibly unstable. Um, I see it all the time. I see it where providers are, are, are uh, uh, losing their contracts, not taking up contracts because they can't make it work. The system's going to have to have an infusion of, of funding to make it work. So, right? once again, there are, there are legitimate issues. There are serious issues that have been put on the table. We hope to come to an appropriate conclusion. We should also, though, I mean, for perspective, we now have over 68,000 children in, in the full UPK. day, high quality UBK, an amazing accomplishment of this administration and this, and this city council that no one ever thought was going to happen. And that obviously was going to have consequences for the, for the community, and it did. I would argue most of them incredibly positive. Very positive, maybe some things where we're also seeing a, an un, some unintended consequences to, to the early learn system, which was pre-existing. I have a feeling we're going to continue this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, we will have Council Member Cornegie followed by Council Member Johnson, followed by Council Member Gibson. Uh, still good morning. So good morning, uh, Director Fulham. Um I would be remiss if I didn't um, chime in where my colleagues left off as it relates to um, what we believe to be the universal uh, uh, jobs, youth jobs proposal. Um, I'm going to speak on behalf of uh, the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, which now in this body is the largest caucus, which have decided to make um, this a priority uh, and have a reasonable expectation that the administration will recognize that and make it a priority as well. Both parts uh, increasing uh, the summer youth employment program and making it year-round. 
Uh, so having said that, there's no response necessary for that, but having said that, I'd like to move on. Thank you. Uh, to the Department of Small Business Services and the two new programs, uh, the MWBE loan and bond program, and just ask a couple of questions. As it relates to those, MWB firms have repeatedly cited access to capital and difficulty obtaining bonding as barriers to entry, uh, and they prevent them from obtaining contracts. The preliminary plan provides $10 million to SBS for an MWB loan program and another $10 million for an MWB bond surety fund. Um, how, outside of the task force, which I am a member of, uh, are you promoting awareness of the program, and how specifically is the program scheduled to be implemented, both those programs? So we're, the agency is working on the RFP right now, and, and then we need an aggressive, uh, we, we, look, there's an incredible need here. This is addressing that need. Uh, we need to work with you and make sure that we get the proper outreach. The intention is to broadly expand those who can participate and not simply talking about the core group that's already participating, but how we expand that effort. So we're open to ideas on this and working with you on this. And, uh, you know, now's the right time to do this. So absolutely, and, and while we agree that it's a, it's a very worthwhile um, and needed program, we just want to make sure that we can do the necessary outreach and education so that the uh, minority firms uh, that, are, that are ready and prepared can benefit from it. So we have uh, in the task force uh, uh, a very robust group of people, but we certainly want to make sure that outside of the task force, everybody in the city of New York that's a minority-owned uh, firm has the opportunity to benefit from those, um, those programs. And then at some point, obviously, the obvious question is uh, about the expansion sure. uh, and the increase of those programs, but we're going to make sure we can do everything we can in partnership with the administration to make it successful so that we can come back next year and ask for more money. Okay. Well, we are committed to working with you on this. Thank you, Council Member. We will now hear from Council Member Johnson, followed by Council Member Gibson, followed by Council Member Kalos. Uh, good to see you, Dean. Uh, thanks for your testimony. I wanted to dig a little bit more into uh, the New York City uh, Health and Hospitals uh, budget. Um, we know that the administration, I think rightfully, uh, decided not to renew the contract for Corizon last year, which provided uh, health uh, services at Rikers Island. Uh, as you've talked about, there is um, just a growing deficit problem with uh, health and hospitals, and the city, I think, uh, smartly put in some money this year, over $300 million, as you pointed out in your testimony, to fill the gap. Uh, I think part of the reason why there were problems with Corizon, besides just from a management perspective, but I don't think that uh, there was actually uh, the requisite amount of dollars being put in to get the care needed on Rikers Island uh, for a very difficult patient population that has a lot of chronic uh, diseases. Um, so I wanted to just understand, I know that, the, that uh, with the city taking over those services and it being transitioned to formerly H HC, the money was sort of kept whole. Is there a possibility that in this upcoming budget that depending on how these first six months go with the city taking over those services, the city could potentially increase the amount of money that would go to provide health care services on Rikers Island above what Corizon was getting? Yes. And do you have any estimate on what that would be? No, we're actually, that, I mean, you're absolutely right. We have just ex effectuated this. Uh, we financed the complete transition. We know there are some improvements we also need to achieve uh, on Rikers to, uh, to, as part of that. So, and in fairness, this really should be part of the review, and we're having conversations with health and hospitals about this as we speak. So you said in your testimony that before the executive budget, the mayor or Dr. Raju is going to outline sort of the, the plan forward for our public hospital system. Uh, do you have any details on what that plan is? So, on the, 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 what you know 
and, and you know, we're happy to sit down with you on this, uh, have a longer conversation. We're going to be having many conversations, really, in the weeks going forward. We You've know engaged we with Manat to correct, look at the finances. Right. And, and we, know there, we know there's a structural problem. We know why that structural problem is occurring. We know it's getting worse. We know we're going to have to be talking to the federal government and the state government about ways that they can assist us. In addition, we have to talk about what is the appropriate model to deliver the kind of health care that we all want to see. Those are the processes we're going through. We put aside in the preliminary budget, as you mentioned, $337 million. We have given whatever resources we need to make sure that everything is stable this year, but we need to talk about what that transformation is. So I don't have for you now, here are the things that are going to get us there, but we're working very quickly to get to that spot. So Dr. Raju has, the past two years, had a keynote address talking about the future of uh, the Public Benefit Corporation and how to actually grow revenue. One of the main pillars of that is to expand Metro Health Plus, uh, their insurance product, where it currently sits at 400,000 enrollees and try to get it up to over a million to hold on to the patient-based population given the competitive environment that we're in uh, in the hospital system and healthcare system in New York City to maintain that revenue and that patient base. It took 25 years to get 400,000 people to sign up for Metro Health Plus, and the goal is over the next five years to get that number up to over a million individuals signed on to that product. I I is that realistic in any way? So we're, look, we're reviewing the projections. We're making sure we're going to come back and we'll tell you what we actually do agree with Dr. Raju participating. He is not wrong to say that one of the ways to deal with this is to expand Metro Plus, to expand his revenue. Yes. It's actually a thoughtful I idea. agree with that. I'm just wondering if it's realistic. Setting the goal, I, I don't have an answer what's realistic. Well, what I do know, we'll, get, we'll come back with what's a realistic goal, but what I do know is we need to change the product and we need to find way, better ways of administering the way health and hospitals. And, and he would be the first to agree is administering Metro Plus. So we do think that we can make changes to make this a much more attractive product and to get many more enrollees into Metro Plus. So I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to, it's a great question. I'll be patient. I'm not, agreeing, I'm not disagreeing with the question, but I think you have to give us a little time to come back and say, here's how we're coming back on Metro Plus. Okay, and my last question until the next round, just quickly, uh, the, the mayor and you, I worked very closely with you, and I want to thank you for your hard work on ending the epidemic and putting new monies in. Uh, at World AIDS Day on December 1st, the mayor announced $23 million in new monies that was going to go in in this fiscal year. Uh, it wasn't put in in the November plan, I don't believe. Uh, and the council put in $6.6 .6 million. Uh, do, we, do we still have the city's commitment on putting in the appropriate share on HASA for All? Yeah, we are, we are totally and completely with you committed to the funding the mayor identified and you identified on World AIDS Day. There is n no backtracking on that. The, we are waiting on, on the DOHMH side. We have told them to proceed. On, and whatever those costs are, we're covering on the HASA for, the HASA for all side, on the expanding HASA. That was always, as, as you well know, a commitment that needed a state participation and a state partnership. And have there been any updated conversations with the state on that? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, we will now hear from Council Member Kalos, I mean, Council Member Gibson, followed by Council Member Kalos, and then we will begin the second round. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. Good afternoon, Dean, to you and your staff. Thank you for being here. Um, so certainly I want to echo the sentiments of many of my colleagues and certainly making sure that we are extremely aggressive um, returning to Albany, right, uh, making sure that we fight against the proposed cuts to Medicaid and CUNY, um, certainly nothing that the city can absorb. Um, we as a council have been making our voices heard and will certainly continue to travel to Albany to make sure um, that before the fiscal year in Albany we really make sure that these cuts do not go through. Um, I certainly want to commend you Thank and your team. 
um, on the civil legal services. Uh, from the Bronx's perspective, we've had um, a reduction in the number of evictions, but not the number of cases going to housing court in the first place. So to me and many of my residents, we're seeing the results and the success of civil legal services. So I continue to encourage uh, us as an administration to invest in that. It's very, very important. Um, I just had a couple of questions relative to public safety, mm. of course. Um, I know that we have received uh, a little over $400 million in asset forfeiture funds, um, some from the District Attorney of Manhattan and uh, federal funds that focused on technology for the NYPD, the tablets, the smartphones, uh, NYCHA security enhancements, the Mayor's Behavioral Task Force on Mental Health. I just wanted to find out, are there any updates? Where are we? Is there remaining money? And are there any loose ends that need to be tied up with this fund? With these funds. Okay, I, I, I will, we should come back to you actually on exactly what has gone out. I mean, you've listed those things okay. and exactly what remains and from where. So I don't want to, okay. I want to make sure I give you the exact numbers. And okay, so. great. And the reason I ask is because since we're starting a new budget cycle, no, certainly we need to know where we need to Absolutely. focus. Um, and I, I talk about the Mayor's Behavioral Task Force because right. about 5,000 officers have now received enhanced training on responding to persons with emotional disturbances. And we're looking at diversion treatment centers. I know we're starting in East Harlem, so I wanted to find out an update on that particular issue. Okay. And the Mayor, we recently made an announcement on Operation Fast Track to expedite gun cases, and I know we're starting with the Brooklyn DA, so I wanted to find out in terms of resources and uh, headcount uh, what we're looking at. Um, I want to so thank you. So we can you. come back to you. Okay, great. Definitely. And I thank you for investing three million in Shot Spotter, mm -hmm. um, going to the Rockaways, Coney Island, expanding in uh, all the boroughs, in particular the Bronx, um, is important for us to make sure that we can really get uh, guns off of our streets and out of the hands of the wrong individuals. Um, I also wanted to obviously put a plug in for the district attorneys. We have two new district attorneys joining us this year, and I know each of their offices has requests on technology and spacing and storage and capacity and resources, and certainly the Bronx DA. Um, I know we're looking long term at changes and conversations around Rikers Island, but for the sake of the existing uh, population, we really want to do a lot and support the Bronx DA in her plan to make sure that she can get the resources needed for uh, targeted services within her office and on Rikers Island itself. Okay, so we have met with both new DAs, mm -hmm. and uh, they, we are having an exchange right now on their requests, and you know, we're happy to keep you in, informed on the okay. discussion. I wanted to ask two more quick questions. With Thrive NYC and the, the focus on mental health, I wanted to delve into the schools. Uh, are we going to have a conversation around increasing guidance counselors in our schools? And then for many of us, we've seen, sadly, an increase in the number of students committing suicide. Uh, suicide prevention, very important. Organizations like the Samaritans and others that do really great work. Are we going to look at opportunities to increase access for suicide prevention counselors as well as guidance counselors in our schools? Yes, I, I knew the answer was yes. I was trying to get Okay, I just need to hear so from we you. We are doing more. We are <clears throat> So we have uh, approved we uh, the preliminary budget includes 100 counselors to assess the needs at schools. <clears throat> so I will come back to <clears throat> Now I'm coughing. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Let me come back to you. Okay, and I, have, I certainly want to continue talking because 100 schools is great. I just want to find out which areas and which school districts Correct. we're focusing on. 
Okay, and then as I close, Madam Chair, I certainly want to echo the sentiments by my colleagues in us focusing on summer youth is important. Last year we got more money from Albany, we put in more money, all year round youth employment program, great investments to make a difference, to save our young people, give them an opportunity. So we will certainly continue to have more conversations around that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member. We will hear from Council Member Kalos and then begin our second round. Thank you to uh, Chair Ferrer's Copeland. Please feel better and thanks for uh, pushing through it. Uh, and uh, thank you to Director Fulahan for being here today. In the preliminary budget economic indicators found reason for concern. Last year and in previous years, <coughs> uh, sorry, last year in response to similar advocacy, uh, you set aside half a billion dollars in capital stabilization reserve, but then essentially rolled it from last year to this year. Why isn't this fund being used throughout the year to prepay debt or for pay-go capital? And given some of the estimates that Mayor Bloomberg had more than $10 billion to draw from during the last economic downturn, is $500, 500 million enough even when you add the billion uh, in uh, reserves and then the pensions? And along those lines in terms of our debt service, which only continues to grow, my annual question remains, can we limit borrowing and prepay now so we can borrow when we need it? So that's the first set of questions. The second one is on the topic of savings, will the mayor support reforms to quality of life violations ECB, which has $1.6 billion in outstanding debt at this point? With regards to $4 billion in potential contract overruns identified in 2014, uh, which have only continued to grow by hundreds of millions, if not a billion by this point. Uh, two years later, do we have an answer? This is our third time talking about it. And uh, along those lines, where is the city on using architectural construction management and engineering in order to limit overruns? Uh, and along those lines, has the city engaged in life cycle accounting to estimate capital costs for the life of these investments? And last but certainly not least, can we save by using city employees instead of outside contractors and reverse the recent trend in growth of provisionals in favor of civil servants? Thank you. Okay. I'll hope, I hopefully have it. Um, on the, uh, the capital stabilization reserve, um, you're right. Congratulations. I mean, it was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a good thing to put forward. It was the right kind of statement to make. The decision we made was that we did not need to draw on it in this past fiscal year, which was a successful fiscal year for us, that we should move it into fiscal year 2017. And once again, um, as it's there for us to protect a very ambitious, which is what you're talking about, a very ambitious capital plan, which has commensurate debt service with it, and it should be there as an added cushion and an added protection. So that's the reason we haven't drawn on it yet. And, and we're just going to keep we're... rolling it year to year. I, I, no, I, I, that's the decision now. I mean, once again, you're asking also, should we be doing other things? That's sort of your more generic question. You gave examples of things the Bloomberg administration did or other ways we could do it, building up that reserve or doing other things. And we should keep having that conversation about what's appropriate. We, we made the decision that it was not necessary to draw down on that fund this year, but rather should be stability for next year where we see risks and uncertainty. So that's the answer to that one. On the ECB fines, I, I actually believe that we are working together actually with the chair as well to come to a conclusion on a package of bills that will allow us to move forward. You've raised this complaint, both of you over uh, now last year and this year, and we should be addressing that. So I think we're actually getting to a, a positive conclusion on that. On cost overruns, this came up earlier in the, in the questions. Um, on, on capital, so there's this balancing act on the cost of projects, the estimates of the projects, and how we can get better estimates, and how we can actually make the projects get done in a faster way. So I've committed, you know, we've had this conversation, we've, and I've committed to other members that we're going to work very hard on this. We need to both make sure that our commitments in capital are getting done, are getting done faster. OMB has made reforms internally. We need to keep doing that. We need to work with the agencies that, that, that does that. We need to find more ways to do pre-scoping and, and use that so that the estimates are more accurate and we can accurately say, okay, here's the cost of a project. 
instead of having, on many of the projects you care about, it come back and back and back. So we understand that and we're working with you on that and we're committed to working with you on that. Uh, life cycle accounting, uh, you know, once again, we had a conversation and we're happy to get your ideas and share ways to improve how we approach public policy decision making. We should be doing and we look forward to working with you on that. Um, on insourcing, it was a two-part question, really. On insourcing, we are, we are moving forward on insourcing. You see it throughout the budgets over the past two years. You'll see it again in this budget. We're insourcing very expensive IT contracts. We're doing more and more in, internally, and, that, and you know, we need to keep doing that. And that is a way to find savings, and we agree with you on that. And the last piece was just provisional. The provisional count actually went up. Uh, we've, Danique Miller and I have had numerous hearings on this, and thank you. Uh, you know, we'll talk to the agency um, on, uh, on what their plans are for moving forward. We believe that uh, I want to come back and give you an actual more detailed answer on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos. We will now hear from Councilmember Rodriguez and then begin the second round. Thank you, Chair. Uh, morning. I, I had a question related to the it, as many parts of the city is going under the rezoning, something that I personally support. I think it's a great thing that the mayor has a vision to deliver, present affordable housing that we need for working class and middle class. Uh, but my question is, how much are we are looking in this budget to invest to a strengthening in areas related to education and infrastructure in those areas that we'll, we will be adding thousands of new members in those communities. So you, you have before you not just the preliminary budget, but you have the SCA, the School Construction Authority, and the Department of Education's modification to the five-year capital plan. In that capital plan, they have expanded the, uh, by 11,800 the number of uh, seats that will be filled. So it brings us to a total of over 44,000 seats. I'm sorry, for the purpose of time. But well, my question is, are so, we targeting so part of that? Because, I'm sorry, are we, do we have a plan to add, not a citywide, how many additional seats no, or the other, no, but in those no. areas that we are going to be working to rezoning, yeah, are we, we adding dollars yes. so that we can expand in education? Yes, so there's two things. Education. In the SCA plan, there are dollars specifically directed towards some of those areas. In addition, we have the billion-dollar fund for neighborhood, for neighborhood development as well. Okay. My second question is, it, how much dollars is the city including in this budget to put in in order to get the affordable housing that we need and the level of preservation that the mayor has established as his goal? So the budget continues the commitment, the capital budget commitment that that we made last year for the capital plan. Do you have the number? For the right, it's seven billion over ten years, and then there's the billion dollars in the in the neighborhood uh, in the neighborhood in neighborhood infrastructure. Right, and then there's another five hundred million for affordable housing infrastructure, and that's different actually than what we're also in the other capital budgets reflecting, such as the SCA budget. Okay, I just hope to see more resources included added to the preservation piece, especially to the educational one, so that we take a proactive approach on those communities that we know that landlords they are targeting, pushing people out. We know that with the tenant protection, the mayor... Tenant protection, today, absolutely. But it's so. all about to see, you know, the real dollars so that all those CBOs and, and the agency in charge really have the resources that they need uh, in order to accomplish his goal. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know Great. we've done a significant amount of, of, uh, of my last legal question, aid services here. My last question is on vision transportation. 
how much, what is the increase that we anticipate we will see to DOT when it comes to continue redesigning danger intersection in our citizens. Vision Zero is a big a goal for this administration. So that's one part of my question. How much money are we adding to DOT? Vision. The second part of this question oh. is, My second, the second part of this question is, Vision Zero Educational Awareness. Award. Sorry, Chairman. I'm waiting for so, so let, let me sure. complete the question. I One apologize. is total increase to DOT. Second, I can now understand it as a partner of this administration that it was the council, the one that had to put $2.5 million for the Educational Awareness Campaign on Vision Zero. You know, up to the last second of the budget, there was nice dollars included, and we had to put a $2.5 million for the educational awareness campaign. This past day, three people there because of hit and run. I, neither this year around, there's not a important amount of dollars included for the educational awareness campaign. Okay, so there is in the preliminary budget, as there has been in every budget of this administration, and actually from the very first preliminary budget, a huge investment in Vision Zero. So it includes, is this the incremental? Yeah, I mean, so in capital, it includes another, another, four, another 15 million this year, another 14 million next year. It includes in operating another 700 million this year, another f over $4 million next year. So, uh, yeah, I apologize. 700,000 and, and over 4 million next year. Um, so we're installing more speed cameras, we're doing more safe, uh, uh, street safety improvements, we're installing new red light cameras, all this part of Vision Zero. So we're making, and, and I'm happy to outline for you all the investments we've been making over these years in Vision Zero. I understand your question about, about the education component of that, and we'll continue to have a conversation about that. That's my message to the I get team. It. I get no, it. you cannot be, because what it looked to me is that determination that the administration took last year it looked at the whole plan to repeat it this year again, which is, you know, this is so important for us that we will put the money. I believe that in order to be effective on Vision Zero and to reduce to zero the number of people being killed by 2024, we need to run the educational campaigns as we did in Vision Zero. And there's a resistance to put these dollars for the educational awareness campaign. There's no money to TV, there's no money to newspaper, unless the $2.5 million was assigned by the council. And I hope that by the end of this year, with the, you know, with the leadership, with the speaker, and the finance chairman, it should not be us, the one that assigned the money, the money for the educational awareness campaign. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member Rodriguez. We will now begin the second round of questions. I want to Focusing on the TransCare bankruptcy, just last week TransCare ceased all emergency service operation in the city as a result of filing for bankruptcy, <coughs> causing the city to lose 27 ambulances that worked within the 911 service. How will the loss of TransCare ambulances affect response times, and what is the city's plan to absorb these ambulance runs into the existing EMS structure? And since the department plans on running the 81 tours of overtime, what is expected, what is the expected impact on EMS's overtime budget? So, so obviously this just happened. We were concerned that it may. We are, I, I don't have an estimate yet at this point. The, goal is not to lose anything in response time and to use whatever overtime is necessary to achieve that. that. That really needs to be the immediate goal. And then we'll obviously have to come back to you and say here's what we think that estimate since we're speaking about something that has just occurred. In addition, we're working with the hospitals to figure out how we actually are going to do this. 
whether it's FDNY or it's additional not-for-profit, it's additional provi other providers who, who, uh, who continue that service. And we're in those conversations right now. But the goal is not to lose any response time and whatever FDNY needs to make up and use overtime now to make sure of that, that's what we're doing. Well, clearly this is a very big concern. Of course. This council has consistently talked about, <coughs> excuse me, about overtime. Um, so anytime that we can plan. Um, and now what happens it, when we have, obviously TransCare goes bankrupt, what is the future plan of what, you know, is this RFP? What is the process by which we get another partner to provide the service? Or do you just leave, envelop it into EMS? <clears throat> so the, the hospital has these contracts. The hospital, well, that's why we're in conversations with the hospital about what's the exact best way to proceed, why we take care of the immediate need. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about K2. Last year, the council passed a set of bills to combat the proliferation of K2 synthetic marijuana, including outlawing its sale and assessing uh, severe p penalties for those who do the preliminary budget. There are new needs associated with the city's enforcement actions, 261,265 for three new positions and equipment at the Department of Consumer Affairs, and 621,000 for a whole new enforcement unit of 12 staff with the Department of Finance. That is almost 900,000 in new needs, which are baseline through the financial plan. There's also a one-time 344,000 addition to the health department's budget for immediate campaign around this issue. Are we still seeing many K2 violations, and can you provide us the metrics by which we're measuring this as a city? I don't have an uh, I don't have a metric to give you at this point. I mean, we'll try to see if we can get you uh, an updated metric since we've just started. Right. I just I guess the question also really is about do we need 15 new permanent positions to address this K2 issue? Um, do we expect this to be an ongoing issue? And if so, then why is the Department of Mental Health's media campaign just a one-off? Right. Yeah, I mean, we do believe that the positions are needed and needed to be baselined. Let me come back to you on why on the, uh, the one-time nature of the media campaign and also actually give you a, a more detailed justification of the positions. I would appreciate that. And while you're answering that question, I'd like for our follow-up to answer um, it. It would seem, or my understanding, and you can um, clarify me, is um, that much of the two K2 enforcement would be done in conjunction with agencies current with the, within agencies' current responsibilities of enforcing tobacco and cigarette tax and licensing laws. Um, how will the enforcement responsibilities of the new staff going to differ from the current tobacco enforcement efforts? Right. I mean, we'll come back. I want to give you an all-encompassing answer to that, so we'll come back to you exactly okay. how they are working together, because okay. I understand your point. So we'll come back to you and say, here's how we're achieving this. Excellent. Um, taxi medallions. In December 2011, the city received state authorization to sell 2,000 additional yellow medallions. However, since then, between November 2013 and March 2014, the city has sold only 400 taxi medallions, generating $360 million. Again, in the proposed fiscal 2017 budget, $107 million anticipated from the sale of tax medallions in fiscal 2017 was pushed into fiscal 2018 and thereby further delaying the city's plan to sell those medallions, but without adjusting the valuation of the anticipated revenue. When does the administration realistically expect to sell the remaining medallions, and what effect will the delays have on the anticipated revenue of the sale? So this is an industry that obviously has gone through 
rapid changes, and there was enough uncertainty in the industry not to say these sales will not happen, but to say let's put these sales off to a more appropriate time when the marketplace stabilizes and the financing stabilizes. And that's actually what, what is happening now. In addition, there are regulatory changes occurring in the industry. Um, as we speak, I believe you had a hearing on this very recently, maybe even last week on these issues. Um, and we need those to, to actually follow through so we can set the appropriate, the appropriate prices and go back into the marketplace. I, I, for our, in terms of our revenue estimates, we're always very cautious. We never assume the peaks that had been reached in the sales of only two years ago. So we always had revenue, very revenue, uh, very revenue cautious projections, which are reflected in those numbers. So I'm not sure we have to change those numbers. The question is, over the next months, we will get a better sense of what is happening in the industry and when it's the appropriate time. But it clearly, in our view, was not appropriate to authorize a sale for fiscal year 2017. It just is concerning for us when we keep seeing the sales being pushed out into the out years. I understood. And at what point do we just reassess and, and have a, a real conversation of what, what it means? Um, of the medallions that have been sold, what was the average price to the city, um, that the city received for each medallion? And do you anticipate the remaining medallions would yield similar results when sold? Someone come and so, help Dean. So, yes, somebody should help me. <laughs> I, I know that the average price we assume was well below the, uh, the high sale point in the last year. What was it? Right, they were selling for over a million dollars, and we were assuming a range of between 550 and 850. Those estimates are based on that range. I'm sorry. What was you said? A million dollars. A million at the at, at the at the height. The uh, the licenses were going for over a million dollars. Right, but this wasn't last year. No. Oh, right. So the last year there wasn't. Was what I'm asking. We didn't no. sell last year. There was, there was no medallion sale. Right. There was no medallion sale. And the year before that. That was these. We're trying to assess so what's the difference in the medallion sales and what has happened. Right, this was in 14. These, okay. these, peak, these peak estimates were, these peak actual sales of 800, of 900 to 1.1 million were in, were in 14. We're in 14, okay. Thank you very much. Um, I have two additional questions and then we will start with the second round. I wanted to ask, I know that we talked about uh, CIP, the Finance Division and Council Member Rosenthal uh, made mention to this. The finance uh, division has been asking since last year to have a meeting. Um, there was a very quick conversation that was pulled together three days ago. Um, obviously that's not satisfying. We want to get a commitment that we can have a real conversation to talk about the health insurance. Um, it, um, uh, CIP. Of course. You said, of course, last year. I, I can't believe I didn't follow through. I can't I'll believe it sure, either. I saw. So I'll make sure we do. Excellent. So before the executive, because I'm going to ask. Fine. Absolutely. Okay. Very good. Um, and then I wanted to talk about uh, SIRS. When were member organizations notified that the city would no longer remit contributions directly to the SIRS on their behalf? And while you're getting that, this is a significant administrative burden on organizations and SIRS. Is the, city's, is the city concerned that cash flow issues will prevent organizations okay. from submitting so, payment on time? So we, we will work with the organizations. We notified them in February. This was out of a problem that occurred where um, some of the agencies had not been w misunderstood what their contributions had been and there were mistakes and then they had to go back and, and we had to renegotiate the payments. So this is an attempt to work with them, but we will continue. It's not to put an extra burden on them. So we, we have told and we're going to sit down with them to make sure that this works for them and it's the right way to proceed. So it is in our understanding that the city has delayed payment on the current fiscal year's payment and the principal amount from the last fiscal year um, 
Why are providers being held liable for the city's past obligations? It's part, it's, once again, it's part of the problem that occurred in the last year when we discovered that through an audit process that the payments had not been made by some providers, it was some of the institutions were doing fine, some were not. And then we had to assess them a burden going back many years. And we wanted to make sure that was avoided. So we have not made the January payment, but we are sitting down with them and the intent is to work very quickly through this process to, to make sure that we develop whatever that procedure is a process that does not put a long-term burden on them. So do you have an internal goal or timeline set? As quickly as possible. I mean, we're, I believe we're having meetings this week. Okay. So we'll follow up and hopefully this will be resolved before our executive. Oh, um, definitely. Thank you. And I have, I'm done with my second round questions. We will hear from Majority Leader Van Bramer, followed by Council Member Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Williams. Again, reminder, this is a three-minute clock for second round. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Madam Chair, and I just want to uh, follow up as uh, uh, the Chair and I tag team on SIRS and make sure that uh, uh, neither the institutions nor uh, the workers, right, right, as this administration, all of us are focused right. on um, uh, making sure that uh, folks can continue to live in dignity. Um, uh, after all, this is the retirement yes. system, and there are DC 37 members right. and so many others um, who, who rightfully have planned for these uh, benefits, and, and as, as I mentioned earlier, the cultural institutions that are affected um, uh, haven't seen a measurable increase in operating um, at the same time that this uh, potential liability is, is um, uh, directed uh, to them. Yeah, we'll work this out with them. So uh, I appreciate that, that commitment to, uh, uh, to work it out and make sure that they are uh, essentially uh, held harmless uh, through, uh, uh, as you put it, some uh, miscommunication or uh, um, uh, misunderstanding, uh, perhaps. Uh, and then I just wanted to raise uh, cultural capital. Obviously, there was a very significant investment um, uh, last year in cultural capital, and, and that is a terrific uh, result of all of us working together, uh, a very worthwhile investment. Um, but we also want to make sure that uh, the cultural funding moves through the process uh, as quickly as possible so projects can get completed. And uh, uh, the Department of Design and Construction and the Design, Design for Excellence program, um, uh, in some uh, cases, has um, resulted in uh, uh, estimates estimates that are causing the culturals uh, to sort of go back uh, and seek additional funding, which, which can delay, uh, obviously, uh, the, the project actually getting completed. Are you aware of, of this issue percolating amongst some of the uh, uh, culturals and the Design for Excellence program? If so, uh, how do we address it? Uh, so we are aware of the program. Um, we are aware of the problem. The problem has been raised now several times by several of your colleagues. Um, I've also raised it, actually. So th this is part of a broad capital problem that we are attempting to address. We have made significant improvements. The overall numbers and the commitment numbers are going up. It's not enough. We need ways to both address the cost overrun issue, the original design not meeting what the actual final construction is going to be, which causes its own problems, as well as the delays. So we are actively working on that. We look forward to working with you on this. We're meeting on this constantly. So this is going to require really coordination among many agencies uh, to make sure that we can make this a more expedited process. We have the exact same goal. The administration has the exact same goal. We put a capital project budget together to make sure those projects get completed and get completed so we can see that completion. So we agree with this. I uh, appreciate that and, and appreciate the ongoing collaboration uh, and communication. Thank you very much. Thank you, Majority Leader. Council Member Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Williams, followed by Council Member Kalos. We've been joined by Council Member Miller. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Director Fulihan, I was just curious about. Um, oversight on the DOE budgets, if we could start there on the DOE contracts. You, you remember in 2015, the DOE had almost signed off on a $1.1 billion contract. And I'm 
you know, which was eventually much in the way that you just described how you're trying to hone in on doing a better job at contracting with uh, more specificity and scope. Um, I'm wondering what work you guys have done in increasing oversight on the DOE contracts and if you feel satisfied um, about the new PEP um, transparency work that, uh, that the finance, the CFO at DOE thinks will uh, satisfy um, better procurement, more financially secure right. and responsible procurement. Yes. I mean, the last piece, I think, is yes, it's another step in the process. Uh, and it's one that needs, uh, it, one that constantly needs review. And we do believe that we can continue to improve on that process. So uh, we're open to continuing that conversation to take your ideas. We have a conversation about that that last contract, and uh, I think the, a good result occurred with that. Um, and we'll continue to work with DOE on a really a, a, a constant basis to improve that process. Do you, has something changed in your oversight since um, that occurred? Um, yeah, I know, but we'll be more aggressive. We, we are certainly being more aggressive in our interactions on these contract reviews. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed anything in your? Uh, I would say that I b hope the process has improved. So, okay. I, I, and I know you will tell me if you think it's not. Improved. No, I'm just wondering if in your oversight you've caught any contracts that you've sent them back to redo or think harder on. I mean, I see stuff coming up at the PEP that I think is suspect, but I'm wondering what you guys are doing with it. So I'd, I'd have to go back and review certainly nothing of the magnitude of the contract you were talking about before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, also, so I said I would come back about the procurement innovation project. Yes. Do you want to mention about that? Sure. So, I mean, we, we have talked about this before. We think this is a, this is a, an important part. Um, I want to make So as you know, MOX is in the process of an RFP on this. It has about $25 million commitment. Uh, there's a piece in expense and a piece in capital. Um, the goal is to have and then implement technology to automate the entire procurement life cycle. It's an attempt to look at all of our, how we do procurement. So I, I, it's, it's very in line with the kind of things you and I have spoken about before. Mm -hmm. Do you think I could, could you just send this, uh, the finance committee, the information about how much is in capital, how much sure. is in expense, and what you, let's see, what years you plan to spend Sure, it. and we'll give you a timeline. I think a that timeline, would be helpful, so. and what role the technology <laughs> development committee had. Certainly. Or com, uh, corporation right. had in uh, coming up with the new plan. Um, and just very quickly, can I ask um, whether or not you plan on renewing the contract with the Technology Development Corporation? So I, I'll have to get back to you. Honestly, I didn't know even when it was up. So I'll find. Let me come back. Do you do you think they provide a valuable service? I. I think they provide a valuable service, but you're asking me a question I wasn't prepared for, so let me come okay. back to you. I didn't even realize the contract was up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. We'll have Council Member Williams followed by Council Member Caleb followed by Council Member Levin. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Fulahan. I know that um, there was a, a letter. Here I am. I'm sorry. Uh, I okay. apologize. I was sorry. It's a lot going on. I know there's a letter sent out recently asking uh, agencies uh, to uh, see if they can find efficiencies, uh, which I have no problem with. It was, it was similar to the letter that some of us sent out asking uh, for the same. It seemed to 
different reception when it came from you. Um, but I think the, the, the main purpose was just to try to plan uh, this exercise so we don't have to wait until uh, we hit the bad times, which may come. Um, I'd like to know, I'm going to say all my questions right now. One, I'd just like to know if, if anyone responded um, and, and when they have a, a time to respond. Also, um, I'm concerned about the 421A program um, being expired. Um, if we haven't planned for the most immediate of the governor's problems, I'm sure we haven't yet planned for 421A. Um, my hope is that uh, we do uh, plan for that. I don't know if that's in the back of your mind um, anywhere. And I do think it's very dangerous uh, to uh, wait for the governor to respond without planning. So my hope is that you do have a plan. Maybe you haven't shared with us. I don't know if the efficiencies are part of it. Um, but I do know, I think it will be on the responsibility of, of your side uh, should this occur and no plan uh, has occurred um, not on our side. And lastly, um, last year I know the priority of the council uh, for additional officers, I believe we asked uh, 4,000, we were given 1,300. And so in that vein, my hope is that um, as it seems that a lot of council members are believing youth jobs are priority, uh, usually in negotiations you go down, you guys went up. Uh, so I think we're hopefully in the progressive city that we're in, that the youth jobs will have the same fervor and priority as uh, the officers, and we could at least get the minimum that we're asking for since you were in the habit of going up. You did describe this as a, a different scenario, so maybe instead of going up, we can just get the minimum uh, that we requested when it came to these jobs. Um, so on the savings, I did issue a letter yesterday. I, I don't know if I have a response since I've been here with you. I will assume that we don't have responses yet. We constantly ask the agencies for savings for efficiencies. We are in the executive budget process as we're talking about the preliminary budget. We did do uh, 1.1 billion of savings in the preliminary budget. We did 1.4 billion of savings last year. This year we're going to do savings in the executive budget. You know, we're work, working with, we'll work with you, with your staff to make sure that uh, any ideas we can, uh, we can provide to the agencies, but all of this has to happen. In a, in a timely manner so that it's ready for the executive budget. That's really the time frame that we're working on. On, on the 421A program, I know that, uh, that we have said that, you know, the affordable housing program is going forward, that this would be, uh, that this would make it more difficult, but we would keep moving forward. I would also mention to you, though, that the state budget, several of your colleagues mentioned it, there are other actions in the state budget that would affect the affordable housing plan that would affect HDC, uh, PACB review. So there are other hurdles that have been put into place that also affect it that are timely right now to talk about. Uh, on state actions, I, I want to be clear. We are not standing still and not concerned about state actions. What we're, what, the, the action that I'm that not suggesting the action that we're taking and, and that many of your colleagues are joining, we would like you to join, is to make sure those, none of those cuts occur. And, and that's the important thing to do right now in Albany. And, and once again, they're in the process right now. The legislature responds just as you do. They've gone through their, uh, their hearings. Uh, they've completed their hearings. They're in the one, uh, one house budget process and then they go to conference committee. It's gonna happen over the next few weeks and that's where all of our effort should be. Uh, and I hear you on youth employment. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're here. I hope you share uh, in the, in the uh, important and some of us prior to, prior to prioritization. Um, and I understand what you're saying to do with the state. I, I'm hope, I hope to join. Uh, in addition to that, I do think it's still responsible uh, when you're budgeting uh, to take everything that's into account of what may happen. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. We'll hear from Council Member Kalos, followed by Council Member K uh, Levin, followed by Council Member Johnson. Thank you again to uh, our chair and the committee. Uh, the city charter treats the preliminary mayor's management report as a budget document that actually comes out with the uh, preliminary budget. Each, each agency is to provide performance goals with corresponding expenditures. This is not the case. Will OMB support the Mayor's Office of Operations and agencies in fulfilling their charter mandate to connect performance with expenditures? As a person who ran companies, it was always good to know where our dollars are going to support what services. Uh, 
Another key item is uh, Real Deal predicts about 2,000 plus units on the Upper East Side, but School Construction Authority isn't planning on building any seats. Uh, and in fact, I think we're only building 1,000 or so seats in all of the CEC2. Uh, what is the city doing in terms of investing in building seats, especially as we are rezoning and upzoning and uh, increasing density throughout the city and having what density was there actually built. Uh, additionally, the law department's judgment and claims budget increases from 695 million in fiscal year 2016 to 855 million in fiscal year 2020, while average for the last five years is 636 million a year. Given the significant investment in the law department's defense of the city, why are judgment and claims continue to grow by 15%? Shouldn't they continue along the average and uh, this one it should be familiar. In fiscal year 2001, going into the Bloomberg administration, we had $3.8 billion in debt service. As of this fiscal year, we're looking at $6.8 billion in debt service. And by fiscal year 2020, we're looking at $8.3 billion in debt service. We have a constitutional debt limit of $84.8 billion. But the mayor and you are planning on borrowing $84.6 billion by 2020 as we approach the end of his term limit. That's a per capita debt of $10,000 per New Yorker and leaves less than $200 million for the next mayor. What will the next administration do when this mayor has borrowed all the money that there is to borrow? So let's stuff? go through the list on the uh, management report. Um, good idea. We're working with uh, operations to effectuate that. All right, so we will come back to you, but uh, it is something we'd like to do. Thank you. I look forward to a charter compliant MMR. Um, on DOE. So we, to we are prioritizing. Uh, we are prioritizing up zoning districts. I would. I look. I've said it several times. I'll say it again. I mean, you have before you a process that's going on with the SCA and DOE, uh, where you're reviewing the capital plan that they submitted with the preliminary budget. That capital plan now has additional additional seats, does not cover the whole need. They have additional seats of 44,000 that's in. It's up from the last year capital plan that SCA submitted to you uh, by 11,800 seats. They are prioritizing the upzoning districts. They are, there are two factors that need to be incorporated into that and, and that you know, and one is the, the ability to find space. And that really is the major constraint. The goal is to fill all those seats, either in this year's, in this capital plan, and the mayor said this, or in the next five-year capital plan. We're three years into this current capital plan, but that's the process that you're going through right now with the SCA. Uh, on judgment and claims, uh, judgment and claims had a significant backlog. The law department has been addressing that backlog. That was part of the reason that judgment and claims have gone up. We talked to them about major, major settlements and that had a dramatic effect. Nevertheless, uh, they are instituting reforms and in how they treat tort cases and how they look at them and we are hopeful that those will eventually start to reduce the growth that we're seeing in judgment and claims. Um, on the capital budget and on debt service, yes, uh, it, there's no question. We have a significant, uh, a significant 10-year capital plan. Um, I would argue with you, I did last year, I made the argument that this was a more honest presentation of a 10-year capital plan and that the prior 10-year capital plan that had been released was not an honest reflection, that in the, in the later five years, that there was not, there were years where they were assuming almost nothing in school construction. It's not a realistic plan. So we have put forward a 10-year plan. If, if the economy and revenues don't, don't grow and we need to make adjustments, then we're all gonna have to get back in a room and make those adjustments. In the meantime, there are significant needs that you have identified, that your colleagues have identified that we need to do, whether it's education, whether it's roads, whether it's Rikers Island, whether whatever those needs are, 
we need to fulfill those and we're trying to do it with a responsible capital plan and enough debt service to cover that we recognize that's one of the reasons we need to build reserves that's one of the that is the reason for the capital stabilization reserve and it's something that we have to constantly and constantly monitor every year we should have this conversation and conclude whether we're okay for this coming year or do we need to make dramatic changes I think as long as the executive reflects more than 200 million in breathing room uh, I will continue to have this conversation with you each and every hearing each and every year thank you okay. thank it's you a, it's a billion dollars room in 17 and it will, does change as we go in as you know every year it's going to change we will now hear from Councilmember Levin, followed by Councilmember Johnson, followed by Councilmember Cumber. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Director. Uh, so I have two questions, two very different topics. The first question, um, the mayor in his state of the city laid out a vision for uh, this new streetcar proposal. Yes. It's going to go from Astoria down to Sunset Park. Yes. About 60% of that or so actually runs right through my district. And um, the funding mechanism for this proposal is, is it a, a TIF? Is it a pilot? What, what exactly is, I mean, they, 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 I haven't seen the details and I know right. that the, the boosters of the project are saying it's going to pay for itself. How does it pay for itself? So there's significant work that still needs to be done on this, as you know. Um, the plan, the intent, is that there would be enough revenue growth from from the actual, from the, uh, from the BQX. There would be enough additional growth that would allow for the infrastructure needed to be completely paid for. Because um, I know that, in the- That is the goal. In the past, so that's something like a, would it be a, a dedicated TIF or something where it's a right, tax exact I want to be careful because we're having conversations now. What is that exact mechanism and how do we do it? The city has done this before. It won't be the first time. Number seven line was done this way. Doesn't mean it's going to be exactly that way, but we will come back to you and say, but we're in that process. We will come back and say that this is exactly how we're going to do it. But the intention that the mayor announced right, the plan is that it would be paid for by the incremental increase that is attributed to the BQR. Okay, because the reason I ask is that, as you know, I have um, this big uh, section part of my district uh, that's supposed to be the Bushwick Inlet Park. Uh, actually, the, 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 the wow. route for the <laughs> BQX is going to go right past the Bushwick Inlet Park. Unfortunately, there's a big portion of it that hasn't been acquired yet. And uh, what we hear is that the city doesn't have the money to pay for it. Um, a regional park of that size, a 27-acre park, would obviously increase the value of the, uh, the property around it. Are, is OMB willing to look at using whatever you're going to do at BQX, and what, I, if you're not really ready to say what it is now, whatever you're willing to do with that, are you willing to also do that with Bushwick Inlet Park? That, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a question that needs a long-term answer and needs me to step back and say, okay, let's look at this. We have had the conversation in terms of park capital of what we can do and what had been committed, which we didn't certainly make that commitment, what prior commitments had been made. Um, so I'm happy to have a conversation in a broader context, I'm, okay. I, but I can't at this point say that that's going to lead to the exact same result. Okay. Something to look at. And then just lastly, uh, jumping back to a daycare issue, the CIRS, I know that uh, Councilmember Van Bramer and, uh, and Chair Ferris Copeland mentioned this. Um, right now, uh, my understanding is that the city has stopped doing the remittance for the CRS, CIRS to, or, uh, for, for the daycare programs and the cultural institutions to CIRS. They used to do that. The city would do the remittance itself and now have moved and we would that. Be, and the city would be paid for. The Sorry? City, the city would get, would be, the city would be paid. The city, city is always right, paid for Right, the city it. was paid. The question is how it directly gets paid and the problem. Something has occurred. changed in recent years. Yes, right. the, well, what changed was last year there were liabilities that had accrued that caused some serious problems for the cultural institutions. So the question is, is it better if they pay directly? It does that does that make sure the accounting, however, what I have said and promised and committed here is we're meeting with them this week, we're going to work with them, we'll come up I'm, with the right solution. I'm not quite as concerned about the cultural institutions as the small daycare programs okay. that don't have the, uh, 
uh, you know, the ability to do so, all of this paperwork, so the and they might I fall made, behind. The commitment I made on, on is for everyone. We will make sure that okay. we do not put anybody at an undue burden here, and we will come up working with them with the right The small daycare program doesn't have a COO I, I get, or you know, I get. To, a Thank you, Council not, Member. We we'll have every, you know, that's, others that's in the commitment. queue. Thank you. Um, we will hear from Council Member Johnson, followed by Council Member Cumbo, um, and then fin our final questions from Council Member Menchaca. Uh, thanks, thanks, Dean. I wanted to follow up on uh, the Chair's questions on uh, taxi medallions. Yes. So, uh, as was said in the previous question, it was valued last time at a million dollars when it was sold, just over a million. The current estimate was somewhere around $470,000, something like that. How is that number being arrived at? No, the, the number was a historical number. It was never, we never assumed. I'm talking about the 470. Yes, that, that's just an historical number. Based but that on doesn't incorporate things. market forces like Uber With, and Lyft. Uh, correct. So and it's probably not a, no, an accurate number. No, it's, it's, it's unclear exactly what the reason this has been put off. Right. The reason it's been put off is because there are clearly uncertainties in the market. It doesn't mean that there isn't a market. It certainly means that the million one, the things we're going for is only back in 2014 are not attainable. So this was a very low number and an estimate. And what we're saying is that we are in the process of assessing when we should go back to the market. But we did say in no way can we anticipate in 2016, fiscal year 2016 or fiscal year 2017, that we will need to, that we should put any valuation on medallions. But it means not. that that $730 million estimate of potential 1,600 medallions that are authorized by the state for sale is probably not an accurate number, no, $730 no, what million. It, what it is, is, is there's a risk, and that's what the monitors have uh, identified. So what, what they said was this is a risk. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It doesn't mean that we won't go back into the market. It means it's a risk. Okay. Uh, the administration uh, made a commitment uh, last year to um, actually fund animal shelters so that we have animal shelters in all five boroughs. Uh, New York City should become a no-kill city, uh, and I want to understand where we are every time I ask the Department of Health, oh, we're planning, we're planning, we're planning, we're planning, we're pl I mean, we need so, to build these shelters, and what's the plan? Is there, is there money in the preliminary budget in the capital plan for that? So there is not money in the preliminary Why budget. Why not? You know, no, in fairness, <laughs> there has been significant investment by this administration. You know that. We've done improvements on the three existing. That was shelters. money moved around. That was not new money. And, and we have put money in with a commitment by the mayor that we will do the two additional shelters. When? And right now we're in the planning process. They are to come back to us, DOH. They are to come back to us and say, here's the plan, here's the But amount, they're not doing it. And we will commit to it. So I will leave here and have a conversation with the commissioner. But you and I have been going back and forth for months of me asking you questions on this. And, months and, and months. And the commitment remains. So okay. you're asking for a specific timeline. Let me come back and give you that exact timeline. Well, like the chair had said a, a few moments ago, last year you made a commitment on an issue. I, I, I've been asking the, you about one, an issue in my one, district for a the while. One, the one I actually want chair, to get real answers. The one that the chair asked me about, I believe I apologized. I do believe that uh, when I give you assurances like that, I've actually fulfilled them. <laughs> but there, there, there are questions that... I, you're asking, I'm happy to go back to the commissioner. You're going to have to When can we get answers? I will talk to the commissioner. Not just on animal shelters, the other things in my district as well that I've been asking you about. So let me come back to you on that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Johnson. We will hear from Council Member Cumbo, followed by Menchaca, followed by Miller. Thank you. I have three questions, so I'll fire them away first. Yes. And if you could just make a note so that you can answer them afterwards, because I know I have three minutes. So I wanted to start off first with the administration is moving forward with sev several RFPs in DOHMH for initiatives that the council had formally funded in the past. Particularly of interest to me are HIV AIDS uh, funded related programs and my concern is what happened with, for example, the early learn contracts is that when it's then turned over to the RFP process, the council then uh, loses the opportunity to have 
culturally based sensitive organizations provide that level of support and then the council winds up having to uh, make good on those organizations that lost out on the RFP process. Has there been something done to ensure that community based smaller organizations are going to fare well in this RFP process with DOHMH um, such as Watchful Eye. The other question that I have is, um, as we continue the intense conversations with MIH, ZQA, um, have we discussed or focused on the implications in the budget um, if the 421A um, issues are not rectified and we don't have a clear understanding of that? What impact will that have on the budget? And with the creation of the 31,000 new jobs, particularly in the borough of Brooklyn, what sectors have you found are driving that job growth creation? That's it. <laughs> um, on the HIV AIDS, we believe, and if this is not accurate, you should let me know that DOHMH has been working with the council to make sure that uh, that those concerns you have uh, over the past uh, over the past year are actually addressed. So if, if for any reason you believe that hasn't happened, I'm happy to participate in that with the commissioner as well, but we thought that they were actually addressing your concerns. Okay, I appreciate that, right. but I just want to add to that. I'm going to have deep concerns and serious issues with culturally based smaller institutions continuing to lose out in the RFP process so, under this administration. So we should have that conversation because we are understanding. You're going to have to have a lot of conversations. It's okay. I don't, mind having, I don't mind having a lot of conversations. I expect it in the budget process, okay. and it's fine. And if, if we, it, our understanding is that we're working with you, and it turns out you're, you're concerned that that hasn't happened, mm -hmm. then we should do that. So that's not a conversation I in any way uh, don't want to have. Fair enough. Um, on 421A, you, you know, once again, there is a – Projects are going forward. Projects that were in the pipeline or have, were approved are actually going forward. Um, that's, uh, excuse me. So obviously um, what happens in the next step on 421A, uh, once again, uh, the Deputy Mayor has said that the affordable housing plan is moving forward. It will continue to move forward. Um, you know, it's one of the Albany agenda items. I'm going to say it again. There are much more dramatic actions happening right now that would affect the affordable housing plan in, in Albany, and those are the things that we should be focusing on immediately that, that are contained in the budget. Um, on your... Right, and I just want to make sure I got your third question. The job sectors in Brooklyn, the 31,000 oh. new jobs that were created. Okay, so we will get you that breakdown and come back. With you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cumbo, Councilmember Menchaca, followed by Councilmember Miller. Oh, nice. Thank you again. Uh, schools building schools. School Construction Authority in their uh, submission is asking for $1.4 billion. Uh, it was omitted in, in, your, in your kind of preliminary budget, I believe, and, or if not, correct me if I'm wrong. Like but I guess what I'm trying to do in this question is figure out a couple things that we've been talking about in this hearing and okay. in the middle of MIH and ZQA. We're putting a lot of investment in building housing, and unless every unit we build is for seniors, we're going to need some schools to build. In a district like mine, and I'm not alone in this feeling, we have overcrowded schools. We need to build new schools. The sites that we have are not our sites, it's city owned, and we are engaging in purchasing with the mayor and our collective want for more housing. Prices are going up. We're going to have to pay more per square foot. Are we, are we looking at all of that collectively, and can you really kind of give us a sense that we're doing that in the yes. right kind of way and reconciling all the development that put, we're pushing down to New Yorkers today? Yes. So the answer right. to the school construction piece is we did not, we did not, not include it in the preliminary budget. It so was, that's a double negative. So you what, did exactly. So we, so what, it, how did it accompanied that? the preliminary budget because you have a separate process on the school construction piece. 
So you go through your own review and, and that conclusion will be incorporated into the executive budget. All right, so, so there was a proposal that right. was put forward that had, an that had additional funds of, of well over 800 million, correct? Correct, it was, it was over $800 million and it included additional seats, the 11,800 seats that I referred to. So that is before you going through its own process and its own review and then it will be incorporated in the executive budget. Got it, so that's, that's for our current overcrowded number. Correct, and there are seats in there for the upzoning districts. For, okay, so that, that's so you have we have we're addressing the overcrowded. There's some up up zoning Correct. dollars. Can you tell us? Give us a whole picture because we're not going to have too much time. Give us a whole picture about how you're thinking about this. What what frame are you using to think about school construction? And are you and how are you incorporating things like we're moving into eminent domain for some of these pieces because we just don't have property? Are we willing to pay those dollars for the economics that we're experiencing today in our communities and our because what I don't want to do is not have enough money in the budget to be able to make those hard decisions where we need a school and we need to pay for it and we're not going to be able to do that citywide. So, so can you give us a, the frame I mean, for that? We have a significant five-year capital plan for the school construction authority. The five-year. Right, 14.9 billion. Right. It's an historic high. Uh, it's an amazing commitment. It is a commitment that when they came back and said that we have additional needs, and by the way, that was the first time a serious analysis had been done over the past year to actually find out what was the needs. It had not been accurately projected before, so we did an accurate projection, and that projection resulted, I want to do the right number, in, 82, in, in a need of 82,000 seats. This plan provides for 44,000, and the mayor committed, we're in the third year of the plan, the mayor committed that the next five-year plan would address that complete need, but we do have to be realistic. It's about space. It was not about the dollars. It was about whether we can find, and we're happy to work with you and, and with SCA. If there's any needs out there that we can address quickly, fine. We're happy to work that, and they're happy to work with that process. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. And as a follow-up, um, Councilmember Menchaca's district and my district and Councilmember Drum's district, who are the epicenter of the overcrowding, the challenge that we face is in actually finding locations. So while we made the call to get additional funding, we also recognize that we have to think of innovative ways to identify locations for schools. Um, because we're, we're landlocked in many of cases and our property values are through the roof, um, especially for the commercial spaces that would traditionally be converted potentially um, in, or factory space that would be com, um, converted into schools. So what we would like to see more engagement between OMB and SCA is innovative ways, how is it being done in the rest of the country, um, and, and just thinking creatively on how we can respond to these school needs. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we will hear from Council Member Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Director, for you and your team being here. And I'm going to kind of get my three out of the way, and then you can follow up and answer as well. Um, the first of the 13.2 um, the, uh, uh, billion dollars in, in city contracts, what is the amount going to the MWBEs? Um, yeah. Secondly, uh, the workforce, could you give us a, a kind of a synopsis on on uh, where we are with the city's workforce in terms of pension, health care, active and retirees, as well as the uh, revenue expected to generate from the uh, commitment for the new traffic enforcement agents. And finally, um, on the aggregate preliminary capital plan, uh, and it's... Uh, as it pertains to DEP, which has had the largest increase 
and I'm glad to say that we we are expecting well we've begun the 103 million dollars in sewer build out in Southeast Queens as well as 183 million dollars across the rest of the city that there is a un, uh, unfunded portion and uh, how do we address that that guarantees that over the next four years we will see the projects that we have been waiting so long to have come to fruition. Mm -hmm. On the last question, I just want to make sure I have it right. What, I, I understand Southeast Queens. Are you specifically talking about that? I apologize. Uh, well, I'm just talking about the uncommitted <coughs> dollars, uh, considering the, the, the amount um, that has already been funded and the amount of the increase and, and <coughs> um, what has been committed and what would, it would roll over a deficit to 217. How do we address that? Okay, so on... Considering that you have an average of, uh, of uh, commitment of about $8 billion and it's somewhere in the area of 12. So that leaves us a little short. Whatever the numbers are, how do, we, how do we address that deficit that we roll over to ensure that those projects in the plan get done? <coughs> ah, it, so... Uh, Let's start there. So again, uh, this is in terms of how quickly and the capital commitments we're making, or shortfall in capital commitment. It is. It's. It's. What is the impact on the shortfall in terms of them actually getting the jobs actually getting done? Okay. So once again, we put a tremendous amount of effort. We are working across agencies uh, to and and we're working with our procurement process. We're working uh, to speed up the OMB process to make sure capital projects are moving through the system, that the cost overruns, several of your colleagues talked about, are addressed and that we can help move projects that we have better understanding up front of what the costs are, more accurate understanding, and we move through that process. So we'll just, we'll keep doing that. In terms of if there's something particular at uh, DEP, I'm happy to have that conversation and talk about that and how we're planning that. It is a huge part of our capital of our capital plan, of course, and I'm, I'm happy to have any conversations there that you may particularly need to have. Um, on the uh, TEA revenue, uh, I think I'll have to get back to you on exactly what uh, the revenue on the uh, on exactly what the revenue is uh, there. I don't have a quick number on the traffic enforcement. Yeah, we'll get you the exact number that's coming. You know, it's, it, it's coming from construction. We'll get you, which we'll gets you the exact number of the revenue. From, well, that, that, well, is that that's on the, the traffic enforcement. Yes. yes. Well, you, you asked for the specific revenue yeah. that's pr reflected in the expansion in the preliminary budget. Okay. And right, and we will get you a revenue figure on that. Uh, on the MWBE piece, I apologize. We'll have to get you the existing, the, uh, existing contracts. This, we, we know in, in 15 it was 1.6 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it was 1.6, but I, we will try to get you a more up-to-date uh, number. Okay. And, and we know that uh, in one NYC there was a goal of 16 billion over 10 years. Okay. And um, the workforce? The pension, the, the, the state of the pension, retiree, and the health so, benefits, so, retiree and active? So I will have to get you the differentiation on the, uh, you're asking numbers of retirees and numbers? No, no, uh, um, we're talking about uh, the condition so, of the, look, pension. the pension, where are we pension with the pension? So the pension uh, system um, is currently 71%. Uh, fully funded. We are on a plan by 2032 to fully fund at 100 percent the, the five pension systems. Uh, the mayor was very pointed about his commitment to achieving that. It is a goal we will and none of us will shy away from. Uh, that means $9.5 billion in fiscal year 2017 has to be funded. And part of that was the, the change that we did not anticipate, but the change 
that the, uh, the actuary made in the mortality tables, uh, which were part of an audit that occurred over the summer that we needed to update the mortality tables. And that resulted in 600 million a year beginning in this current year. So that we're also incorporating into the budget. Okay. Then I'm sorry, the health care, active and retired. Council Member Miller. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you very much to all my colleagues um, who were part of this first part of our hearings. We will hear in 15 minutes. We're going to take a 15-minute break. In 15 minutes, we will hear from the Department of Finance. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Fulahan, we're going to have additional questions. We'd like to get them to you. If you can get back to us expeditiously, I'd greatly appreciate it. Be delighted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good job.
was it was a cautionary measure that came with the office to see what the final intention is. Yeah. 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 Good afternoon and welcome to the first day of the Council's preliminary budget hearings. My name is Julissa Ferreras Copeland and I am the chair of the Finance Committee. We just heard from the OMB, from OMB Director Dean Foulihan. We will now hear testimony from Commissioner Jacques Gia from the Department of Finance. DOF's fiscal 2016 preliminary budget includes $4 million in fiscal 2017. For fiscal 2017, 88% of the funding is provided for the Office of the Tax Audit and Enforcement and the Office of the Sheriff. Funding for additional tax auditors <coughs> and auditor administrative support staff comprise $2.1 million or 53.2% of the new needs. Funding to the Office of the Sheriff to serve civil orders of protection, conduct investigations of alleged deed fraud, and to combat the sale of illegal or untaxed tobacco products and the sale of synthetic cannabinoids uh, com comprise of $1.4 million or 35% of the new needs. We will hear from DOF momentarily, but I want to note that the investment in sheriffs is tremendous and marks a radical shift from recent history. Since the commissioner joined DOF in 2014, he has increased use of the sheriffs in many areas, including those stated above, and increased their use in enforcing ECB debt and tobacco compliance operations. I look forward to hearing from the commissioner today about the agency's new needs. We will now begin this portion of the hearing with testimony from Commissioner Jacques Gia once he is sworn in by my counsel. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. You. you may begin. Well, good afternoon, Chairwoman Freelas Copeland and members of uh, the City Council Committee on Finance. I'm Jacques Gijiha, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Finance. I'm joined today by Michael Hyman, First Deputy Commissioner, Jeffrey Shear, Deputy Commissioner for Treasury and Payment Services, and Samara Kovacic, Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on our fiscal year 2017 preliminary budget. I'm pleased to report that New York City finances are currently in good shape. Through January, the city collected $38 billion, which is 6% more than for the same period last year. The average daily on the street cash balance for February was $11.9 billion, up from $11.1 billion in February 2015. There are, however, some economic risks ahead that could affect city tax collections. <coughs> Stock, bond, and commodity markets are flashing warning signs. We've seen stock market turmoil continue in the early months of 2016, with the S&P down 9.5% from its peak in May of 2015. The yield on a 30-year U.S. Treasury bond hit a new record low of around 2.6% as investors show their preference for bonds as a safer heaven. The oil industry is in a major downturn, with the price of oil, barrel of oil, sinking to its lowest level since 2004. As a result, many debt burden oil companies face default on their debt. The combination of a very low interest rate and exposure to energy companies' debt is exerting stress on the banking system. The economic situation is not as severe as in 2008, but it is very worrisome. Already, we are witnessing some softness in many of the city taxes, including the personal income tax and the real property transfer tax. For example, Wage withholding, which is a key component of the personal income tax, grew by only 2.9% in the first seven months of the fiscal year, down from an average growth rate of 6.3% in the previous three years, indicating softness in the labor market. The real property transfer, which is an indicator of the health of the high-end real estate market, has grown um, by only 3.7% so far this fiscal year, down from an average growth rate of 23.7% in the previous three fiscal years. 
At first glance, the reason seems to be that economic uncertainty coupled with a strong dollar have made foreign buyers of high-end condos cautious. Put simply, while the city finances are fine in the short term, they are signs of an economic slowdown. So we should approach the fiscal year 17 executive budget and financial plan with caution. While we will continue to closely monitor tax collections and will brief the council as warranted. While we cannot control the economy, we can do our best to enhance revenue collections by administering our tax laws as transparently as possible. In addition, we want to make sure that our customers receive all the abatement and exemptions for which they qualify. This again requires improve, improving transparency as well as providing exceptional customer service so that taxpayers understand their rights and obligations and are able to apply for and receive benefits fairly. <clears throat> to that end, in the last 20, 22 months, we have implemented new internal operating systems to improve customer access to services and information. We engineered many of our processes to enhance customer experiences and employee productivity, <clears throat> increase transparency to improve compliance, and strengthened our relationships with stakeholders. We have also empowered our staff to rethink the way they work, thereby increasing employee engagement and creating a customer-centric business culture throughout the agency. Our staff now views what they do in terms of how it impacts customers, the citizens of New York City. These changes are directly impacting the public in very positive ways. Today, I'm excited to share with you the result of our work. In the past year, we have instituted four major initiatives to increase transparency. <clears throat> the first has been establishing and launching the Office of the Taxpayer Advocate, an office dedicated to ensuring that taxpayers are treated fairly, that they understand their rights, and that they have an advocate for cases in dispute. In the last five months, the Office of the Taxpayer Advocate has handled 164 inquiries, the largest portion of which involve property tax issues, particularly personal exemption, abatement, property valuation, and tax payments. In addition to that, the Office of the Taxpayer Advocate has opened 95 cases, with less than half still under review. They closed, they closed 54 cases that generated more than $132,000 in refunds and more than $1.7 million in tax abatements granted to New York City taxpayers. In addition to assisting taxpayers with resolving complaints, the Office of the Taxpayer Advocate is focused on improving communications between the Department of Finance and our customers, as well as making recommendations to improve and correct internal processes that may adversely impact taxpaying New Yorkers. In October, the Office issued the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, 10 fundamental rights that every New Yorker can and should expect as a taxpayer and the Office of Taxpayer Advocate will soon issue a report on 10 systemic problems currently affecting taxpayers with recommendations on how to resolve them. The second major initiative in the area of transparency comes in response to a strong demand from the business community, including tax practitioners, business owners, and attorneys. Last October, we relaunched the Tax Representatives and Practitioners Program, better known as Tax Wrap, which was, first, which was held for the first time in six years. Close to 300 people attended what is now an annual event to exchange ideas and best business practices, as well as preview new initiatives. Thirdly, we launched our new business tax system e-services website which is a major overhaul of the 25-year-old computer system for business taxes. This is the first of three rollouts. The new system will improve efficiency by reducing cycle times, allow us to more quickly process customer transactions, and respond to customer inquiries 
while providing access to more information. Finally, we established a new business tax service unit, a technical information group responding to legal, policy, and procedural questions about the city business taxes. It was important to provide the business community with this type of support and guidance, particularly as we implement the corporate tax reform law that was enacted in the spring of 2015. This new group will also be responsible for explaining our business tax laws and providing general interpretations of those laws. In the first three months, the office received about 200 requests per month, many, <coughs> uh, many inquiring about the implementation phase of corporate tax reform. This group also develop, develops new forms and designs new pages on our website to, to communicate the tax law changes and address frequently asked questions. Another objective of uh, this year's business agenda is to improve customer service, both through access to our exemption programs and improvement to our business centers. You are all familiar with our rent freeze program for seniors, senior citizens and people with disabilities. Just this year alone, we have made many changes to show our commitment to this program and the people it helps. Our specific program work in this area includes the following. Supporting and implementing the law establishing the humblest person for the SCRI and GRI programs. Since their appointment last summer, they have handled roughly 300 cases and inquiries, helping seniors and people with disabilities better navigate the process of applying for and maintaining rent freeze benefits. The husband persons, humble persons, uh, work closely with the, with the Office of the Taxpayer Advocate and will eventually become part of that office, increasing the agency's efficiency in managing challenges and complaints from our customers regarding taxes and benefits. In the last year and a half, as a result of an increased outreach and a rise of the income limit to $50,000 from 29, we have enrolled 13,232 new households into the program, 11,029 in SCREE, and 1,943 in GRI. Citywide, there are 10,822 people receiving the GRI benefit and 53,804 receiving SCREE, for a total of 64,628 recipients. We have made significant operational and structural changes designed to protect tenants in these programs. The new benefit takeover rule makes it easier for qualifying household members to take over squeegee benefits when the head of households dies or permanently leaves their household. The rule also extends the time that remaining household members can apply for benefits from a prior policy of 60 days from the date of death to six months after the date of death, or 90 days from a Department of Finance notice of removal of the benefit, whichever is later. We adopted rules protecting tenants whose benefits were revoked after failing to timely submit the biannual renewal or other applications. The new rules specified that tenants who fail to submit, timely submit renewal or other applications because of a disability may have their cases referred to the department EEO office for, for review by an ADA coordinator, where the ADA coordinator determines that a tenant missed a statutory filing deadline as a result of a disability, the ADA coordinator can grant a reasonable amount of additional time as an accommodation to apply for benefits. Once program eligibility is confirmed, the rule also allows these tenants to re-enter the program at the previously frozen rent. To inform our work, we meet regularly with advocates for seniors and people with disability, disabilities and form a new squeegee tax force to align our efforts on behalf of the people we serve. <coughs> Partnering with advocates has helped us to better understand issues affecting tenants in assessing our information facilities, find productive solutions to their problems, and improve our general procedures. 
Barcodes have been added to our renewal applications and other documents for quicker processing. And we are redesigning key forms for initial, renewal, and benefit takeover applications to make sure that they are more informative, easier to understand, and easier to read for those with vision impairments by increasing font sizes. Our goal is to make the application form forms less complicated and simpler to complete. We are partnering with other government agencies to directly obtain data to expedite application processing without seeking additional documentation from applicants. We are currently working on a rent freeze portal which will offer property owners clear information about the tax credits they are receiving by tenants. It will also give them the ability to file documents electronically for easier submissions and updates to their accounts. This effort ultimately benefits the tenants because the information landlords provide will be used for faster application processing. While we are dedicated to providing benefits to people who are eligible for them, we are required by law to make sure that the programs are properly administered. In response to recent audits of our exemptions programs by the City Comptroller's Office, we have been making sure that benefits are granted only to those who are eligible. Last month, the Comptroller released his audit of the Co-op Condo Abatement Program, which identified 1,249 properties that are improperly receiving benefits, representing less than one half of 1% 1 of the universe of 265,000. The Comptroller recommended that the city recoup benefits worth $10 million for the four-year four year period between fiscal year 2012 and fiscal year 2016. The challenge of efficiently and fairly administering any exemption program is trying to bring in as many people, eligible people as possible, while excluding those who are not eligible. We share the Comptroller's goal of properly administering these programs and complying with the law. But we also want you to know that enforcement is only feasible if, if we do renewals as intended in the law. In 2005, the Department of Finance stopped doing renewals for all of the ex personal exemption programs, including STAR, the Senior Citizen Home ex Owner Exemption, and the Veteran Exemption. Reinstituting a renewal process is the only way to determine who should continue to receive benefits. To give you a sense of the magnitude of this renewal effort, close to 50,000 she and 5,000 Z recipients will be required to file for renewal every other year. About 110,000 E-Star recipients will be required to file for renewal every year, as are the 250,000 apartment owners receiving the co-op and condo abatement. We realize that reinstituting renewals would negatively impact some people, and we are working to minimize that impact by, by applying the eligibility requirement prospectively. We will be working with our community partners, including elected officials, to, to help get the word out about the upcoming renewal period. Meeting consumer demands as driven our efforts in other ways. We have made it our mission that a visit to one of our business centers is both a pleasant and efficient experience by making them more modern and functional. As a result, we have reduced the wait time at our business centers by 87% to an average of less than four minutes from a high of more than 25 minutes in March of 2014, while providing free Wi-Fi and options for mobile payments such as Apple Pay and Google Wallet. We are also reviewing all locations and signage to make sure that they accommodate the varying needs of our different constituents. This includes language access and physical accessibility. I've always maintained that the Department of Finance is uniquely situated to be able to protect citizens in a number of ways. Since I've joined the agency, Deed fraud has been a major area of, fo of focus. In January, I testified in detail about our extensive efforts to help New York City residents guard against criminals using fraudulent documents to steal their homes. 
as I indicated in my testimony, we have taken affirmative steps to curtail this activity. We have trained our staff to better detect forged and fraudulent documents and put in place a number of safeguards, the most important of which is the insertion of our sheriff office in the review process. These initial efforts are making a difference. Since we implemented these changes 18 months ago, 1,133 cases have been referred to the Sheriff's Office for investigation. Of these cases, 474 have been closed. 134 have become criminal investigations, and 524 are ongoing investigations. We have made 17 arrests for 28 properties that have a total market value of about $19 million. We have also responded to the rash of abuse of the drug K2. I'm sure you have read about some of the horrible uh, tragedies resulting from the widespread sale of this dangerous product, uh, product, which until last summer was regularly sold at grocery stores throughout the city. Our Sheriff's Office has made great progress in the enforcement of the K2 law. Thanks to their efforts, and our partnership with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, we have seen a huge drop in K2 sales. Last fiscal year, search and seizures found 38,127 packages sold illegally. So far this year, that number has dramatically dropped to 1,993 packages. The Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has also informed us that K2 related emergency room visits dropped by 73% in December of 2015 from a peak of 1,200 K2 related visits in July 2015. All of these accomplishments have been the result of a shift to a customer centric culture within the agency. And I would like to take this opportunity to publicly thank my staff for de their dedication and hard work. While we are doing all we can with the tools and resources we have at our disposal, we, also, we will also require legislation to accomplish some of our goals. We are supporting the following legislation. We are working with the New York State Legislature on a bill that would implement national best practices to capture deep fraud offenders and offer better protections to homeowners. We are also working on an outreach campaign to educate homeowners of the serious crime and to help them to protect themselves. We have produced legislation for the rent freeze program that would allow tenants back into the program at the old frozen rent if they are disqualified from the program for one lease term and then we qualify afterward. Through our Mayor's Office of Pension and Investment, we are pushing for the development of a private sector retirement program for business with at least 10 employees that do not already offer a retirement plan. According to the New School Schwartz Center for Economic and Policy Analysis, 40% of new retirement New York City households between the ages of 55 and 64 have less than $10,000 saved for retirement. The low savings will probably consign them to poverty or need poverty in retirement. We also need the City Council to pass legislation authorizing the Department of Finance to establish a 90-day amnesty program in fiscal year 2017 for judgment violations issued by the Department of Buildings, the Sanitation Department, and other city agencies, and adjudicated, for, adjudicated by the Environmental Control Board. This will allow us to meet our goal of improving collection of ECB debt. I hope that my testimony today has demonstrated the many great initiatives and programs you have implemented, as well as some of our key goals for this year. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you today. At this time, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much for your testimony. And as we're going through it, you know, it's, it's very refreshing to hear from the Department of Finance Commissioner um, <coughs> how you've progressively really have in that, or are working with screen injury and ensuring that we have as much participation as possible. So we're very excited to hear of your task force um, and hopefully we can um, find ways where we can get more um, enrollees. Um, 
I wanted to specifically focus on your new needs request. So in your testimony, you've um, highlighted uh, the drop, the significant drop from 38,127 packages sold illegally to 1,993 packages. Um, in the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that there is a 73% drop. So can you walk me through the need for these 15 new permanent positions that will be devoted to K2, do we expect this to be an ongoing issue, even though we've seen significant drops? Um, it just seems that the new need identified does not necessarily correlate with the actual actions of what's happening in K2. Um, as you can see from my testimony, uh, we've made some significant progress, okay? You also have to bear in mind <clears throat> that um, in New York City currently, we have about 9,800 uh, stores that are licensed to sell uh, cigarettes. What was that number, Commissioner? 9,800. 9,800. And uh, we currently visit about, uh, inspect about uh, 500 of them on an annual basis. So there's a huge universe we are not touching, okay? Previously, uh, as you can imagine, we, we've been using the sheriff for a number of things, including um, not only to do their functions, but also we get them involved in K2. We also get them involved in Ford. So we've been taking deputies away from their normal day-to-day -day functions, okay, to redeploy them to these to this, uh, uh, new uh, things, activities, including K2. So therefore, there's always a need for us to have more deputies, okay, to even do the basic, as I said, the 9,800 stores currently are licensed to sell cigarettes. We only inspect about 500 on a yearly basis. So, so what percentage do you think uh, currently you're getting at how, of stores? How many stores? It's only when you're getting a 500 out of 9,800. So out of 9,800, you visit about, about 500. About 500, yeah. And in those 500 is when you were able to collect these packages of 38. That's it, exactly. Wow, that is very helpful. You know, so it is, it, as I said, it's, we, have a long, uh, we have a long way to go. Okay, we're making progress, but uh, we cannot basically drop our guards because we've been successful so far. And what is the current head count at the Sheriff's Department, uh, the deputies? <coughs> it's We have about 130 deputies and uh, 20 inspectors, investigators. And what's the difference? And the support staff. Uh, support staff of our many. Altogether, we have about 231 staff, but uh, consisting of 130 deputies and uh, 20 investigators, criminal investigators. 20 criminal investigators. Investigators. Okay. Can you provide us details on the new K2 group and the reasons for its creation specifically? Again, as I said, uh, it's, uh, it was a problem mm -hmm. that there, there was a law enacted by the council and we're in the process of implementing the law. As part of implementation of the law, we have to have the resources needed to conduct all kind of investigations and uh, to do what's necessary. As I said, we, uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. As I said, we're not t touching the entire universe. So uh, we've been successful so far, but uh, we cannot just, uh, you know, just give up and thinking that, you know, because it's successful, the problem goes away. Thank you. Um, now, I wanted to specifically ask for your, your support or your including of a PMMR indicator to allow the public to track this new, um, to track the success of this group. Okay. We, we, will, uh, we will definitely do. Yes? Yes. Okay. I like it when I get yeses in prelim. Um, the Office of the Sheriff also I mean, you should bear in mind, we measure everything at finance because this is how we measure whether or not we're successful or not. And how right. we're going to uh, tweak whatever, prob whatever initiatives that we're doing to make sure we reach the objective that we set for us. Yes. Some of your colleagues don't, so that's why we have to ask the question and get it on the record. Um, the Office of the Sheriff also conducts tobacco enforcement investigation of licensed cigarette retail locations in New York City, where K2 is often found. Revenue of the cigarette license fee is projected to be 
50,000 fiscal 2017. This estimate has been the same for years and the actual revenue derived from these fees are usually slightly lower, more like 46,000 in fiscal 14 and 40 in fiscal 15. Um, can you just, uh, that was just highlighting the revenue that we are actually collecting, um, but can you walk me through how this K2 unit adding, or adding K2, and I guess this would be more um, for the sheriff's perspective, but how, is it a new training, is it a new complexity, how can we get more efficient if they're going in for cigarettes and find K2? Um, are there legislative hurdles that, um, sure. that the sheriffs have to overcome? What's, what's the change? Yeah, let me let the sheriff... Uh, give Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. And if you can just state your name for the record and... My name is Joseph Pacito and I'm the sheriff of the city of And she'll swear you in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I affirm. Great. The, the sheriff's office uses... You can bring up a chair. You look incredibly uncomfortable. Thank you. Be much <laughs> All right. The sheriff's office uses a combined approach to our enforcement. You can't think of this as we go in with one mindset. When we go into the, the, the businesses that we conduct regulatory inspections, we're there for several reasons. The first and primary reason for the Department of Finance is the regulation of taxes on cigarettes. That is our primary reason. But over the course of time, additional layers have been placed on this enforcement process. Several years ago, the Council passed the Sensible Tobacco Act. That included banning certain flavored tobacco and other items. Right. So now, when we go into a business, we are looking at the untaxed cigarettes, and our field division has grown to look at all the flavored tobacco and other tobacco products are there. So that's the second component piece. The K2 was a natural fit. We go into the location, we look for K2 because it was being stored with the um, inventories of tobacco, flavored tobacco, and untaxed cigarettes. And I think you also have a copy of the report for our statistics for this year. You'll notice that we also served 277 embargoing orders from the De Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Mm -hmm. During the summertime, during the Legionnaires crisis, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene was not able to serve in hand every one of these orders. That was required in order to get a misdemeanor arrest out of anybody selling K2 before the introduction of the K2 legislation. So. When the deputy sheriffs go into the business, they serve the Commissioner of Health's banning order because under the law, the sheriff is authorized to serve any civil process. So the health department's need to send an inspector was alleviated because under another section of law, the sheriff was authorized to serve that document. So you're beginning to see that our approach is not, we don't go in with one-minded. We're not a flat piece of paper. We're a cube. There's a lot of dynamics going on when we go in, and that is why we ask for different needs. If you notice, our needs consist of deputy sheriffs, which are the uniform component. Then we asked for investigators, which are the investigative component. And then we looked at the auditors. That's our auditing component. And what we're trying to do is when we find a business that's violating the cigarette tax law and violating the flavor tobacco and violating the K2, we want to bring to bear all the forces that finance has, which means that we can enter civil penalties for the untaxed cigarettes. We can serve them with a banning order so that if they do it again, the police department or the sheriff's department could arrest them for violating the commissioner's order and arrest them for the K2 order. Do you see that all these pieces are operating at the same time? So it's not just one item that we're doing. We're doing multiple items in our enforcement. And that's how the sheriff's office operates. We're very small, but what we do is in our field division, everything that is in our field division, we will take enforcement action on. So that's the overall strategy. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, Commissioner, or Sheriff, whoever, um, whomever, uh, when you have, how, out of the, how do you identify these 500 out of your 9,800? Is it based on complaints? It's Is a it combination. It's complaints. We, we, we have a, a complaint hotline where individuals can call up and say that, Sheriff, I believe that we're getting, that people are selling untaxed cigarettes. We receive well, I believe people are watching this hearing right now. So what is your complaint hotline? Uh, I, I have to give you the number, but certainly it's TaxCop is our email address. Okay, TaxCop. TaxCop at, uh, at, at finance.nyc.gov. Okay.
Okay. And we'll get you the number before the hearing is out. Please do that. Thank you. So, so we receive data from the public. Somebody says that the sheriff, they're selling untaxed cigarettes. We receive data from the police department. This, this enforcement process, we're not alone. We, the mayor's office instituted a, 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 a work group to tackle K2. And part of that process has the sheriff's office, the police department, the mayor's office, all of us working in conjunction to exchange information. So if the police department become aware of illegal cigarette sales, they pass the information along to us. We become aware of K2 sales, we pass the information along to the police department. We also provide support in the form of looking at the financial trail of how these people are spending the money that they're acquiring from the sale of untaxed cigarettes in K2. So everything kind of comes full circle. That's why we have a need for auditors, that's why we have a need for investigators, and that's why we have a need for uniform staff. It's, 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 it's a, a, a multitude of processes zoning in, and I think you could see the results. We took something which everybody said, how are we going to stop this? And in six months, we were able to reduce it significantly. That was the approach. We entered tax warrants against businesses that were selling K2 and untaxed cigarettes, and simultaneously, as these tax warrants became docketed, deputy sheriffs would go back out to the business and seize money from the location. That's the cycle. The cycle is designed to deter unlawful behavior. Thank you. Um, I wanted to pivot, and very much still so, on the sheriff. Oh, the hotline. You want the hotline number? Uh, it's 718-707-2100. Oh, it was nothing exciting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Full tax cop. I was like, tax cop 1-800 or something. <laughs> Oh, we got to work on that one, Commissioner. Okay. I'm sorry. What was the number again, if you can just repeat it? 718-707-2100. 2100. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wanted to focus. We had a great hearing on deed fraud, one that got a lot of attention, and I'm hoping that many New Yorkers understood um, how seriously you're taking this as an agency and the work that you're doing as a commissioner and that we're partnering with. Um, I know that there's five positions also at the Sheriff's Queens headquarters. Um, why Queens? Is it that you're finding it as an epicenter or was as there... As the headquarter of the Sheriff. I'm sorry? As the headquarter of the Sheriff Department. Okay, so it's not that it's going to be focused for Queens. No. It's just that it's going to be. Yes. Okay. Um, that was easy. Uh, what will be the role of the auditor in, in this capacity that you've identified for deed fraud? Uh, again, I would have the sheriff come in and give you a better explanation of this, but they have okay. a specific role to play. Excellent. Yeah. The, the auditors help the investigators and deputy sheriffs figure out the financial picture. I think earlier when we were here testifying about <laughs> deed fraud, we presented a nice chart showing you the complexities of deed fraud. That material is created by our auditors. They look at the financial trail, and the auditor looks at it and composes, okay, Sheriff, this is what we think is going on. The investigators and deputy sheriffs go out and execute on that information. So the auditor is really looking at this from the tax point of view, was there a tax crime committed, and from the financial point of view, they have the expertise. Uh, the model we use in the sheriff's office is we're all law enforcement, but it doesn't have to be everybody has a gun. Right. We need the different skill sets in order to make the complete picture. I know that you had mentioned working on an outreach program to let more New Yorkers know of the opportunities that they have. Have you um, finalized the outreach program? When could we see it rolled out? And have you engaged with other agencies to let them know that this is an opportunity that... We are still working on it. Actually, this, actually this morning I saw a pamphlet. I don't know if Sonia is on here. No. Sonia? Because there was a plan for this morning, actually, we, what we have uh, final. She doesn't have it with her. Okay. So we're working on, uh, and as I said, on a major outreach campaign, and we will also get other um, uh, city agencies involved. Okay. Definitely. So we'd like to see yeah. what, as, when you're done with that, we'd sure. like to see it. Um, in the hearing, you, ref you referred to two pieces of state legislation. Um, wanted to know what the status was of your legislation, what is the status of each of these four pieces, and can you please provide copies of each of the pieces of legislation that you have? Um, sure. Uh, which one are you talking about? Well, you can give us the status. Uh, the, the first one was... Uh, Do you want me to highlight them? Yeah, no, okay. I have them. So did, Ford, did Ford, we're still working on it. Okay. It was introduced uh, last year, but we made some amendment to it, and uh, we will introduce it again. And the uh, school injury legislation, 
which one? A, which one? A Squee? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the entry is, is uh, 882 It was introduced uh, in, both in both houses. So did you just merge? Because we have you on the record talking about four pieces of legislation in reference to deed fraud. Was that yeah, we have one. It's one package. So it's a package it's a that package, includes yeah. the four. Yeah. Okay. Um, so your update is on all four yes. of those. Okay, very good. Um, DOF included nine savings action in the citywide savings program, totaling $1.9 million in fiscal 2017. Some of these savings appear as those DOF took deliberate action to achieve savings, such as the cancellation of subscriptions of no longer needed by the legal division, PS accruals by hiring delays, and reduction of software expenses after a revaluation of what was necessary and what was not. However, some actions appear in the savings program that seem to be a re-forecast to reflect true costs or savings that have, um, have accrued anyway, such as the savings realized from a funding reversal for the implementation of the Responsible Banking Act, a uh, re-forecast of the legal division's uh, adjudication expense, and the purchase of new computers which will reduce maintenance expenses. How does DOF determine which actions um, that reduced costs are included in the citywide savings program? Uh, I mean, it, as, as you can imagine, it's, uh, we, our goal is to try to uh, minimize our expenses as much as we can to generate uh, savings for the city. Um, I don't know, I don't have the detail on every specific item that we have on the list here because of, uh, you know, you mentioned subscriptions and, you know, it's, uh, again, from our perspective, every time we see that there are things that we don't need or people are not currently using, uh, we will basically try to remove them and, uh, you know, and use the savings to uh, give it right back uh, to the city. Um. I wanted to focus in on RPIE, the late filing fees. Mm -hmm. um, it's projecting it to generate $4 million in revenue for fiscal 2017. This projection has remained the same for years, although actual revenue for 2014 <coughs> and 2015 was over $20 million. In fiscal 2014, the Finance Committee passed legislation that imposed interest on the late filing fees and imposed fines and interest for failing to fill out an exclusion form. Has revenue generated by our PIE late filing fees increased significantly since the imposition, the imposition of interest? Um, if so, will DOF align its projections to reflect its revenue? This one is very hard to, to, to be honest with you to forecast on an annual basis because we, you know, on the one hand, we're trying to um, reduce the number of people who do not file. So this is our goal. Our drive is to get as many people, okay, to file as, as early as possible because we need that information. Uh, for So therefore, our natural tendency is to um, be very conservative in our forecast um, because our goal is basically to get as many people to participate in the program as possible so we could uh, secure the information that we need. So therefore, we tend to basically uh, lowball the numbers that uh, we forecast because of our uh, objective. And, uh, but, uh, you know, as you can imagine, we still have some issues with uh, people filing. And uh, we, I don't have the number in mind in terms of, in terms of the late filing interest. Yeah, the interest, how much it generates, I don't have. Do you have that? Yeah, what is it? Yeah, I know, but do we have uh, the interest? I don't have the, I will get back to you on the question you're asking about the interest. What is it? I don't know, which charge, but what is the total? Right. Uh, that's, uh, you're asking for the total, yes. how much is generated. Yes. Uh, which I, I would, we will provide you that information. Fair enough. Um, I'm going to have my, my colleague ask her questions, and I'm going to come back with a sure. second set of questions. Council Member Rosenthal. <coughs> Thank you so much. Do you know about the potion? I'm going to send you the potion. Yeah, you are going to feel better. I promise. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, to the flu season. Commissioner, it's so nice to see you as always. Really Pleasure. appreciate your testimony and obviously all the hard work you guys have been doing over the last year. So I'm just going to ask a very few follow-up follow questions on that. Mm -hmm. um, first, you mentioned about the ADA coordinator. 
um, who's helping with uh, people who don't meet the deadline uh, as a result of their disability. That's really great. And it's something that um, I've actually been working on legislatively for all city agencies. I'm wondering if that person's name, not name, or the ADA coordinator is identified on your website and uh, if the public can easily access that person. Um, this is the same issue we had with the ombudsperson. I think through 311, they could reach out to mm. uh, the AGA coordinator because we don't provide okay. Got it. Uh, you know, uh, telephone numbers of the different uh, people. But uh, the EO office, yeah. The EO yeah. Office, yeah, the office is on the website. website and that um, to the so pretty soon, by law, you're going to have to put a, that person's, not their name, but the, uh, that um, person's title uh, with very easy contact information on the website. You could jumpstart that now okay. and be first out of the gate. Um, it, we've just found it incredibly important as an outward-facing tool. Secondly, um, I wanted to ask about the commercial rent tax that uh, businesses south of 96th Street um, down to, I think, 14th Street and Dur, um, or is it Chambers? Uh, whichever. Uh, are you contemplate Chambers, are you contemplating uh, giving some relief there, um, maybe to the businesses that, um, you know, increasing the cap on the rents they paid from 250 to maybe 500,000, which I think is valued at $33 million. Would you contemplate um, phasing that in? Um, currently, we don't have this on the table as part of the budget. Uh, Say that one more time. Currently, we don't have this on the table. Currently, you don't. Uh, as part of the budget initiatives. We understand the challenges that many small businesses are going through with respect to commercial rent tax. And, uh, but again, you have to uh, look at things in the context of uh, the uh, budget in terms of it is in this environment, given the uh, economic uncertainty that we see uh, taking place, um, you know, with the stock market and with the economy, as I, as I indicated in my uh, uh, testimony, mm. the softness that we're seeing in the economy, I would be very cautious in terms of uh, mm -hmm. proposing any proposal that would basically reduce the tax revenue base of the city at this point in time. Because you don't, you want, to, you don't want to be in a situation after you come up with a proposal, mm -hmm. you implement sure. it, and then later down the road and something happens and then yep. you're going to have to go back and raise taxes, basic or court expenditure, court so services. two questions. One yeah. is would you contemplate doing an analysis that would understand the impact on small businesses? Oh, sure. of this oh, sure. um, we, tax, we, yeah, we, oh, this double tax, basically, and whether or not um, what impact it has on small businesses, so what impact the relief would be. Um, I'd be interested in that. And secondly, um, what do you think about the idea of giving relief to the small businesses and making an equivalent, um, you know, so there would be no loss in revenue generated to the city, um, increasing for the highest groups, those paying over businesses, those paying over four million dollars a year in rent. Um, so you would get an equivalent 33 million, therefore no impact on the city's budget. Um, again, as I said, um, the, the uh, goal is basically it's, uh, you don't want to make it even more expensive for because when we're talking about you know half a million dollar threshold. It's not really big business per se. You have a lot of small businesses also that would be impacted by uh, increasing uh, um, that, you know, the taxes because it's talking about only half a million dollars. For any space in Manhattan, it doesn't take a lot to get to would the you, half a million tr threshold. Would you so, consider adding that to the analysis when we course, look at we, we, we could the provide, impact? We could provide. I mean, my sense when I looked at the numbers was the hit on the large businesses was fairly de minimis. It wasn't clear to me why it would, that impact on their revenue stream would be so significant as to change their business model or make, chase them out of New York City, whereas the impact for the small businesses could could be so much more powerful, and I would love to sure. work with you on an analysis of that. Sure, we'll Great. share with you. Um, for uh, this year, the Mayor's Office of Special Enforcement 
uh, got additional funding for their uh, inspectors, including inspectors from the sheriff's um, department for uh, in your budget, Department of Finance. I was wondering how many um, more inspectors, how many more lines did you see, and have you been able to hire up those positions? Currently, we're in the process of hiring deputy sheriffs and criminal investigators. We send them through a police academy, which is run by the sheriff's office. They go through the same background check by NYPD. So right now, we need to fill 22 more deputy sheriff lines, and I believe it's 12 <coughs> investigator lines, and then we will be at full head count. Now, we are very close to achieving this. The NYPD notified us last week that they had cleared 11 candidates for the psychological. That was the last step that was needed before they start the academy. So we're just waiting on the mm -hmm. last group. We're, we're estimating that we'll start the academy mid-March, and then they'll yeah. graduate at some point in July. Can you separate out the OSE lines? The OSE lines, I believe, were four. Mm -hmm. And what we did was, as the commissioner mentioned, we have to pull from certain units. We have two deputy sheriffs and a criminal investigator currently assigned to OSE. Okay. And they've been working with OSC on the various initiatives okay, that they so have. Okay, so two deputy sheriffs. Two, two deputy fine. sheriffs and a criminal investigator are currently assigned. And a criminal investigator. At so OSC. So you have three lines. Yes. And um, did you get a bump up in lines? No, so that's, that's the lines that we have. We, we had four lines all together for OSC. Did, was there a change between fiscal year 15 and fiscal year 16 and fiscal year 17? Same. Same. No change. No change. Okay, so, and I'm sorry, it was actually four FTEs? Yes. And two deputy sheriffs, one criminal investigator, a partridge and a pear tree. Yes. No, what was the last one? It, it's, it's actually two investigators and two deputy sheriffs, so the OSC is almost at maximum. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, Commissioner, back to Scree and Dree. These are my last two questions, I promise. Um, I'm wondering two things. One, can you, the numbers that you reported, the increase in the numbers are terrific. I mean, it really sounds like it was a worthwhile change, and that's very exciting that we increased, you know, the cap up to 50000 a year. Do you have that breakdown by council member district? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Can I trouble you to send that along to the committee? Oh, sure. Of course, you will. Um, and you mentioned the barcode, the, this new barcode program for your renewal applications. What, um, <coughs> the way the paragraph reads, it sort of sounds, I can't get the timing of it. Is it in the future? Is it happening now? Do no, it's been added. It's, it's been, already, barcode has been added. Yeah. Been added. Yeah. And then it says we are redesigning key forms for initial renewal and benefit takeover applications. Yeah, we're in the process of renew, redesigning all the forms, all the applications that we have. To Do make you have a sure. timeline on that? Um, we have to engage, I believe, uh, uh, a contractor to basically to come and design the forms for us. Where are we with this? Where are we with this? Three months, you think? Should be yeah. done in three months? Yeah. That's great. I mean, again, to the extent that council member offices can be helpful in getting the word out, um, <coughs> you know, we're processing screen injury applications every day. So yeah, we've been getting a tax force involved in the design and the concept conceptualization oh, wow. of, of the forms. Great. I would really. I'm personally very interested in that because of how many forms my staff fills out mm -hmm. um, and sends up. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, and then lastly, I really understood on page seven you talked about um, the audit of the exemption programs. And um, I guess I have two questions. Besides the conceptual question, can I just hear the end of the story um, in terms of the controller suggesting that you go after these 1,249 properties, which I understand is a, you know, a tiny bit of the total. Did you recoup, and was it worth $10 million? Well, we will. Uh, it's a worth $10 million over a four-year period. It's okay. About, it's about uh, two and a half. Four years. Yeah. Got it. About two and a half million dollars. We will do our best we could uh, uh, to recoup that money. Did they identify uh, the property address? Is it hard to recoup, or? Is it something that you've already put in the budget that you think is really going to happen? Uh, it is uh, because many of them are LLCs, 
so therefore, you know, we will try to as best as we can to go after them. You know. Did you find it helpful to get this information? Uh, we got that information, but as I said, it's uh, it's it's we it's we will do our best to try to collect as much as we can from. Let me ask it a different way. Okay. Is it stuff that's not gettable, so you know, sort of, it's not worth the extra time and energy, or it's stuff that just slipped through the cracks? We'll get it now. And as, as I indicated, it's uh, w the only way we could detect these things is. Uh, if you do renewals, if you renew, yeah. the, you know, have people renew every other year yeah. or every year, and we stopped doing it in 2005. Yeah. So therefore, we, even though we have safeguards in place to monitor yeah. all these things, you're still going to have some of them falling sure. through the crack. Okay, and that's and what happened. What's your philosophic view about? Um, should we go back to renewals? I uh, mean, you wrote about the challenges of involved. Yeah, Talk again, I said, uh, you know, we know that's going to impose some cost, some pain on some people, so therefore that's yeah. the reason why we say we're going to do it prospectively rather than trying to go back. Yeah. I mean, if it's a business that is getting it, which is not eligible to get the benefit and get the benefit, we'll go after them. But, uh, you know, in a situation like this, we have to uh, be a little bit <coughs> careful and a little bit sensitive. Because we, it, to some extent, it's, uh, we fell on our part because we stopped doing the renewals. Right. And all of a sudden, somebody receiving a bill from us who says, oops, we're going to try to recoup, you know, half a million dollars from you when, you know, we stopped doing our work, our job. Okay. So it's a little But you are contemplating it forward looking. We were looking at it prospectively, yes. Oh wow. You you are going to do it or you're contemplating? No, for for the for the one that the controllers request I um, recommend that we go after we'll go after them. Okay. But uh, for all the other renewals that we intend we're going to do going forward, we will implement it prospectively. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Um we will hear from Council Member Johnson. I just wanted to have a, a quick question before um, can you tell me the status on the rulemaking for the real property transfer tax exemption for affordable housing projects? It seems, you know, especially with HDFCs and other affordable housing projects, it's one thing what the administration is saying, it's another thing what the rules are. So where are we? We are still working with the law department and city hall to, you know, review the rule. We're still in the rulemaking process. We're still reviewing the rules and the issue. Soon it would be completed. And what's the timeline? Um, I cannot, you know, give you. Not even depends close, on, like a guess. It depends on. It depends on other uh, players, you know. So therefore. I so think. what's happening? It's between you, the law department, and us, law department, city hall. And city so, hall. Yeah, we're trying to see if we could, you know, again be as encompassing as we can be. Just trying to. So be. has your recommendations? An mm -hmm. HPD. Yeah. I'm sorry. An HPD. Yeah. So. It just walk me through where where we need to put pressure, and I know that this puts you in an awkward position. I don't want to do that, but I have to because I'm asking you the question. So, um, <laughs> where where does this administration have to, where does this um, council have to put pressure on the administration to get this in a timely manner? I think it will be done in a timely manner. I don't think there's a need for any pressure, to be honest with you. It's just that uh, we're trying to accommodate so many different scenarios. Uh -huh. Okay, because it's, it's a complex thing. So we're trying to accommodate as many scenarios as possible. So therefore, every time you think you 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 cover you know the entire universe, and there's an exception, and you're trying to fit that exception into it. So can you? So, you know, what's the so process it it, now? It's, it's, which in a review, I think we, we it should be done very soon. What did you say? No, it should be done very soon. I don't, I, you know, You're I, very I cannot soon and my you. very soon are two different very Trust soon. Trust me, I'm getting, we're getting a lot of uh, 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 requests in terms of people asking, inquiries, people asking us all constantly. Right, and the count, it's, it's very confusing because yeah. there's no clear rule well, now. No clear rule. Yeah, I know. So, so when is going to get done? And we're working on it, you know, uh, very hard to get, it, uh, to get it out as soon as possible. I'm just concerned, and I hope that you can go back no, to whoever no, you need it, to go it, back as, to. As you can group. imagine, this is something which is very, uh, uh, which we care about uh, in the administration because we're trying to help uh, stimulate affordable housing. Right. So I we, mean, it just doesn't. It, it contradicts the yeah, affordable exactly. housing. So it's, it's it's in our own interest right. to get it out as quickly as possible. Right. Again, as I said, we have so many scenarios which we have to try to. So my as soon as yeah. possible is like 30 days. Uh, <laughs> As I said, you have not what, the same as soon as. No, I, I think, it, it, to be honest with you, I would love to have it done 
already been done by now. But again, as I said, you have so many different cases we try to... Well, we're going to continue to push on this. You could, you should, um, definitely. And hopefully we'll have something yep. before then. Council Member Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good to see you, Commissioner. I wanted to follow up uh, with uh, a few more questions on Scree and DRI. Uh, as Councilman Rosenthal uh, just mentioned, to see the uptick in additional 11,000 people uh, enrolling in the Scree program and 1,900 people enrolling in the DRI program is great. I have a question, though. Do we know how many people are eligible but currently are not enrolled? How many New Yorkers actually qualify but are not currently enrolled? Do we have those numbers? We did an analysis, and we think it's about 80,000. You know. 80,000 people yeah. who we, qualify but are not enrolled? Not enrolled. For whatever and reason, we try, that's the reason why we're pushing really hard with our own outreach campaign uh, to get as many people as possible into the program. Well, last week I had a workshop for screen injury at a, a senior center in Greenwich Village, and your staff was there, and they were wonderful and did a really fantastic job. We had about 70 seniors there, and there were a lot of individuals who had quali who qualified but didn't know they qualified or had never tried to enroll before, and so we got a lot of people, and your staff was really fantastic in helping us that day. Thank you. I, so thank you for your, for your assistance and for the folks at DOF who were there to being helpful. There were a, a few state bills that were signed into law by the governor, as you know, last year that affected Scree and Dree, one of which was uh, increasing the, the eligibility number up to $50,000. But there was another one which required landlords to notify rent-regulated tenants the existence of Scree and Dree upon renewal of their lease. And I actually think that's probably the most effective way to ensure that people who may not know they qualify or may not know about the program actually get it. What type of enforcement is DOF doing uh, now that lease renewals are going out for senior citizens since it went into effect to ensure that landlords are actually sending out this information with lease renewals? We're working with... Uh, um, uh, I believe Assemblywoman Rosenthal and uh, Senator Golden on materials, but I think Samar has been more involved. Assemblywoman Rosenthal and Senator Golden? Yeah, and Samar has been involved in, uh, in, in the work, and I think she will probably give you more uh, detailed information. Can you just swear me in? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Um, and for the record, I'm Samara Karasik, Assistant Commissioner of External Affairs at the Department of Finance. Um, so Golden Rosenthal sponsored this bill last year, which we supported. We're actually working with their offices. Um, I dropped some materials off with Golden last week because we want to make sure that they're okay with what we want to distribute with the leases. Um, I honestly still have not figured out how to get what we want distributed to all the landlords for distribution. So that's something that we need to work through. And if you have any ideas, I'm all ears. Because, I mean, we can mail things to buildings, but I'd like to have the landlords a little bit more invested in it. So that's sort of that, you know, I think I have a good design for something, um, which if it's basically the posters from our website that would be double-sided, one side screen, one side dree. It has uh, six translated languages at the bottom telling people about the program, very similar to like our flyers that we brought with us to your event. Um, but th I think that's the challenge is how do we get the materials to the landlords and make sure that they hand them out. Well, I mean, I, I think, think if there... Let me say something. I think with the, um, once we launch the uh, landlord portal, okay, which would be something we're going to use as a leverage, because the, the, the landlord have interest in, uh, you know, so that they could know exactly all the information, as I indicated in my, in my testimony. We're launching a portal, okay, for landlords, where they could see all the information about tenants in terms of their accounts, credit, and all the information that they want, okay? And in return, we're going to ask them for certain things, okay? And this is one of the tools that we can use. Well, I, I, I would just use them as, as an as example that, exactly. that currently when individuals, whether they're rent regulated or not in New York City, re-sign a lease, there are riders that are accompanied with the lease by law, a rider on lead paint that mm -hmm. you have to sign if you have children in the house, a rider on uh, window guards. 
uh, as well. Those are standard riders that landlords know they have to send out as part of a lease renewal. I think we have to standardize it as well where we, you may not have to uh, email individual landlords the documents. They'll go on to this portal you're talking about. They'll download the information and print it out and include it in the lease renewal. That is, uh, I think that's something we're going to use as a leverage. So how do we get to those 80,000 individuals who qualify but are not enrolled? What's the strategy? We, la we are launching a major um, outreach campaign, um, and we started it last year, uh, last summer, with a pilot project in uh, Brighton Beach. Because the first thing we did in our report is to identify the areas where we have the highest under-enrollment, and we identified 10, 10 areas in New York City. So we took one of them, which is uh, Coney Island area, and uh, when we did our research, we realized that most of the rent-regulated uh, um, uh, apartments were in Brighton Beach. So we launched a pilot campaign in Brighton Beach, and so uh, the experience of that campaign is going to inform what we're going to do for the rest of the city. Well, I'd, I'd love to work with you on, on my district and do something similar to what you did in Brighton Beach. Can we sure. work on something like that together? Of course, definitely. Okay, great. And then lastly, um, I, I saw that uh, last year um, speed light camera fines uh, were, uh, was aligned with what the projections were. And so in the fiscal year preliminary budget, it reflects an increase of about $19 million in new revenue that was generated uh, by the city. Uh, so it ups it to over $48 million in speed camera fine violations. And this past fiscal year was the first fiscal year where we actually had the speed light cameras under legislation that was passed last session in Albany to create the speed light cameras. Um, how, how did you come up with that $19 million number that that was the projection? How do you project something uh, like that? I, we, we don't make the projections. We only collect. You only collect. There's no projections. We, we don't make the projections, no. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Commissioner, <clears throat> between my cold and the time, I'm going to wrap up my questions, um, but I do want to highlight that I'm going to be sending you com uh, questions on other PMRs, um, the business tax e-service for taxpayer and tax preparers, um, some questions on the controller's audit, some questions on the office of the taxpayer advocate, um, and also including an MMR indicator on that um, particular issue, the Banking Commission rate recommendations, and documents available online through your agency. So if you can get back to me expeditiously, I would appreciate it because it's going to be part of our budget response. No problem. I will, we will provide you all the information. You Thank you very much for coming to testify today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. We will immediately roll into our next agency, uh, the I. Uh, the, DDC.
Good afternoon and welcome to the first day of Council Preliminary Budget Hearings. My name is Julissa Ferreras Copeland. I'm the Chair of the Finance Committee. So far today we have heard from OMB and the Department of Finance. We will now hear testimony from Com Commissioner Peña Mora from the Department of Design and Construction. Once he is sworn in by my Council, DDC was created DDC was created by this committee in 1997 to carry out the city's capital projects more efficiently. The mission of the DDC is to deliver the city's capital construction projects in a safe, cost-effective manner uh, while maintaining the highest degree of architectural engineering and construction quality. These projects range from roadways, sewers, and water mains to public safety, health and human service facilities, as well as cultural institutions and libraries. The mission is essentially to streamline projects and build them efficiently. However, for many projects, the productivity is not where it should be. I hope the Council and the Administration can work together to help DDC fulfill its mission. I look forward to hearing from Commissioner Peña Mora regarding the status of many capital projects as well as other works the DDC is engaging in. With that said, I will have my Council swear you in and then you may begin your testimony, Commissioner. Thank you. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I refer. Good afternoon, Chairperson Ferreras Copeland, uh, members of the Finance Committee. I'm Dr. Fernioski Peña Mora, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Design and Construction. Also with me, to my right, is Eric McFarland, Deputy Commissioner of Infrastructure. To my left, Christine Flaherty, Associate Commissioner of Public Buildings. And to my far left, Justin Walter, uh, Chief Financial Officer. We are very pleased to be here with you today. As the city's primary capital construction delivery agency, the funding for our projects is provided by the 25 New York City agencies that we partner with. Our goal is to build, your, um, build for you our great city. As to DDC's budget for fiscal year 2016, our operating budget is 613 million. The operating budget is comprised of 112.5 million for personal services, with budgeted headcount of 1,376, and 500.5 million for other than personal services. The funding breakdown of DDC's fiscal year 16 operating budget is as follows. 121.8 million in IFA funds, 476.8 million in federal funds, 7.4 million in city funds, and 7 million in intra-city funds. As of the preliminary budget, DDC's fiscal year 17 total agency operating budget is 549.4 million. This includes 112.4 million for personal services with a budgeted headcount of 1,376 and 437 million for other than personal services. The funding breakdown of the fiscal year 17 operating budget is as follows. 124.2 million in IFA funds, 417.9 million in federal funds, and 7.4 million in city funds. In form, with, the, with four months remaining in fiscal year 2016, I'm pleased to report that DDC expects to meet the major statistical indicators that reflect our mission to deliver the city's construction projects in a safe, expeditious, responsive, cost-effective manner while maintaining the highest degree of architectural engineering and construction quality. I would like now to take this opportunity to note some of the projects DDC is currently working on that may be of interest to you. On the public building side, DDC is managing a project portfolio serving 25 city agencies. At this time last year, I shared with you that DDC's portfolio was expanding to support the major housing recovery operations build the back program to help New Yorkers affected by Hurricane Sandy rebuild their homes. Since these contracts were registered in June 2015, DDC and our consultant teams have met with 1,478 homeowners, completed more than 278 designs, and started construction on 250 homes across the boroughs. For us, it is more than just these numbers. It's about the families. This month, we look forward to what will be a significant milestone for the program, moving our first homeowners back into the rebuilt homes. Our public building's uniform structures portfolio includes more than 125 projects valued at $2.27 billion and serves the departments of police, fire, correction, sanitation, transportation, and environmental protection, among others. I have to mention the 4,000 project to be completed by DDC, 
which is also the largest public building in New York City to achieve LEED Gold certification. This past December, we celebrated the ribbon cutting of the 730,000 square foot new police academy in Queens in the company of the inaugural graduating class of 2,000 recruits. Next, I would like to highlight the work we do for our clients within the city's cultural and library systems, our civic structures portfolio. There are 490 projects within this group, valued at more than $2 billion. Within this portfolio, I want to know a smaller yet significant project that we completed for Queens Public Library. It is the Ravenswood Universal Pre-Kindergarten UPK space. This project provided two new UPK classrooms within a NYCHA housing project. This project was fast-tracked to ensure that even though it only went into construction in July 2015, it, is complete, it was completed in time for the first day of school that fall. On Public Buildings Executive Unit completed some of our most significant projects. Large projects this year, including the Staten Island Ocean Breeze Athletic Center, which opened this, fall, this past fall. In collaboration with the Department of Parks and Recreation, this 135,000 square foot indoor track and field facility will host local and regional competitions while also promoting health. Our street infrastructure portfolio consists of more than 300 roadway, plaza, sewer, and water main projects valued at $5.6 billion. This portfolio includes our green infrastructure projects, which aim to divert stormwater from the combined sewer storm drain system. With an estimated construction value of more than $175 million, these 14 design contracts will cover more than 8,000 acres of the city's combined sewer drainage area. Also, currently in design, $1 billion will be invested in Southeast Queens over the next 10 years to upgrade and improve the drainage system in low-lying sections that have experienced frequent flooding. Turning to our projects that focus on meeting the goal set with Vision Zero to improve safety for all road users by redesigning curves and sidewalks, narrowing intersections to reduce crossing distances, and installing medians and pedestrian ramps, DDC is working closely with the Department of Transportation to implement the Great Streets program value at $339 million for a total of seven projects. Also, in partnership with DOT, we are constructing the infrastructure necessary to expand select bus services, to enhance services for users throughout the installation of high visibility stations and dedicated bus lanes. The 18 projects in this program are valued at approximately $334 million and will bring new levels of service to reduce travel time on major routes. Finally, I would like to address the focus our agency is placing on the urgent need for coastal protection. We are currently managing the design and environmental review contracts for the Breezy Point and Eastside Coastal Resiliency Projects. There is currently $335 million awarded by Housing Urban Development through Rebuild by Design for coastal protection on Manhattan's Lower East Side, and $50 million funded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency for the Breezy Point Coastal Resiliency Project. Concerning capital projects on non-city-owned property, the DDC continues to work with recipient organizations along with the Office Management and Budget Task Force to facilitate progress of this project through the various stages of approval. This fiscal year, 23 projects have already been registered. At present, we are working on a portfolio of about 200 projects with a total value of approximately $110 million. We continue to meet with recipient organizations, provide assistance, and answer their questions. Madam Chair, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you and your staff, as well as Speaker Melissa Mar Viverito and her team, Nathan Tooth and the Finance Division. I would also like to thank Mayor de Blasio and his legislative team, as well as Office of Management and Budget for the hard work, diligence, and guidance. That concludes my prepared remarks, and I'm happy to answer any question you and your colleagues may have. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner, I think that, and, and I'm going to ask specifically about timeline, and you and I have had conversations about this privately. I think it's appropriate to put it into, um, into testimony and get it in the record. Um, 
look, this is something that has been an issue maybe since the creation of DDC in 1997. And I understand that you've been the commissioner um, for two years. And to undo or to recreate something at an agency level can take time. So I, I want to say that first. However, um, it's incredibly frustrating for me and for my colleagues who bring these concerns to me that it is viewed upon as if city council capital projects are not a priority. And I know that you're not, you're, I know that you wouldn't say that they're not priority, but when they're juxtaposed to other things, it just seems very difficult for me to understand um, as the chair and also as someone who has experienced this. And, you know, an example of this is the East Elmhurst Library. I know we've been engaging in conversations. For years, this library has received funding from the council, from the administration, from several borough presidents, but for some reason, every year, DDC gives a re-estimate. I know you told me that you, you bid it out, the bids were high. It just seems that if this is happening in my district, it's happening in other council members' district, and all this is doing is guaranteeing that this project will only get more expensive. So as the head of this agency, someone who we want to partner together, how do, you, how do you mitigate this? Because we cannot continue in this process. It is discouraging, actually, for us to give our capital dollars to projects because it, doesn't, it often doesn't even happen within our term of being elected. So the point of the agency was to avoid exactly what we're going through. So can you explain to me what, what's the difference? What are you going to do differently besides, you know, what seems what's getting prioritized is the administration's priorities and not the council's priorities? Madam Chair, um, as you mentioned, we have had discussion, and, and I know that this is a frustrating topic to a lot of uh, council members and a lot of different um, stakeholders uh, um, that we work with. Um, I would like to say um, that we have been taking um, a lot of different measures um, to address these type of situations. Um, one of the measures that we are looking is to identify um, the different processes by which projects go through our agency. And I would like to clarify that we do not prioritize one project over the other. Um, uh, I think there is a misconception that we in the agency um, will say this project will give priority over this project. We don't actually do that. Um, we have different units. What do you do so that we understand? Because from this side, we don't know. So bring me clarity. Okay. Um, when a project is brought to us, it's brought by our client agency. Like, for example, if it is a library, it will be brought to us by one of the library systems, either the Brooklyn Public Library, the Queens Public Library, or the New York Public Library. And we actually have three different groups within our agency that is now working with each one of the libraries. It used to be one group that was the libraries. Now we have divided it so that we have the Queens and, and, and the Brooklyn and the New York Library because of the volume of work. So their projects come to those groups within our agency. Now, there is no that we say the Queens Public Library project gets higher priority than the New York Public Library. We do, do, do not do that. Now, within the clients, the clients work with us according to their priority and the funding available. And that's one of the challenges that we encounter, particularly with some clients, is that the scope and the budget available not necessarily match. Right, but in this case, and I, and I get that, if the number you stick to is the original number. In this case, in East Elmhurst, you've asked the age the, of the client or, you yeah. know, yeah. The, uh, in this case, Queen's Queen. Library. You're saying you guys are short, but it's only short because of the re-estimate. It's not short because of, I fully funded that. Yeah. So then now you turn around and say, well, it's going to cost us more money for the third time, mind you. Yeah. So I, I, it's just like this this horrible, vicious cycle of it's never going to be enough, and then a, a, a library or an ex, an, a new wing, which should be adding a reading room, is going to cost $12 million. 
Uh, and I, I understand that frustration, and I will tell you that there is a lot of factors that go into that, and it's not that we just re-estimate because we would like to re-estimate. Um, the re-estimation comes because the scope has changed, um, the different regulations have changed, like from the time that we receive the scope, there may be building codes changes and we need to adapt it. There may be laws that the city council have imposed that we actually have to incorporate and make sure that our design meets those laws and those actually trigger certain estimates. So within the scope, as well as in some cases it comes, for example, the market. There is something uh, different that we will have, for example, if you are trying to bid a project in the 2009 time period and something that you're trying to bid at this time. Because right now, for example, the market is very hot. There is a lot of construction both in the private and the public sector. So the, you the, said 2009? That was seven years ago. Yeah, but what I wanted to tell you is that at different times, the market may be different. And when, when you have a market that is slow, the prices can be a little bit more stagnant. Because so people, wouldn't you, Commissioner, agree that maybe we need to get things built closer to whatever the market quote is? I mean, if we would have built this within two years, we would have been... We, we, what's the pro Okay, let's take it back another step. Yeah. How long does it take to build, on average, a project that you know, like a library expansion. Not a new library, because I know that that's a whole new yeah. other company, but a, a library expansion. From the time that we receive the CPI, if the funding is in place and right. we don't have any problem with funding, can actually be taking uh, between uh, two to four years. Two to four years. It depending on the size of the project and it depends. It seems like that's not the reality on average. In my case, it's seven years, and it's not even close to being built. That will be with all the issues, and that's when we start looking at the funding situation that, for example, there's not enough funding, and we have to go back, and the projects go on hold, and we have to actually get. Um, sometimes getting funding can take up to a year, particularly, and let me explain a little bit, and, and, and again, when we actually go and do a new estimate and we decide that there is more money that need to be put into a project, particularly if it is a funded project by the city council, we have to wait the whole budget cycle sometimes to get the money. So that can bring the delay of the project. So a lot of times when we see the delays and actually have looked directly into some of these projects because I have been asking the same type of question, why is taking? And when I say two to four years is what we will say a project without any funding problem and the scope well defined. That's what it will take normally. Um, we find that the funding and the scope changes is one of the ones that triggers this delay that can go year after year. And I agree that once we start delaying the project, getting the funding, it goes into a spiral in which we now need to go into longer time and that can increase the cost, particularly in a market like this. I would like to work with your committee to figure yeah. out how many of those projects are in this spiral. Okay. Because when I speak to the members here and they ask me, Jalissa, yes. you have oversight of DDC. Yes. What is going on? And they all have different projects. I think yes. we need to get an accurate yes. picture yes. of how many of these do we have in a cycle, yes. in this vicious cycle yes. of you know, non-efficiency, yes. um, and then we can figure out how we can a approach I, this. I, I and these are the same act questions that I asked OMB, because I think OMB is probably another challenge in this process, because they're asking you. So I got to believe that they're asking you for, you know, what's the status on, on these yeah. budget dollars. I will welcome this type of analysis, because I, I, you will find that um, we go into a, a cycle of funding that delays, that uh, creates challenges for some of the projects. So I would love to work with you on this, and, and it really is incredibly frustrating. And I think it actually leaves a bad taste or gives yes. the agency a bad reputation yes. because, you know, members want to be able to go to their districts and say, I funded this improvement in my district. You may see it in 10 years. It's not what we want no, to say, I, right? I and it's understand. not what people expect. I, I do so, with that being said, I want to talk about the NYPD project, the district attorney's office, and um, the STEAM, which I'm really excited about, new need. And then we're going to hear from Council Member Rosenthal. Yes. Um, so the NYPD project, NYPD's preliminary capital plan includes $72.2 in planned commitments for the construction of the new 
40th Precinct. Mm -hmm. What is the status of the design and estimated timeline for the 40th Precinct? At the police department, there has been discussion about how to improve police facilities to include more community space. Where are you in that engagement uh, or the current design plans? And also, the department has had several other precincts in line for renovations or rehabilitation, such as Brooklyn North Narcotics and the Old Police Academy. What is the status of those renovations? Okay. Um, the Forest Princeton is one of our uh, projects that we have right now in design. It is uh, ready go to go to the uh, Public Design Commission. Um, we expect that the design will be completed by the end of this summer uh, with all the approvals that are required. We are going to issue, um, or put it out for bid in the fall of this year, of 2016, and we hope that the contract will be, uh, the construction be able to start sometime in the spring of 2017. This is okay. the schedule that we have for the 40th Princeton. Um, one of the um, uh, kind of an interesting feature of the design of the 40th is that um, um, when we were working on the design, uh, the notion on how to increase the collaboration or the interaction of the police with the community um, came the, the thought on how to embed that into the physical environment of the police prison. And in this particular design, there is a notion to create um, what is called a community um, kind of room or a community space in which the community and the police can meet and it become a kind of a neutral and, and a place for them. Um, right now, we are in the process of value engineering, which is one of the major components of our process, and this particular space is also being in the discussion for that. So that's one of the components for the forest Prince. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the question that you follow on the um, All Police Academy, um, we have a limited scope on that particular project, and we are doing some emergency repairs uh, of the building facade. And for the Brooklyn North um, Narcotics, I think that was your other question. Yes. Uh, we have in DDC uh, starting a new design project um, for some time this spring, uh, this spring and the early of uh, summer, we're going to start a new design project. So those are two one of the new projects that are coming uh, to us. So I wanted to pivot to the district attorney's office. Yes. Um, as has been mentioned in many budget hearings here, but also by district attorneys, is that city prosecutors have a challenge with infrastructure of the actual courthouses. Are you aware of any of the capital requests made by their offices? And if so, what is your assessment of the needs? Are there any barriers that exist to prevent capital improvements to the courthouses? Um, the way that we work um, is through our client agencies and the DA's offices and the courts have to go through DCAS. So DCAS is the one that works with them identifying the scope and actually setting up the project or what we call the CPI um, to send it to us. Uh, so Has yeah, DCAS done that yet or no? Yeah, they have done some of okay. that, that work with the DA's office and as well as some of the courts, and that's how we start the process. Um, for example, we know that we have started some work um, for the Queen's DA in some of the facade uh, for some masonry work based on those requests. And I will say that in order to identify the challenges that they have, I think the CAS is the one that really worked with them on identifying um, on what are the processes and how to work and bringing it to us. So the CAS will be one of the agencies that can better explain okay. those so challenges. Okay, so we'll follow up with the CAS because I don't think the prosecutors are worried about the facade. I don't think that's what they were complaining about. Okay. It's this probably more internal. So we'll follow up with DCAS. Yeah. Let me ask Christine Flaherty, our Associate Commissioner, to... Thank you. If you can just state your Sir. name. Sir. Christine Flaherty, Associate Commissioner. Excuse me. Building. Where are you in? <laughs> Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. <laughs> So we have a dedicated unit in the public buildings unit associated with all the courts programs and DA space and we'd be happy to uh, go through specific projects that are of concern to any of the council members or representatives. Uh, we work collaboratively with DCAS. They're our client agency that sends the projects to us. Okay. And so we're happy to hear about any other concerns. I know that there is an office space that we're also working on for right. and we're completing up design this year for, but if there's a specific project, we're happy to hear more information about that. Now, from your experience in working with the courts, have, 
Have any of the courts presented a challenge for renovations or improvements? There's intrinsically a challenge associated with working in any existing building, whether it be a court building, a library. Uh, we run the risk of running, in, running into unknown conditions, conditions that you can't see because it's physically behind a wall or in a chase. Um, we do the best to plan for those risks uh, in our schedules, but you know it's always a challenge that we're going to face. Uh, working specifically in a court facility, you have many stakeholders and constituents, and they have to keep the building running right. typically. And so we really have to work closely with them, collaboratively with them, and, and work around that operation, recognizing that we have to be sensitive to noise and dust, and often we have to work at night. And so those those projects tend to run much longer than any typical new construction job on an empty site. They're right. very complicated and you can run into so many unforeseen conditions in addition to working closely with the operation that has to consistently move forward. Right. That makes sense. Thank you very much. Um, my last question before we open it up to my colleagues. We've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez and Rosenthal. Um, Steve, I know this is something that you have worked really hard on. You've done an amazing job. You've engaged with young people like no other commissioner has. You have an incredible team that comes out and works with the young people. I can speak firsthand to this amazing program. I actually want to make sure that DYCD supports you more so in making sure that our young people are actually placed in the program and paid um, because it's really about building career opportunities. Um, but I know that you have a new need, so I just wanted you to walk me through. Last year, D DDC added 400000 in baseline funding to support six full-time positions. In fiscal 2017, DDC added an additional 274000 in baseline funding for OTPS costs, bringing the total funding for the initiative to 674000 Since this is a relatively brand new initiative, can you report how it's going so far? I guess this is your moment to show pride and you know I know how great it's going and I can attest to it but can you speak about the program and can you elaborate on what the new OTPS funding is for and do you anticipate the need for additional funding in the future? Um, the STEAM initiative is actually um, exceeding um, the expectations that we had when we first started in November 2014. Um, it has been incredibly uh, welcome uh, across the different groups and the, the youngsters that we have been working um, have uh, in, uh, flourished within the program. Um, we have impacted directly over 380 children um, in different boroughs in the city and um, we have interacted with over 70 schools in the middle school and the graduate and, and high school as well as colleges and we have hosted 30 high school interns in our school because that's also an, another part of the team. Not only the middle school program in which we go to the school and do the after school program, which we have created this young engineers program. And I would like to say that we have some very preliminary data that working with our uh, sister agency, DOE, the Department of Education, uh, they have been tracking some of the students that we have been working in the um, uh, after school program and seeing their performance compared to their peers, the students that have gone through our program versus the students that have not gone, working with the same teacher, and they have seen some incredible improvement in the performance in the test after being in our program, particularly in math and science. So it's very encouraging, and we look forward to continue working on this. So um, our hypothesis is, is, is showing that it is proven in terms of not only the enthusiastic enthusiasm that we are seeing in the kids, but also the results that we are actually watching uh, on the kids, kids progressing. And, and also, part of the STEAM program is to create and build a pipeline to our own workforce. We wanted to diversify our workforce, and we have been very fortunate now to say that we have hired nine interns, and these are full-time positions from our college aid position, uh, college um, uh, internship position that we have, and we have actually hired 36 college aides from our uh, students that were in our high school program and start doing uh, college uh, here in New York City. So uh, the program is doing incredibly well, and I have to thank the leadership of uh, Deputy Commissioner Lee Jambelis for what she has been doing with the program and, and how well 
is doing uh, for the youth in, in New York. And in terms of the new um, uh, needs that we requested, these are for increased program instructor for training, equipment, transportation, and supplies. Because uh, the first uh, year that we were doing it was the first year we were trying to do very compact. But now that we have the program, even though we are trying to leverage, and we do leverage the resources of our sister agency, DYCD, DOE, there are certain things that we need to actually be able to fund by ourselves, and this funding will allow us to do that. Well, again, Commissioner, I can't um, sing your praises more when it comes to this program. I'm very excited to hear that you're already placing, so it's actually a jobs program. Um, because That's you're able to hire. Yeah. Um, have you engaged at all with the DYCD commissioner on um, figuring out other ways that perhaps you know, we have this summer youth employment year round, but we're hoping will be a universal youth employment program. Um, oftentimes, what the commissioner has said is that they have a problem placing young people. It seems like there could be some synergies within your agency. Um, for the summer program, actually, our high school program, we work with EYCD, and they are the one that actually pays the students to work in our place. So we, they place their students or their um, uh, students in our uh, uh, institution. And for the year round, we are now in conversations with them to uh, use our agency as one of their sites. Um, but we are now in early conversation of that. Great. And can you just? Um, uh Spell out your acronym for STEAM, just for the yeah. record. Science, technology, engineering, um, <laughs> architecture, and arts, and math. STEAM, science, technology, engineering, architecture, arts, and math. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Council Member Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Rodriguez. Council members, I'm going to put you on a five-minute clock because we have two more agencies to hear from. No problem. You can keep it three. Oh, three. Commissioner, good to see you. I'm asking about um, MWBE contracts. I had a meeting with um, a group of um, MWBE contractors, and they said something very interesting about your agency that's unlike other agencies where you guys um, break some of your, some group of your construction contracts into micro, small, medium, and large, and it allows them to win, more likely win um, a contract. I'm, I'm wondering if you could just tell me a little bit more about that, but with an eye toward, do you think this at, uh, what does it require for you to do that, and does it end up at the end of the day costing the city more money to have to break it out into those categories. And secondly, can you, do you have a view of before doing that and after doing that and how your number of MWB contractors changed? Um, thank you, uh, Council Member. Um, we actually created this new uh, structure based on the feedback that we received from the MWB community, and also not only the MWB community, but also the small business community that we actually interacted uh, significantly. And what we hear is that sometimes it's very difficult for them to compete when we have uh, such large contracts, because our contracts can be quite big, and they may not be able to have the, the resources of the experience or the um, amount of uh, backing that are required. For you had me at hello, but I only have yeah. one minute and okay. 20 seconds. Yeah. Has it been uh, financially more costly to the city? Uh, we, and what's been the change in the number of MWB we, contractees? We, we do not believe that it's going to be uh, more costly to the city. And we now it's too early to tell, but however, based on the, in the, in the information that we have, uh, we feel that we are going to increase the significantly the number of NWBs. And are you keeping track of this information in some way? Are you monitoring yes. it internally? Could you share that information with the council? Yes. And okay. could you update us on a, you know, every six months basis? Yes, we can do that. Okay. I'd love to meet with you separately about that yes. um, with the MWB hat on. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you. All yours. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you, Hi, Commissioner. Uh, my question is uh, connected to what Council Member Rosenthal uh, started elaborating, but for me it's all about how uh, can you 
describe the agency performance uh, providing opportunity for women and minorities? Um, I will say that last year we actually had a, a banner year on our performance with NWBE. Uh, we uh, awarded $164.7 million in prime contracts and 26.3 in subcontracts to NWBEs. That represented 22% increase over the prior year. Uh, in addition, that amount represented 42% of the city's prime awards to NWBE and 35% of the city's subcontractors award to WNBE. Uh, and so that is a significant improvement. Um, of course, there is more work to do, and we will continue to do, and this is one of the ideas that we are trying, how to break down some of our contracts to increase the opportunity and to level the playing field for all these uh, MWBEs and small businesses. Great. And my second question is about those women in minority that got the opportunity to start those businesses or to expand their business. We also hear from some of them that they reach a point where if they keep growing, they are not seen as a woman in minority. They have some challenges. And I think as a city, definitely, you know, we will always have the five, four or five big construction company and, and we good luck, you know, to anyone that is doing well especially the big shop in the city, but what about the middle one? You know, how, what is the plan that the city has to say, if we work, started working with these 20 or 25 women in minority and they started with $10 million, now they grow up to 200, still they should have opportunity because they are not competing at the top level. They are, yes, at the middle level. So. This is something that I heard from a number of those. What are the challenges that we face and how, they, how can the city readjust in order to keep supporting those women in minority that they are not doing so bad, that they are making progress, but now instead of creating 100 jobs, probably they can create 300. And now they are in the situation when they face challenges in order to get the support they need. Um, we actually... Um that's why we created these different categories in terms of micro, small, medium, and large, because we also found that there is this middle level of companies that need, still need to be able to compete among the like uh, companies. So we have created that category. In addition to that, we participating with the SBS in what is called the capacity jumpers, in able to support companies that are doing well, but they can go to the next level. So we are very sensitive to that notion that we have to continue to provide opportunities to all the firms uh, to continue to support them. And we are working with, under the leadership of our chief diversity officer, um, Maggie Austin, Magali Austin, in supporting all the different firms at all the different levels so that they can compete and be able to support the city's growth uh, in all the different uh, elements. Thank you for services, and we are very grateful to have you, to have us in, at the DDC. We know that we can, you can with a lot of expertise in your field, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member Johnson. Oh, Council Member Johnson. Sorry. It's okay. Hi, Commissioner. Hi. Um, thank you for being here. I apologize that I wasn't here for your testimony. I was watching downstairs on the TV while the meeting was going on. I wanted to ask about a few things. I wanted to see if I could get an update from uh, one of your colleagues on the uh, ga proposed Gamza Board Marine uh, Transfer Station and what the timeline was on that. Okay, I will pass it on to Christine. Sure, good afternoon. Good to see you. We had a great meeting with the community uh, representative Friday. last Friday, yeah. at, and we met at the Whitney, and we can share that PowerPoint with you. It had all the information about the specific timeline for the um, demolition and deconstruction of the site. Uh, there are some uh, next steps with sanitation and the MOU with the state prior to having a timeline for the recycling center itself but we did share the timeline for demolition, which is happening over the next few years, and we can give you the exact dates. Do you don't know them now when demolition would actually begin? Oh, demolition is underway. We've okay, when do you think demolition structures. will be complete? So next, let me give you the exact date. It's next year, 
at some point by the end of next year. Okay. We have the large building there has a tremendous amount of abatement that we have to do. Yes. Items to move out of that building before we could really start that building. That's the, the long lead item as well as the large structure that's right over the water. On the okay. Beach. The culture shed at Hudson Yards, uh, is DDC doing that or we're is related doing it? Yeah, we're not a managing agency there. We're a pass through to um, the construction manager that's being hired directly by the private entities that have most of the money in that. Uh, we can provide you an update. Yeah, my understanding is I think the end of 2018 is likely sounds, the time frame. It sounds likely. We'll come okay. back with you. And then, Commissioner, you have been so helpful uh, in dealing with my pestering emails and phone calls related to never, the, never, the, never che pestering. the Chelsea STD clinic. Um, and I know that you've made a pretty significant effort to try to expedite the timeline on that. Uh, I think the timeline that we're looking at now is potentially September of next year. 2017. 2017, Correct. which is far too long. I know, I know. Far we're too working, long. We're working, we're working, and um, I can tell you that we are diligently identifying ways that we can expedite it, but as of now, we can only commit to September 2017. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, there is a significant amount of work that's been being done in the Times Square area, um, the construction in Times Square. Uh, there's been some, I believe, uh, DEP-related work related to the pipes, as well as on 9th Avenue, 10th Avenue, 8th Avenue, and the whole Health Kitchen area. I know a lot of that work was third water tunnel work. It's been going on for over four years now. I'm told that it's ahead of schedule and under budget. I don't know if I should believe that, um, but I'm wondering, for the third water tunnel work related to Times Square and Hell's Kitchen, when can we expect that to be complete? I would like to ask uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Eric McFarland to answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Ed, you can wait so she can swear you in. Yeah. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Uh, my name is Eric McFarland, Deputy Commissioner for Infrastructure. So uh, uh, on 9th Avenue, uh, basically the water tunnel uh, work is, is substantially completed. What happened though is that we, we uh, between, uh, what we have done is that we have put four different contracts together to actually have this huge contract to, to, to deal with this uh, issue on 9th Avenue. But now in between the, the contracts, uh, we discovered uh, that we had uh, distribution uh, pipes, which is like uh, 12 inches, but actually bring the water to the housing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, 1800, they were old. So uh, that was added to this contract. So that's why we actually do, that's what we do in the process of doing right now. To actually, uh, there was no point in, in finish the job and leave those old pipe in the ground. So, but that was an additional work that we put on the contract. So when do you think it's gonna be complete? Uh, we basically, I think that there's about, uh, at least uh, another year left on this. A year left for, for just Ninth Avenue or for the whole for, health for, kitchen to, area? To actually complete the, uh, the, that's the, the additional water main that we have to do. And, and basically the water town work is, is practically done. Okay. So, Commissioner, you've been so helpful and responsive whenever I reached out to you. And I believe about a year and a half ago we sat down with your, with your staff here and we went over the multitude of DDC managed projects in the district. Uh, and I have, I think when we added up the total, it was over a billion dollars in DDC managed uh, construction projects. I would love the opportunity in the next few months while the budget is still going on to sit down and have that conversation again to actually understand the exact timelines on uh, Chelsea, Culture Shed, Gansevoort, Third Water Tunnel, uh, parks that, that DDC is involved in, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I would love that opportunity. De definitely, we will arrange with your office. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Commissioner, for coming to testify today. We have several questions that we'd like to follow up with you, so if you can get them back to us um, before our budget response, we would greatly appreciate it. Definitely, we will. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. Madam Thank you. Um, we are going to immediately call up the next agency, IBO. <laughs>
maybe one. Good afternoon and welcome to, to, to the first day of the Council's preliminary budget hearing. My name is Julissa Ferreras Copeland and I chair the Finance Committee. So far we have heard from OMB, the Department of Finance and the Department of Design and Construction. We will now hear testimony from Ron, Ronnie Lowenstein, the Director of the Independent Budget Office. You may begin. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. I know you've had a long day. Um, you've got the overview of our report in front of you. Uh, so um, you're not going to hear a lengthy statement from me. Instead, I'll do a few highlights of the report. And over the next few weeks, we'll be releasing issues briefs on specific issues within the preliminary budget uh, before the relevant hearings to help out with the process. Uh, to start with the bottom line, based upon the contours of the administration's preliminary budget plan and our latest forecast of revenues and expenditures, we expect this fiscal year to end with a surplus of $2.5 billion, which is about $200 million more than forecast by OMB. And unlike OMB, which is just seeing next year as being in balance, we're now anticipating a modest surplus of $500 million next year as well. Um, although we're now forecasting gaps for fiscal years 18 through 20, um, we think that those gaps are of a manageable size. Um, it's $1.8 billion in 18, and gaps of $2 billion and $1.2 billion in 19 and 20. Uh, the thing to know about them is that um, they're no more than 3% of city-generated revenues. Um, and, you know, generally we would describe them as manageable. They're also smaller than the gaps being forecast by OMB, by about half a billion dollars in 18, rising to about one and a half billion in 20. The differences between our forecast and OMB's stem primarily from our economics and revenue forecast, but from our spending forecast as well. Turning to the economics forecast, um, we're expecting that the expansion that we've been enjoying for quite some time now is going to continue to motor on. It's not, the U.S. economy isn't growing at a fast rate, but we do expect it will continue to grow. Um, and that's despite the fact that this particular expansion is looking a little old, and it is older than average, and that's despite the fact that there's been turmoil in the stock markets, and in particular the bear market. Um, but we don't think that either of those things by themselves are sufficient to lead to a downturn. Um, we have modeled uh, a possible recession scenario, and we were really glad to see that you folks used it in the, in the council work. I'd be happy to talk to you, speak to that and talk more about it if you think it would be helpful. Um, turning to the city's forecast, um, we expect that the very strong job growth that we've seen over the last few years is going to abate. I mean, two years ago, the city added a record 121,000 jobs. Uh, last year, we topped out at about 100,000 jobs. Uh, there was strong growth several years before all of that but we really expect that it's slowing down. Um, and for the current year, we're expecting, the current calendar year, we're expecting growth of about 77,000 jobs. It's still very healthy growth, but not the record sort of growth that we've been enjoying. Um, as in recent year, oh, and then looking forward to for the rest of the forecast, we're expecting job growth to average about 50,000 jobs a year for the remainder of the plan. Um, as in recent years, we're expecting professional and business services and health to really be the driver of job growth um, and actually account for about half the jobs that are added uh, through the end of the forecast period. Based upon that economics forecast, that it's a continued U.S. expansion and a somewhat slower local expansion, um, we expect that tax revenues for the upcoming fiscal year uh, to rise nearly $2 billion and reach $55 billion for the year. That's about $600 million more than is forecast by the administration and just about $200 million more than is forecast by the council. Uh, and for the entire forecast period, we're expecting tax revenues to grow an average of 4.5% and total $63 billion in, in 2020. Uh, I think it's worth taking a moment to note that the differences between the IBO and Council 
tax forecasts are very, very small. I, I think uh, other than the last year of the forecast period, the differences are less than one half of 1% a year, which is the first time we've seen anything like this before, which I guess means that we're both right. Um, now, of the $2 billion in tax revenue growth we're forecasting uh, for next year, um, more than three quarters of it is coming from the property tax. And that's driven by a combination of past assessment growth that's now being phased in, as well as our expectation that market values are going to continue to rise. By 2020, we expect that the property tax will account for an extraordinary 46% of all tax revenues, which is just slightly higher than the biggest share that we've seen since 1981 when the system was put in place. Turning really quickly to spending, there are several areas where we feel that spending will actually exceed what the administration projects. The biggest shortfall is in education, where we expect spending for next year will be $200 million more. Um, once again, the city has underestimated the number of charter school students, um, and this is students in schools that are already up and operating, but gradually adding grades to you know, get their full complement of grades. Um, and once again, I think the city has overestimated Medicaid reimbursements uh, for services provided to special ed students. And I think the problems with the system are, are well known and continuing. Uh, we think that they're going to, administration is going to need 100 million more to deal with the homeless question. In 17, they've added more money for this year, but not for next year. We think there'll be more families and single adults in the shelters, uh, fewer of them leaving due to the rental programs. And as almost always, uh, more money is going to be needed for overtime. To wrap up, uh, the city's fiscal condition remains strong. The city has built up remarkable reserves, and I think you know the council and the administration sh should be commended for that. But those reserves are still not sufficient to weather it, to weather the entire an entire downturn. Um, and I think that brings up an important question about the role of reserves. Um, based upon the model we put together, even for a modest downturn, um, there were sufficient current reserves to get you through the first, if, if a downturn had started like the beginning of this year, calendar year, the reserves would have gotten you through the remainder of this fiscal year and next fiscal year. Um, but after that, no. And you still would have been seeing deficits gaps on the order of four plus billion dollars a year. But that does give you sufficient time to find the ways to cut spending or raise taxes to get your fiscal house in order. It's hard to envision a level of reserves that would allow you to weather even a modest downturn in its entirety. And the last I want, idea I wanted to leave you with was at the same time, I think there are real concerns about the extent to which we can continue to build up reserves, because as they sit there, um, they look remarkably tempting. And the recent proposals by the governor uh, to have the city assume more of Medicaid spending, more of CUNY spending, we could go down the entire list, um, I think really you know, have to make you question the extent to which we can put more into reserves. Thank you, and I welcome your question. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, your reports are integral to a lot of our preparing for our hearing, and from the finance division's perspective, very much appreciated. Um, you, I wanted to just touch upon a couple of things. When you talked about the professional and business services and how this is going to be the growing, um, I guess what I want to say is we have projected that the growth in this industry actually reduces uh, year to year. So can you explain to me how yeah. you see it as a growth? And uh, George can correct me if I'm wrong. It's still growing, but it's not growing as fast as it has been in the last few years. Okay. Since our total increase in employment that we're projecting is smaller, we're getting fewer jobs out of professional and business services, but it along with healthcare services are still going to give us about half the jobs that we're adding. Now, you testified, I believe, to 46% of our tax base is property taxes. Yeah. About. 
Um, do you think that that's a flag? Um, because in other municipalities or in other uh, states, when property tax is, is so high, should we consider that a flag um, as part of it being such a high percentage of our base? Or are we fine? Is this something that... I, I mean, there are a lot of value judgments that go into that, but we're a, a municipality. Right. And the property tax is the quintessential municipal tax. So there are a lot of cities and towns and whatevers that rely far more heavily on property taxes than the city of New York. Okay. So just the fact that it's more than it was before doesn't necessarily mean in and of itself that that's a problem. I think there are lots of other problems with the property tax. Um, and we agree with you. Right. <laughs> um, but the fact that it's a certain percentage of total revenues in and of itself is not a flag. Would so, you like to add anything? So, uh, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's fake. <laughs> okay. There's no chair there. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad you figured it out now. Um, during the first seven months of fiscal 2016, total business tax collection have fallen from 1.2% below the same time a year ago. Um, which economic factors may be reducing the profits of the payers of the general corporation tax and the unincorporated tax, and how much of the fall in general corporation tax collections may be due to timing as the new reforms are phasing in? Um, I, I can't give you a, a precise percentage, but I, I do think that the, um, you know, it, it, it makes sense to, to, to think that a significant part of the decline that, that's observed <clears throat> stems from issues about timing, about uh, the transition to the new system. There are um, you know, taxpayers that are having to shift from the bank tax to the, to the general corporation tax. Um, the city actually still only has a tentative version of the tax form up on the website, or at least that was true a week ago. They may have updated it <laughs> since. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing heads saying that they've not updated. So, you know, they've, they've issued instructions to taxpayers to just pay on extension and don't uh, settle up your final returns. That has to have some impact on um, the, the, the pace of collections. I can't tell you exactly how much, but it just makes it would make sense that it would. In terms of uh, some of the other major sectors of the city, um, you know, our, our forecast on uh, profits in uh, on Wall Street, uh, you know, are, they are not changed significantly from last year. So, you know, that, that wouldn't you wouldn't think that that would therefore account for a, a major decline. Um, you know, in general, things are slowing down a little bit, uh, but at least part of it has to, has, it's quite likely it has something to do with the processing. Thank you very much. Council Member Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, nice to see you all. I enjoy seeing you on Inside City Hall talking about the budget. Uh, so it's good to <laughs> see you in person. So in, in this um, uh, overview for the fiscal plan through 2020, you uh, mentioned in passing what, what uh, Director Fullahan had talked about this morning related to the $337 million owed to the city uh, by the, was the Health and Hospitals Corporation, uh, now it's NYC Health and Hospitals. Uh, and, and you also mentioned that the city, even on top of that $337 million, which is being forgiven, is maintaining the $204 million uh, payment uh, that's given to support uh, what was previously known as HHC. Um, we know that in the next many years, uh, and it's going to get really bad in 2019 and 2020, that because of the Affordable Care Act, the, the disproportionate uh, share payments from the federal government are going to steadily, steadily decline. And I was wondering, besides the sort of the factoid that you put in there, does the IBO have any recommendations to the city uh, related to our public hospital system and what should be looked at for stabilizing its finances? Uh, well, 
I don't want to sound weaselly, but we don't make recommendations. Um, certainly, we're concerned about the situation, and can I say we've got work? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got work on the issue. Uh, even just to grasp the order of magnitude of the problem has been difficult. They don't budget on the same way we budget, um, and um, yeah. And given that the entire healthcare universe around them is changing, uh, it's been very hard to pin down. And the $337 million is actually, when it comes to, if you, can, if you put it on the ledger under new spending, it ends up being one of the more sizable items in the preliminary budget. Is that correct? Newly introduced, yes. Yeah, newly introduced. Okay. Um, and, and you also talked about the, the, the um, after school, the, the summer jobs program, uh, which the council has uh, made a priority, and the estimate from the IBO to have it be a year-round program is, what's the cost? Do you remember off the top of your head? You I don't recall it off the top of my head. I believe we basically took the number that the council's been using. So. $160 million. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. We greatly appreciate it, and we continue to work with you and your amazing reports. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Um, we will now call, I hope the controller is near. Okay, any minute. So we will take a two-minute break while we transition documents, and we will be joined by the controller.
Oh, good afternoon, and welcome to the first day of, of Council preliminary budget hearings. While it doesn't feel like the first day by this time of the day, my name is Julissa Ferreras Copeland, and I chair the Finance Committee. So far, we have heard from OMB, the Department of Finance, the Department of Design and Construction, and the Independent Budget Office. We will now hear testimony from the New York City Comptroller, Scott Stringer, once he is sworn in by my council. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement. Right hand. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I swear. All right. Let me just reread it first, though. <laughs> well, I, I want to thank uh, Chair Ferraris for allowing me to come here today and for every year patiently listening and analyzing all the presenters and uh, even though it may be lonely there at the moment, I know you represent the entire council. And I also want to shout out Corey Johnson, who we let go, but uh, he did try to come. So uh, I want to say thank you. It's great to be here, and I do welcome the opportunity to address you today with the controller's, controller's analysis of the FY17 preliminary budget. And joining me is my deputy controller for budget, Tim Mulligan. And our testimony is going to focus on a couple of areas. We're going to talk about the state of the city's economy, the preliminary budget, homeless service spending, risks and offsets to the city budget, and the city's fiscal cushion. And first, I want to start with the uh, state of the economy. New York City has benefited from six straight years of slow but steady economic recovery, finishing 2015 with a 3.4 percent growth. Our economy is growing at a slower rate than in previous expansion periods, but we have added 525,000 private sector jobs since 2009. Those payrolls now exceed the city's previous peak by more than 13 percent. Across the five boroughs, unemployment rates are the lowest they've been since the last recession, since before the recession. So more New Yorkers are employed today than ever before, but not everyone is feeling our economic growth in their wallets. During the current expansion, only 23 percent of new jobs have been in high-wage industries, while 57 percent have been in low-wage industries. And wage rates have not kept pace with inflation for our lowest paid workers. In fact, from 2009 to 2014, real wages in low-paying industries, which averaged 41,000 per year, fell 3.2 percent. For these New Yorkers, the city is becoming less and less affordable. And that is why we need to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour, so we can ensure every New Yorker has a fair chance to make it in this city. On a broader scale, risks to the U.S. economy have grown in recent months due primarily to the economic turmoil in China and the strong dollar. Yet my office still anticipates that 2016 will mark the seventh year of the current expansion. As always, we will closely monitor factors impacting the city's economic outlook. A significant change in our economic trajectory would have an impact on city tax collections because the financial plan assumes continued modest economic growth. Over the financial plan period, the city projects the total tax revenues will grow by 3.9 percent per year to $62 billion in FY 2020. The city has recognized $1.1 billion in additional tax revenues since the budget was adopted, largely from the personal income tax and the real estate-related taxes. These additional revenues help fund a large increase in expenditures from new needs plus the welcome cost of our retirees living longer. I commend the city for supporting the actuary's improved mortality assumptions and the need for greater transparency. Now, turning to the expenditure side of the 27 budget, I want to first commend the mayor for proposing new funding for several key initiatives, a $15 wage for all city employees and social service contract workers, better preparing our students for college, expanding access to mental health services, and funding 15,000 units of supportive housing. These are all critical priorities, and I commend the administration for putting these plans forward. Now, I want to give you an overview of expenditure trends in the financial plan. So after adjusting for reserves, prepayments, and other prior year actions, expenditures are projected to grow steadily from $83 billion in FY 2016 to $91.5 billion in FY 2020, average growth of 2.4 percent. 
Debt service and health insurance are projected to grow the fastest at 8% and 7% respectively. However, actual growth may be slower as <coughs> interest rates and health care insurance premiums are lower than projected. Slower growing expenditures include Medicaid, public assistance, and to a lesser extent, pensions. Strong market returns in the last few years have helped reduce projected growth in pensions to 2% annually. But I have to say, if the current turmoil in the financial markets continue, this pattern could easily change. The city's projections assume the markets will return the actuarial interest rate of 7%, meaning weaker returns would require higher contributions. But our investment returns have only exceeded 7% twice in the last four years. So I want to return to a recent analysis from my office on homeless, serving, uh, homeless services spending, because I think this is a very critical part of our budget. The budget of the Department of Homeless Services indicates that the city is projected to spend $1.3 billion this fiscal year, but that's not the whole story. Two other agencies, the Human Resources Administration and the Department of Youth and Community Development, also play key roles in serving our homeless population. Adding up spending on homeless services at all three agencies, the city is going to spend $1.7 billion on shelter operations and homeless programs this year. Now, remarkably, Madam Chair, this figure has grown 46% since 2014. Much of the increase comes from a 216% growth in spending on prevention, diversion, anti-eviction, and aftercare payments. We need to cover the necessary costs to address our homelessness crisis, but we have to track the results of that spending. For $1.7 billion each year, our shelters should not be rife with violations and substandard living conditions. We need to ensure that every dollar is used efficiently and effectively to serve the 58,000 men, women, and children who sleep in our shelters every night. Every New Yorker deserves a safe and clean place to call home. So now I'd like to discuss our assessment of the city's revenue and spending assumptions. For the first time, my office is showing out-year budget gaps that are larger than the administration projects. While we see additional tax revenues through the plan, they are most substantial in the first few years. In 2016, my office projects $456 million in additional tax revenues from higher growth in the personal income tax, business taxes, real estate related taxes, and sales tax revenues. In 2017, our higher forecast is driven by projected 1.5% growth in the personal income tax compared to the city's assumption of flat growth. Throughout the financial plan, we believe property taxes and sales taxes will be moderately higher than the city's forecast. But revenue from business taxes and real estate related taxes in FY 2018 through FY 2020, we believe they will be less than the city expects. We also believe the city is unlikely to realize the taxi medallion sales assumed in the financial plan. Given the disruption in the yellow taxi industry from four higher car services, these sales worth a total of $731 million are unlikely to occur over the period of the plan. If you agree with me, then you can't put in $450 million to $300 million. You either got to put it in or take it out. But I don't see us doing a medallion sale anytime soon. But our largest identified risk is the New York City health and hospitals. The city's public health hospital system is required to reimburse the city for debt service, medical malpractice claims, and fringe benefits costs incurred in the, on the system's behalf. But NYC Health and Hospitals has only made the full payment once in the last four years. Our office also identified risks from overtime, federal Medicaid reimbursement for special education services, universal pre-K public assistance, and adult homeless shelters. Together, our revenue expense re-estimates result in nearly $600 million in additional revenue for FY 2016. We are projecting, however, larger gaps in the administration in the remaining years of the plan. So starting with $200 million in FY 2017, then $2.7 billion in FY 2018, and we project $3.8 billion in both 2019 and 2020. I also want to caution that these gaps could grow depending on what happens in Albany. When I presented my testimony along with Mayor de Blasio on the state budget, 
I have to say it was clear that many of these upstate legislators didn't get it. They actually think New York City is their personal piggy bank. And I think it's important through this testimony of yours that we set the record straight. The city is facing real budgetary challenges. And as we know all too well from recent history, our economic path can turn very down quickly or downward quickly. Right now, we simply cannot afford major cost shifts from the state to the city. Our growing out your budget gaps reinforce the need for prudent fiscal management. So I want to just briefly mention two important strategies that can readily prepare us for a potential downturn. First, I am pleased as controller that the mayor included a plan to make our agencies more efficient. The total saving plan from the citywide program in the January financial plan is $1.85 billion over five years and relies heavily on debt service savings. Agency efficiencies make up only 30% of total savings in the first two years of the plan. So every agency should strive to identify savings, but those savings can be tailored to each agency's unique circumstances so they do not affect vital services or vulnerable populations. We know that an economic downturn can quickly eliminate billions of dollars in anticipated tax revenues and simultaneously increase demand for city services. A more robust savings plan is one way to build up our reserves and reduce the likelihood of cuts to city services when people need them the most. In August, my office developed a new measure to quantify the city's fiscal cushion and our ability to weather an economic downturn. So based on historical experience and guidance from the rating agencies, we determined that the optimal range for our budgetary cushion is 12 to 18 percent of adjusted expenditures. So at the start of FY 2016, our cushion was 10.6 percent of expenditures putting us more than $1 billion below the minimum and more than $6 billion below the maximum of the optimal range. So I hope and anticipate that by the end of the year, the city will be able to increase the cushion. I think that's a goal that is worth exploring, and I would urge us to negotiate that to this process. So let me just say in conclusion, and make no mistake about this, our economy continues to grow, but persistent wage stagnation has limited the benefits for our lowest paid workers. While wages grow slowly, we know that rents continue to skyrocket, making it harder and harder for working families to stay afloat. And given the uncertainty of the economy, large out-year budget gaps are now a greater cause for concern. But at the same time, we cannot stop investing in our city. We have to meet the needs of New Yorkers our homeless population, our kids, the people who struggle in our city. But at the same time, we actually have to prepare for the inevitable rainy day. So it's good that we take actions now to identify efficiencies. Budget savings will compound over time, and that means we're going to be able to prevent cuts to vital services if another crisis hits. I thank you for, once again, allowing me the opportunity to come before this council committee and Chairwoman Ferreras, I thank you for your leadership on all of these budget issues throughout the year. I thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you very much, Comptroller. Thank you for your leadership. As you had mentioned, one of your very important points is the actual wage inequalities. You mentioned raising the minimum wage, which we all worked really hard and will continue to push on a state level also. Um, but are there any other uh, policy decisions or things that you think we can do as a city to help uh, bridge the inequality of uh, the wage inequality? Well, I think what, what I find very interesting is the, the recovery is really about <clears throat> low wage jobs. Hmm. And when you adjust those jobs in, in, in real terms, we're actually uh, paying less than we did years ago for those large jobs, you know, those uh, low-wage jobs. A lot of that's due because tourism we're doing very well, so there's a lot more retail jobs and tourist jobs. But we do need to start thinking strategically about a pipeline for making sure that our kids get to hit 
uh, the jobs that are going to pay real good wages that lead to careers. So when you think about the high-tech economy, coder jobs, programmer jobs, these are entry-level jobs that pay $75,000, dollars a year. And part of what we have to do is match uh, educational opportunity with the economy that we're going to have today and hopefully into the future. So I think we have to start talking more about science, arts education. You know, in the beginning of the de Blasio administration, when we did our report on arts education, the lack of certified arts teachers, the mayor, the chancellor, this city council put up $23 million. We all understood that arts and science leads to those entry-level jobs that don't pay the minimum wage but actually lead to a great career. So part of the strategy on inequality is really a two-tier, sort of a two strategies. One, we've, we've issued studies that show if we raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, we're going to pump $10 billion into this economy around, um, around the city, lifting up neighborhoods and people having more money to spend. We don't talk about that enough. And then the second strategy is to make sure we can get our kids, the next generation, to the high-tech, high-end economy that lifts them from community to career. It totally makes sense, especially when we're talking about the global impacts of, and the global economy, where we may see in cities like ours, where tourism um, may see a, a shift from a lot of countries that we're used to seeing tourism. Their economies are suffering. Our dollar is so much stronger there. Um, so we will right. begin to see a shift. So thank you. I want to ask uh, two questions on audits. How many audits do you currently have going on right now? And how many audits has your office begun but has not released an audit on? I guess for us is we know that an audit is happening because it's released. So what's the process before? Um, how many do you have in the pipeline? What could we be you can You can assume for planning purposes that we are everywhere. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but, um, but so, I mean, the audit process is, is, is and people ask me a lot about this, uh, when you audit an, an, an agency or an aspect of an agency, it's never a surprise for the agency because we're working constantly with agency staff. We go over documents. There's a give and take. We may have a certain assumption about a financial aspect of an, of an audit that the agency can say, hey, I think that's not accurate, here's the documentation. And it's actually a very healthy give and take. So when I finally release the audit, uh, the public may not be aware of it, and we certainly don't share the information until we release it, which is why sometimes we don't give, we don't give a heads up because we want to make sure the audit goes from the audit bureau out to the public. But it's never a surprise for the agency. So when we were working on our homeless audit, for example, and we were documenting the, the challenges within our homeless facilities, DHS knew every step of the way where we were going, what we were doing. When we audit NYCHA, it's the same thing. We work with the agencies. And look, I think the charter meant us to have a certain amount of collaboration in terms of audit. So we. We do make sure we get to our four-year goals. We have certain goals and standards, GAGAS, order, uh, GAGAS rules that we follow. But the auditing process is, is very much uh, professional. And Marjorie Landa, who uh, has been our uh, deputy control of audit and investigation, has really done a terrific job. And we're, we're trying to probe a little deeper and try to make our audits have a little more impact. And when we do collaborate, with the council, we've, you know, it's resulted in some really good work between us. And I guess, you know, I know that that's the agency perspective. From the council's perspective, it would be great for us to know, because sometimes we, we're wondering, you know, there could be an audit here, or maybe there's, so if we're able to kind of at least find a way where we're able to be informed so that we don't have to kind of guess when the next audit is going to happen, which you may already be engaged in for a year, um, that's where the question comes from, for opportunities for us to know that it's in the pipeline, you're already engaging, your resources are invested, we can expect a report on this date, or, you know, or sometime in this quarter would be helpful for us. Listen, I got to be honest, it would be helpful for me too. <laughs> uh, but the, the audit process is because if you're running a, if you're running a good organization, if the controller's office is going to be meaningful in having these discussions or analysis, 
it has to be free of influence or pre-prejudice. Right. So when we go into an agency, the fact that we are not um, consulting with electeds or other entities outside of the GAGAS rules that, that we work with, when the audit does come out, it, it, really is, it really is what it is. One thing I think we can do, and we've been able to do this with a number of council members, yourself included, uh, Richie Torres, uh, as it relates to NYCHA, because we've audited NYCHA eight times, uh, we certainly can look at ways to take the audit and try to figure out the solution side. Right. So one of the things that we've gotten a lot of support for has been this idea that we can use Battery Park City money and steer that money, $400 million over 10 years to NYCHA. It would be the first revenue stream that NYCHA would have to make those capital repairs and do the work that they have to do. And it takes three elected officials to make that happen. The controller has a vote on the Battery Park City Board, the governor and the mayor. And uh, the governor and, and myself have agreed to use that money for NYCHA uh, without getting into feuding things. We, we, we think that the mayor should join us, the council should help us get to that point because I think if we could signal a new revenue stream for NYCHA, I think it would have real implication for NYCHA both on a federal level, you know, on a state level and on a federal level. Great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about the reserves. Uh, the exact amount that the city has saved is not clear to the public due to the generally accepted accounting principles budgeting requirement mandated by state law. Um, could your office produce a report solely on the city's reserves and can it be released regularly? I'm going to ask our deputy uh, controller for budget if we can do that. Uh, we put out a report last August uh, that did just that, which looked at the budget cushion in its totality. Um, and it measures including various different reserves as well as the prepayment or roll, uh, which is how, according to GAAP rules, we, in compliance with GAAP and in compliance with the Financial Emergency Act, roll resources forward from one year to another. We plan on updating that analysis uh, on a regular basis, either through our budget reports or, or as a standalone. It would be great if you can do it with the plans because it helps us greatly. So we're, we're, we're telling you, great job, we need more of it. Yeah. Uh, one of the challenges uh, in looking at the cushion is during the budget process during the year, until you know whether you're rolling more out of the current year than you rolled into the current year, it's hard to know um, sort of how you're doing. So it's really a measure which is most accurate at the, at the beginning and the end of the budget year. Um, but there are ways that obviously the city can better its cushion uh, within the, the budget cycle as well. So we will continue that dialogue. Um, what investment considerations will be made that are associated with the change when we talk to our mortality rate? How will the proportions all allotted to different assets, assessment, asset classes be changed? So that will not change our asset classes at all? No? No. No. Why? Can you? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, the asset allocation is, is done through, uh, through consultation with the Bureau of Asset Management and the trustees of the five different pension systems. Um, the effect of the mortality assumption, which the CD's actuary make right. really affects sort of the, the liability that those systems have, right? And that's reflected in a change in the contribution that the city makes. Um, the, the investment portfolio is very much targeted at um, trying to earn uh, the best that can in the market conditions, uh, balancing the different needs to sort of hit that actuarial assumed return rate. Um, and that really is a constant goal, irrespective of changes to the liability. So it's not like system. personally, you know, when you're younger, they say go aggressive. If you're getting closer to your retirement, they say slow it down. Well, we, we, do, a little, we do a little of both. So it's, okay. it's important to recognize, like people's individual savings, uh, the pension investment is for the long haul. We're long-term investors. So, you know, when you see the fluctuation in the market and you see you know, a very good year followed by a couple of bad years and then back up again. Obviously, you want a more consistent rate of return. You want to hit that actuarial target. But we're, we view all of this as 
we, we are not in the risk business. Right. So part of what we do is we hedge against the rough times that we're in right now, by the way, you know, between China, the stock market losing yep. 1,000 points. And we also try to position ourselves for the good time so that we can maximize the returns. And then over many years, we can truly get an assessment of if we really are hitting our actuarial goals. One part of the pension fund that's different this year than last year is for the first time we've made substantive changes to how we run the pension system and run our meetings. So with great credit to 58 trustees for the first time ever, we have now reduced the number of meetings of the five funds. Instead of having 55 meetings a year among the five funds, we now have one investment meeting. So we've reduced the meetings from 55 to six. It's given the Bureau of Asset Management a lot of time, a whole new way of thinking about investments and reform, and it has been a tremendous victory for the pension system and the five funds. We worked with the mayor's office, with the 58 trustees. It took two years to, to get to this point. I think it's only the beginning, but I think in terms of efficiency, in terms of making the asset allocation decisions with a lot more information, a lot more meetings, a lot more thought, this is where we should be spending the time. Thank you very much, Comptroller. Um, for coming to testify today. We're going to be following up because actually this finance committee is looking to have a pension specific hearing and we're looking forward to engaging with you. I don't think we've done that probably in a long time or ever. Um, long time, in a very, very long time. So I'm looking forward to engaging with you. On I look that. forward to coming back. That could be a great, that would be a very interesting hearing. Yes, it will be interesting. <laughs> um, thank you again for coming to testify. I hope you feel better. Thank you too. Um, and we will we'll, work on Thomas Train. We will work on Thomas the Train. Long story, everybody. <laughs> now it's in the public record. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you again for coming to testify. Thank we you. have some additional questions we're going to get to, your, to you so we, we can. We look forward to working with you. Today. Excellent. Thank you. Now we will begin the public portion of our hearing. Um, as a reminder for members of the public who wish to testify, please fill out a witness slip with the Sergeant at Arms. Additionally, the witness slip. Uh, the witness panels will be arranged by topic, so please indicate the topic on your testimony on your witness slip. If you have written testimony, please be sure to give the testimony to the sergeant at arms when your name is called to testify. We will now call up the first panel. You can call. The first panel will be Ralph Palladino and Fran Schloss. We just want to remind the public that we will be on a three-minute clock for testimony. I think he called you first. Yes, you go first. Me? Yes, thank you. Su Chen. Good, 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 good afternoon. Ralph Palladino, uh, local 1549, DC 37, representing 16,000 city employees, in, including in the uh, NYPD and also the New York Health and Hospitals. Um, I'm going to jump around on a bridge. First, I'm going to talk about the Health and Hospitals Corporation, or H New York NYC H and H. Um, the state budget does a lot of injury to. Uh, New York H&H. &H. Um, in terms of uh, the cuts uh, in terms of Medicaid that's proposed, tying it to the property tax, which is unfair. Uh, also, uh, the uh, Medicaid cap a few years ago was unfair to NY H&H. &H. Uh, Medicaid is the lifeblood of the public health system, and it does not uh, fully reimbursed for the true cost of health care. It's always been that way. The overhead for the public health system is 5%. In the private sector, it's over 20%. So that's why it's easy for them to be able to deal with the Medicaid cap. I would say that um, since H NYH and H needs to expand and public health needs to expand, that we need to have an uh, a situation where it gets support, and we, we support the mayor uh, giving in more money to NYH, NYC, H&H. &H. 
We hope the city council supports that actively and even increases it if they can. The, the uh, public health system has to reduce its numbers by 2,000 this year, 2,000 this year, uh, and also has had trouble meeting payroll monthly. Okay, so that's pretty bad. And if you look at my att attached testimony, uh, you'll see from the patient, which I am, at Bellevue Hospital, and also the patient and the employee's point of view on that, which was delivered to the state uh, a few weeks ago. It's in there as well. Uh, in terms of savings for the city, we want to thank the New York City Council and the administration on the 911 staffing. Uh, the, the numbers have been very consistent. The result in additional staffing has meant there's been less overtime and less use of family medical leave. Good thing. In terms of uh, two other areas of savings. One is civilianization. The, um, and the city administration and NYPD still has not civilianized the clerical titles, even though we were the ones who were leading the way on this and have won three arbitrations on this, three arbitrations on this. They still do not uh, honor the fact uh, that they, want to, they should civilianize for the, for the, uh, the clerical employees uh, in the NYPD. Civilianization, of course, is when you have uniformed officers and TEAs and, and school aides, um, school safety aides, agents, uh, sitting in desks desk doing routine clerical work instead of being out where they're supposed to be doing it. The savings for the city of $30 million if they do it. And um, we just at a loss to know why our numbers have even gone down since uh, 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 Mike Bloomberg was the mayor. Our numbers have gone down in the NYPD. In, in terms of that. So um, we ask for that support on those things and um, uh, also to be very proactive with the, city, the state government, if you don't mind, in terms of the Medicaid issue, but also support the speaker's call for a millionaire's tax, which I think would generate more money as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. My name is Fran Schloss and I am president of DC 37, local 1757. Local 1757 represents real property assessors and I am one of them. I'm going to speak with regard to the critical need for the hiring of more assessors and assistant assessors as an integral part of the Department of Finance's budget for the coming fiscal year. The dearth of these professionals within the ranks of the Department of Finance Property Division is one of the leading causes of the continuation of uncollected revenue. Assessors are responsible for overseeing the valuation of approximately 1,050,000 properties within the City of New York. The revenue collected from real property assessments help provide services such as police and sanitation. The hiring of 80 additional assessors would not merely backfill the 13 vacant districts, but would also serve to create smaller, more manageable districts. The original intent of property divisions downsizing was to do more with less. The city, however, has lost hundreds of millions of tax dollars due to the limited number of inspections that can be made of parcels with new construction and major alterations. An additional impediment to obtaining the, the desired number of assessors is the low entry salary for those who qualify and come from the private sector. A salary on parity with private industry would attract and retain a professional workforce. Based on the above, it is projected that taking into account a new employee's learning curve and the cost of salaries and benefits, an additional $100 million in tax revenue would be generated the first year and it would be sustainable. New hires in the title of assessor can begin to provide the city with a way to ensure greater fairness and transparency the taxpayers and greater revenue for the city of New York. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, we actually were questioning this with the Department of Finance Commissioner uh, based on some of the assessments um, and, and having people go out and really identify exactly what you were talking about as a challenge and whether we are collecting the maximum amount we're not on property, yeah. Um, well, I thank you both for coming to testify. Your H&H &H, um, proposal is one we take very seriously. We're engaging with the OMB director um, because it is a challenge. And, you know, unfortunately, they're assuming that they're taking the governor at his word, saying that it won't cost New York City a penny, which I've already expressed 
um, is very disconcerting to me, um, but we will continue to push as your partners in the council um, to make sure that we have um, the resources needed to have a, a timely and balanced budget. Thank you very much Thank for coming you. to testify today. We will call up the next panel. Harvey Epstein, Tracy Robinson, Carlin Cowan, and Kelly Villar. Just a reminder, you're going to be on a three-minute clock, so if you want to summer, uh, give a summary of your statement, I'd appreciate it. And you may begin. Am I going first? Does it matter? Okay. All right, great. Um, my name is Kelly Villar. I represent the Let's Rebuild Cromwell Community Coalition of Staten Island. Thank you for listening to me today about the urgent need to fund the rebuilding of Cromwell Recreation Center in the 2017 capital budget. On October 9, 2015, 16-year-old Marcos Castillo falls to his death while playing in an elevator shaft on an abandoned building just a few blocks from where the old Cromwell stood, a 75-year-old public rec facility run by New York Parks. More than 250 youth and hundreds of adults participated daily in activities this center once had. After years of poor maintenance repairs, several nor'easters, including Hurricane Sandy, all hopes of having the center rebuilt died. Then began the slow death of the North Shore community of Staten Island. There's been an alarming rise in youth involved in crimes, drugs, dropping out of school, and others entering special education in our community of color. Some of these numbers are the highest in the city. A recent study was done by Harvard University which said the worst place to be poor in New York City is Staten Island's North Shore. Our demographics parallel some of the poorest communities of our city. Cromwell was the largest rec facility on Staten Island ever. It sat on a pier. It had a football field long. It was a football field long with six basketball courts, running track, uh, weight room, boxing ring, and several other uh, activities. And it provided all sorts of activities from dances to festivals to theater events. Unfortunately, the world saw Staten Island through the lens of Eric Garner tragedy filled with racism and hate on all sides. Cromwell was the type of place that negated all of that. It was a community space filled with people recreating together from all different races, education, and economic levels all the time. Cromwell was a place that touched almost every lifelong Staten Islander that you speak to. But I'm not asking for Cromwell to be re rebuilt for some historical reason or its sentimental value. It must be built now because our community is undergoing the largest private waterfront development Staten Island has seen in 30 years. Right next to where Cromwell once stood, ground has, ground has broken for a Ferris wheel for tourists, high-end outlet stores, luxury hotels, condos, where there has not been one groundbreaking for anything related to the community. So it's time for Cromwell to be built. Here's what's happening. We need $50 million for the start. A feasibility study has been done by the Parks Department. We've met with every elected official and community leaders of concern related to this area, and they say yes, rebuild Cromwell. We have proposed to EDC and city planning the designation of a maritime education and recreation corridor with Cromwell as a hub, coterminous with the boundaries of the waterfront development underway. This corridor would bring the community developers and government together to plan for a better waterfront community and could guarantee some community resiliency and sustainability. We need Cromwell built. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the New York City Council. I'm Tracy Robinson. I'm a policy analyst with the Human Services Council of New York, or HSC. Today I'll focus on the human services components of the budget. In short, HSC believes that the mayor's proposal reflects his commitment to equity and would better position human services providers to carry out their important work. I urge you to build on this proposal by further investing in the human services workforce, 
aligning funding with the true cost of program delivery, and working with us to optimize the human services planning and contracting processes. Specifically with respect to the human services workforce, we're very grateful uh, for the funded minimum wage increase for human services workers. And we encourage you to allocate additional funding to prevent what's called wage compression. So for workers who are currently making above the minimum wage, uh, we need to raise their wages as well, so additional funding is necessary for that. Increasing the minimum wage will not only improve the quality of these workers' lives, but it will also improve the quality of the services they provide. With respect to the cost of doing business or the cost of providing human services, I urge you to hold the city accountable for implementing the federal OMB guidance on indirect costs. Um, and we also urge you to apply these principles to all contracts, regardless of the source of funding, so even for contracts that are not funded with federal dollars. And this is also an, an opportune moment to take some time to right-size program payment in general. And along those lines, we also encourage the City Council to hold agencies accountable for registering human services contracts on time and also paying for services on time um, as late payment greatly destabilizes providers. The final point that I want to make uh, today is that last week the Human Services Council's Commission to Examine Nonprofit Human Services Organization Closures released a report looking at some of the factors that contribute to instability among human services providers. And we issued eight recommendations in that report. Among those recommendations um, were to identify duplicative and burdensome requirements that don't prevent mismanagement and wrongdoing in nonprofit organizations, and also to streamline regulations while increasing transparency and accountability. And the final point I want to make is that we would love to work with the City Council um, to find ways for government to involve human services providers in program design before the concept paper stage. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carlin Cowan, and I'm a policy analyst at the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies. I would like to thank Chair Ferreris Copeland, as well as the Council Finance Committee, for the opportunity to testify and for your leadership on issues that deeply affect everyday New Yorkers. I've submitted a full written testimony, which I'll briefly summarize at the time. Uh, FPWA is an anti-poverty policy and advocacy organization with a membership network of nearly 200 human service and faith-based organizations in New York City. FPWA has been a prominent force in New York City's social service system for more than 92 years, advocating for fair public policies, collaborating with partner agencies, and growing its community-based membership network to meet the needs of New Yorkers. Each year, through the work with member agencies, FPWA reaches close to 1.5 million New Yorkers of all ages, ethnicities, and denominations. FPWA strives to build a city of equal opportunity that reduces poverty, promotes upward mobility, and creates shared prosperity for all New Yorkers. In order to fulfill these goals, FPWA encourages the City Council to fund several initiatives that support work, upward mobility for New Yorkers by building and developing the workforce, ensuring safety and dignity for workers in New York, increasing access to health care, and developing community leadership. We urge the City Council to support worker cooperatives, which provide higher wages and job stability to individual workers and communities by enhancing the, pro the initiative to $3.8 million, invest $1.8 million in the Day Labor Workforce Initiative to provide New Yorkers neediest workers with safer employment options and workforce development services, enhance funding for Access Health NYC to $5 million, which will help hard-to-reach and underserved populations access information and better health care coverage, and fund Interfaith Leadership Initiative at 425000 to train faith leaders to connect their communities to public and nonprofit services. FPWA supports these initiatives as keys to upward mobility and poverty reduction in the future, and at the same time, we also recognize that critical services must be delivered to New Yorkers facing poverty now. To this end, FPWA encourages the City Council to invest in the human services budget with programs including early childhood, early childhood care education and child care, where we ask the council to create salary parity with the DOE staff, increase the early learn rate, uh, stop the permanent loss of capacity by preserving child care programs with leases expiring, expand capacity to serve more children ages zero to three, and ensure four-year-olds have wraparound care before and after school, 
after school programs where we asked the council to restore $20.35 million to summer programs for 34,000 middle school students and uh, increase capacity to serve more elementary and high school students. In child welfare, where we encourage the council to provide community preventative services that target at-risk families based on location and need. And then er older adult services, where we ask the council to restore funding for case management, increase funding for adult day services, and fund social workers and senior centers and Section 202 affordable housing. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Good afternoon, Councilwoman Ferreros. My name is Harvey Epstein. I'm the Associate Director at the Urban Justice Center, and I apologize for being late, but thank you for give, giving me the opportunity to testify. The Community Development Project was formed over 15 years ago, and its mission is to strengthen community-based grassroots organizations throughout New York City. The work really is to talk about how communities matter and neighborhood matters, and our goal is really to lift them up and lift their voices up. I'm here to talk about two coalitions that we're working with. One's called Stabilizing NYC, and the other one is the, the Workforce Standards Collaborative. A stabilizing NYC focuses on predatory equity issues throughout New York City, and then the struggle that New Yorkers have is we live in an affordable housing crisis. And what we're seeing throughout New York is predatory landlords are buying buildings that are over leveraged and using every means necessary to evict those tenants. They're harassing them, hiring tenant relocation specialists. They're harassing them by using construction as harassment. They're harassing them saying they're going to report them to uh, INS and deport them because they're undocumented. And we see this in every borough, in your district, in every neighborhood around the city. And Stabilizing NYC was formed to, to fight that to work on legislation and policy reforms. And the council last year funded the coalition at 1.25 million, and we have 12 community-based organizations who are part of it. But the problem is growing and continuing as this affordable housing crisis is seen in neighborhoods, especially through these rezonings. And what this co coalition does is encouraging organizing. And organizing is critical to education and outreach. And we're asking the council to increase this from 1.25 million to 2.5 million and allow us to add organizations. There are numerous organizations in Queens who we work with who would love to join this coalition, but we need additional resources to let them join the coalition. The other, or, uh, the other collaboration is called the Workforce Standards Collaborative. And that's really focusing on the needs of low-wage workers. As you know, and uh, you know, the Specifically, 21% of workers in New York are not paid the minimum wage. 77% of those workers who work overtime aren't being paid overtime. We lose a billion dollars every year in wages for low-wage workers in New York. People are, you know, who try to for, file, form unions, who file complaints, or file administrative agencies, are, summer, you know, are, are fired without reason. You know, 42% of the workers experience some kind of retaliation. Waste theft is rampant throughout New York City. And this coalition is forming and is formed really to fight that. There's 12, there's 10 organizations around the city who are fighting that together. And the needs that we see are, you know, apparent. Organizations like ours and Make the Road New York and Catholic Migration Services see this happen on a day-to-day -day basis through their members. And neighborhood-based organizations like Damayan and Adhikar see it happen in low-wage industries. And the reality is that we all need to step up. As we see the crisis in nail salons, it isn't the only low-wage system we see the problems. And it's happening from Staten Island to Queens to the Bronx. And hopefully the council will take support of this new initiative and the idea of workers on the ground in communities who need to fight back and they need the tools available. Right now, there's no money for organizing in workplace standards issues. And we see this struggle every day. And organizations like ours and Make the Road would love to see the council support in this new initiative. Um, thank you very much for your testimony. I just wanted to add that we are beginning this budget process, one that um, is speaking of strong, um, of real state issues in the budget process. And while these last two years have included new initiatives, um, we have not made that decision. So we take your testimony into consideration, but we in no way want to um, put it out there that we are collecting new initiatives at this time. Um, but thank you for your suggestion. And again, this is the beginning of a process, and we will see where we stand after the state budget. Thank you very much for coming to testify today, and we'll call up our final panel. Richard Anderson.
Madam Chairman, it's nice to uh, be the wrap-up. I guess you're as glad as I am. <laughs> I'd like to turn your attention to the capital budget, if we could. Uh, I'm Richard Anderson, President of New York Building Congress. The Building Congress, uh, as I think you're aware, is a leadership organization of the design, construction, and real estate industry. And we appreciate the careful attention this committee has given to the infrastructure of the city in the last several years. The mayor's four-year capital plan maintains or increases commitments in all major categories and in nominal dollars is actually the highest in the city's history. At the same time, actual overall expenditures, however, have declined in recent budgets and when adjusted for inflation are less than past years. The larger problem is not the lack of attention by the administration whose capital program strives to maintain core systems. Rather, the city is in many ways a victim of its own success. Our population will soon it actually is larger than at any point in its history. The Building Congress has reported that the city is witnessing the construction of more residential commercial institutional buildings than at any point in the recent past. The imbalance between private development and population growth and the availability of infrastructure to meet this demand is a long-term threat to our economy and quality of life. We're simply, with all this private investment, we're outrunning the best efforts of the city to keep up with its infrastructure. We need to be investing in more, much more for the future. We are calling, uh, we, so we, uh, the city must address these challenges with new innovative approaches. The Building Congress is proposing specific improvements to the city's capital planning, procurement, and project management practices that taken together can expand the city's capacity, help control the high cost of construction, and bring more projects online more rapidly. We are calling this proposal building a better capital budget for New York City. The proposal urges revisions to the city's capital budget planning process, including a new 20-year capital needs assessment that looks at the full range of the demographic, economic, environmental, and general infrastructure needs and aligns the city's overall capital program with them. The 10-year capital strategy already underway, drawing from the long-term assessment while applying fiscal constraints, a fixed four-year capital program already uh, called for under the charter. Uh, and uh, this approach is different from the current rolling plan, which lacks measurable targets and can change substantially from one year to the next. And finally, an improved presentation of projects in the capital budget. The Building Congress is formulating a more intuitive, less fragmented model capital budget document that could help OMB agencies and the City Council to better monitor capital projects and understand progress on the overall program. Next, the City should streamline its procurement and project delivery practices, which can deliver projects more rapidly and cost effectively and create room for additional projects. The City should seek amendments to, the state, to state law to permit new ways of delivering projects like design, build, and public-private partnerships. The city is making a concerted effort to win state authorization for design, build, and the Building Congress is working hard in support. The city council's understanding and support for these proposals is essential. Taken together, these are major reforms to the city's capital program, which will require oversight and action on the part of, the, of this body. In addition to administrative changes, New York City will still need new sources of revenue to meet most of its infrastructure challenges. And we give some examples of, of ways to do that, particularly the New York Water Finance Authority and the Water Board. We'd like to see more uh, uh, approaches like that. This council should work with the administration to consider the creation of similar dedicated user fees and other critical assets. The Building Congress has suggested reconsideration of a fee on vehicles entering the Manhattan CBD or a waste management fee for residential users. To help affect these changes, the mayor will need to add management capacity. The Building Congress urges the mayor to create an office of infrastructure to continually review and improve capital project management. The City Council should similarly create a committee or a subcommittee on infrastructure. The City must improve capital planning and management practices and find new revenues to be able to adequately address its vast infrastructure needs. Taken together, these proposals can go far in helping the city achieve a more robust and responsive capital program. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify.
Thank you very much for your suggestions. We will be following up as a committee with you. Um, and this is something obviously that's very important to this committee, especially having heard from the DDC commissioner and the challenges they're having, even with processing what funding we've already given the administration and the challenges to just be able to get a scoping process done, um, let alone actually building the demands at you know, at the rate that it should be. So, you know, we take your testimony very seriously and we will be following up with some of your suggestions. Thank you very much and I look forward to meeting you personally. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. This concludes the Finance Committee Fiscal Twenty Yes. This concludes the Finance Committee's Fiscal 2017 preliminary budget hearings. For any member of the public who was unable to testify today but would like to submit testimony, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov by close of business on Friday, March 4th, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. For the entire month of March, the Council, through the appropriate committees, will conduct hearings to hear from agency commissioners about the impact of the Mayor's preliminary budget on their agencies. For a full schedule of all preliminary budget hearings, please contact the Sergeant at Arms or check the Council's website. Thank you. This hearing is now adjourned. Yay.